Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Television channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website city at the city of Santa Cruz .com. Hudson Sances is our technician for today and I'd like to thank you Hudson for being here and for your work the purpose of today's meeting is to hear the fiscal year 2020 proposed budget our budget hearing schedule will proceed as follows we will hear some content this morning from our city manager, Martine Bernal, and our finance director, Marcus Pimentel. We will have an opportunity for public comment. We will take a break for lunch. We'll return and um, see if there's any additional comments, and then we'll uh, get into our council deliberations. <coughs> Does our city manager have any additions to the proposed schedule? I don't, thank you. Okay, great. So at this time, we'll just jump right in. And good morning, Marcus. Good morning, Martine. You're welcome to take it away. All right, thank you. I was gonna just start out by doing a brief uh, introduction and essentially okay. a summary of the budget message, and then I'll turn it over to Marcus, who will dive into uh, additional detail and process with respect to the proposed budget before you. So first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity this morning to go over the budget. Um, and I will start with, I've got a few slides. Okay, so I'll start with uh, what really is the. Uh, is it on? Oh, sorry. Marcus, it might be over to. All right. Got it. Thank you. So the overall theme really is uh, to proceed with, with caution, um, given um, our fiscal outlook and some of the issues that we're facing. And we'll go over those in a second, but I think that's basically it. Uh, um, that, uh, again, if we proceed and we're careful uh, uh, with respect to what we do, uh, that uh, we will uh, get through these uh, uh, difficult fiscal times. Uh, and I think by way of background, you know, we're, we're optimistic, obviously, that we will do that because we've had a history of being able to manage our budget in a very responsible way. That has been our practice, that has been our culture, and that's what we've been able to do, and I anticipate that that will continue to be the case. Um, and we've got a number of reasons why that's the case. You know, first of all, we've been very good about developing fiscal sustainability plans, which involves really forecasting and looking ahead at our budget and anticipating what might happen and then creating strategies relative to addressing those. So for example, a few years ago when we did our forecast, we projected a deficit of like a million dollars this year. Uh, but we took uh, actions in the last several years to bring that down uh, to where, well, we do have a deficit, it's not at the same level, it's more manageable. And we, we, we'll be working on that and anticipate that we'll <coughs> obviously deal with it. Uh, and those strategies involve, you know, a number of different uh, factors, and we'll get into those a little bit more. But, you know, again, it's really looking at the whole picture. How do we, strategies around revenues, strategies around expenditures, strategies around uh, operations and best practices, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and so over the years, we've, we've had a history of doing that, um, and it's reflected in uh, our, uh, audit reports, when you look at the, our audits, uh, they're always uh, do very well. And also the overall really uh, indication of it is our bond rating. We have a double A plus bond rating, which is you know the second highest bond rating that you can achieve, which is not insignificant. And, and that has tremendous value to our community, to our ability to finance and to move forward. So uh, you know, it, it clearly is the case that we have a good uh, fiscal uh, practices. And you know we are in better shape than many communities for a variety of reasons. We are fortunate to have a diverse tax base. We are fortunate to be able to have had sort of a culture and history of uh, fiscal uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, and so for all those reasons, we I think we're in better shape than many other communities. So to just give you a big picture overview of our budget, we are a large uh, organization, particularly for a city of our size. You know, our overall budget is. $262 million, and that's everything, all of our operations, 
uh, a good uh, amount of that. 106 million is our general fund. And that really is what is the focus of most of our conversations. And when we talk about deficits, we're really talking about the general fund. And that's largely because with respect to the general fund, that is the one area where this council and the way fiscal uh, policies are with respect to the general fund is that the council really doesn't have direct control over uh, particularly the revenues related to that. With respect to the rest of our budget, which are enterprise funds, the council can set rates uh, with respect to how to fund those. And because of that, you can do much more long-term planning. And so with those, we, we really never have deficits because we have much more control to do that. If that was the case in the general fund, we wouldn't probably be in the position we are now. However, in the general fund, we have to rely on the economy, we have to rely on a bunch, a bunch of other factors that are beyond our control. So deficits are something that we have to manage uh, in, in, in a completely different way, much more difficult to do. Um, and so that requires you know, all the work that we've been doing that we'll go over with, uh, with you today. Uh, but that's where, when we're talking about the deficit, the $3 million deficit that we're facing, it's in our general fund, which is a $106 million operation. Um, and as you know, that funds you know, largely public safety, uh, our parks uh, system um, and some of the streets uh, improvements. Our capital improvement budget is about $21 million. Um, and I think the, the big issue here is that it is largely or entirely from our enterprise funds because that's the other thing that we're challenged with respect to our, our general fund is that because we're trying to manage these deficits, it's very hard to set aside money for capital relative to, to the, general, the uh, general fund. And so in the proposed budget, there really is zero money in the uh, general fund improvement uh, budget. And as Marcus has mentioned many times, it's just really not a sustainable uh, practice. We need to try to address that and, and, and build sources of funding for capital improvements because uh, we'll need to make investments. Otherwise, we'll have multiple facilities that'll fall apart over, the, over, over time. As I noted, while we are forecasting um, uh, deficits, you know, we believe they're manageable again uh, with uh, our continued uh, fiscal strategies. Um, and the one thing I uh, should note that uh, we had uh, come in this year anticipating a budget of about one uh, deficit of about $1.6 million. Uh, we had hoped that we could present a budget to you that was balanced. Uh, uh, however, the deficit did grow uh, at a faster rate than we anticipated, um, and so we do have a, uh, an increased deficit. We'll, we'll go over exactly why that happened, and uh, we'll be presenting to you some of the options with respect to reducing that, and then we'll hear from the council, and we'll be, have to back, we'll be back to, with, to you with the completing the, the whole uh, deficit reduction process. Um, in general, and Marcus will go over the specifics, but really it's because we, we continue to see some revenue decline in terms of just our tax base being eroded and some of our revenue sources, and we've just seen expenditure increases. And again, these are not necessarily unusual. Uh, many entities are facing these increases, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, some of the employee costs uh, to be able to uh, keep up with the PERS uh, cost, as well as, uh, uh, again, we do have a need to uh, try to recruit and maintain uh, our employees in our city. Uh, and so nonetheless, it does require uh, some reductions. Uh, I think where our goal is to do those that are at the, at the scale and the type that do not directly impact uh, negatively our, our services. Uh, so that's our goal and, and we'll go over those in, in a few minutes. Uh, so the deficit uh, we're, we projected at, at this point is about 3.1 to 3.2 million. Uh, as I mentioned, we've developed some strategies to address that, and uh, we'll go over those in a second. Um, and we'll have to bring back additional strategies and reductions based on the remaining, uh, and also what uh, uh, other what, what else the city council would like to see in the budget. And, and so we'll put all that together and come back to you with uh, closing that gap. And finally, I just want to just take a little bit of time to just really thank uh, everyone involved in, in the city, particularly to that uh, uh, really uh, is what uh, makes a difference in terms of the work that we do. And as you've seen in the presentations that we've had, you know, the city has remarkable achievements and we do a lot every single day. Uh, most doesn't get a lot of attention. It's really the crisis issues, the difficult issues that get the most attention. But there really are so many incredible things that are done in, in our community every day. And we are a leader in so many ways compared to so many communities. Um, I 
I'm sure you, you hear the same things whenever I go to conferences or, or other places. People look to Santa Cruz to uh, ideas, to examples. I'm constantly ask, being asked about how do you do this? And, and we always have a really great example. So when people are talking about, here's the latest things that we're doing, we've already are doing and we're, we're already talking about them. So we are really a leader overall, and it's easy to, it's easy to forget that. But it's accomplished because we have you know, excellent employees uh, who go above and beyond to do incredible work. Uh, they really are committed to the city, they're very loyal to the city, and they work really hard, so they need to be acknowledged. Uh, the, this budget document and the budget process is incredibly complex, it takes a lot of time, a big effort, and we have an excellent finance team, so I wanna thank them for the incredible work that they've done to put this together before you and the work that will continue. Uh, we have an excellent executive team as well, really a team that works to holistically to address issues, uh, to go beyond the department lines. Uh, I also want to thank the city council. The councils have traditionally been very supportive of uh, forwarding um, their uh, priorities and concerns, but also balancing the various constituencies, balancing the, 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 the various needs uh, uh, in, in a way that's responsible. And finally, we have a, you know incredibly involved and dedicated community, lots of ideas, never a shortage, um, and uh, that keeps us really pressing uh, forward and, and moving ahead with many, many issues. Uh, they can be a challenge sometimes, but by and large, you know, rather have some uh, community that's engaged than one that isn't and that, that doesn't care. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Marcus, and he'll go over more of the details. morning. I, in my haste to get going yesterday morning with our 10 a.m. department finance department presentation, I forgot to introduce you to the two other people who are sitting next to me, and I know they self-introduced themselves, but that was bad form. So I wanted to start with Marcus Pimentel, your finance director. Uh, with us today is Cheryl Fife, our assistant finance director. She's been with the city um, longer than I have, um, but not much. Uh, she's a dynamic, valuable resource to me and our entire department and to you. Uh, you don't see her a lot because she's behind the scenes making sure that when I'm not there, things are going really well. And I'm not there much. We're always in meetings and doing other things. So she's really been the key to the success of a lot of things in finance. Uh, Tracy Cole, she's our principal management analyst. She's just finishing almost her one year anniversary being in a new budget role. She was a former accountant with us. We stole her from down south. She's still a Dodger fan. We're working on that. <laughs> but she's been a, a value add to us and to our team. Um, we've had some um, we've been challenged with a lot of workload this year. This is not one of those presentations. It's just, I'm really proud of what we've been able to achieve largely because of Cheryl and Tracy. Uh, they've been dynamic, responsive, late nights, weekends, um, doing a lot of extra work above and beyond their full-time day jobs is they also have families that they take care of too. So I'm just really appreciative of them. And so I just want to introduce you who they are and a little bit about them. Uh, as City Manager Martin Bernal mentioned, we are in, we have a, a tagline right up there at the top, proactive fiscal stability through unprecedented times. We've not value tested that statement. We haven't gone through you know, focus groups, and is, but that's kind of what we feel. We, we, we're really proud of this community, this organization, this board, this, this city council, current, present, and past. And we'll see, what, expect those trends to continue in the future. That they wanted us to be a fiscally responsible city because they, they get it, no money, no mission. And without smart financial planning, it's really hard to do your, your mission and what we're, you're here to do. We are in unprecedented times. We've talked a lot about this in our mid-year presentations, prior budget presentations, but the themes are still there. When we're seeing $12 million in interest, interest payments to the state for their lack of investments, that's $12 million of interest every year going out of this city to the state, just interest on the debt because of their investment shortfalls, they haven't made their targets. That's a lot of resources leaving this community. I mean, that we're, we've surpassed the RDA scale or we're close to that. I mean, it's just, that is an unprecedented idea given that we're, you'll see a chart later, we're about ready to become the longest economic recovery period in the city's history, yet you know, we're, we're getting added on to these large, large, large payments. Um, it's, it's, we've been shouldering that burden for a while, but it's, it's, 
difficult. The economy, it's evolving as economies do. Consumers are evolving as consumers do. Some of us consumers are getting a little bit older and our spending habits are changing. Uh, healthcare is becoming more bigger piece of what we're doing. So just consumer behavior, how we're evolving, streaming videos, things that used to be taxable, non-taxable, all those things we've been talking about, it's unprecedented because it's all happening right now, layered on. Baby boomers, they don't have a lot of kids behind them, workforces issues. Um, anyways, so we've talked a lot about that. That's the nature of us. We're, we've been proactively thinking forward about how we navigate this and how we get to 23, how we get to 25, how do we get to 2031 through really difficult decisions. And it's putting a lot of strain and pressure on you guys and we apologize. We wish we had an easier path. We wish we were telling greater stories, um, but this is the story we're dealt with and we're gonna work together to, get to resolve it. So I just wanna just remind you that this is hard work and it's, I'm sorry about that. Uh, we wish it were different, but we're proud of the work that's been done. And Martine mentioned something that's really important to, to just think about. We were forecasted a $1.6 million deficit for the year coming up. It's grown to three, 3.2 million. Your first reaction might be, oh, wow, that's tough. And it is, like we're, we're finance people, you know, we're nervous about that. A couple years ago, this deficit was 11 million and two years ago it was 8 million. So 2020 has been a big year for us. It's been that milestone year. Like if we can figure out how to solve that, things aren't easy, but we'll be better positioned. So we do a lot of work in 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, those fiscal years, a lot of work looking to 2020, making good decisions back then for next year. We've reduced that gap already by a lot. Um, where most communities might have just said, well, let's just see what happens. And so I'm really proud of this council. I'm really proud of staff that we've been able to take that effort. And now we have a, still a gap, but it's much more reasonable to think about. We're not in a place where we're closing centers. We're not doing that. So I just want, want to acknowledge all the work that's been done. Uh, Martin, his team, a lot of people behind finance who you never see, and a lot of people in this organization, your department heads, uh, the people that are starting to fill in in the right corner because they don't want to be on TV. You know, all those, there's a, there's a lot of amazing people in the city and they've all been collectively joining in to how to, how to solve this. So I just want to acknowledge this is not just a few people, it's a collective whole. We've had 90 managers that put time out of their busy schedules last year and are doing it again this year to help us solve problems. So a little bit more of an intro than I wanted, but I just thought it, these are, this is a big day We've, we've allocated most of this day for you and the public. So we're, we're hoping, hoping, expecting to be done around 11. That being said, I've got 27, we've got 27 slides. It's not I, it's we. That's less than we've ever had before for a $260 million budget because we really want to prioritize your time and community's time. Our goal for today is to really focus on the gap that we have and talk about how, we're, how we can start solving that $3.2 million challenge so that by June 11th, we're adopting a balanced budget. And we have about $2.4 million identified what we think are reasonable, recommended. Um, some touch points in there that we'll have to come back to you to discuss a little bit more, um, but we're getting closer to that number. So I wanna let you know we're making progress, we're getting closer, and I wish we could have been having this conversation one-on-one -on -one or in documents a week ago, and I apologize about that, but it's been really challenging to get all this together. Um, so that being said, we're gonna get started. Get started five minutes later. <laughs> So as Martine mentioned, if you think about our budget, we have a $262 million budget. And it's not to downplay a $3.2 million deficit, but it's to also acknowledge we have $156 million in that blue pie chart that's doing really well, our enterprise funds, a lot of our special revenue funds. We have a lot of operations that are planned for the future, well-funded, capital's there, resources are there, staffing are there, programs are there, services are there, and they're robust and they're strong and we're providing above and beyond, we're going beyond our city boundaries. So we're, we're most of our, over half of our budget is doing really, really well. The general fund portion, 106 million, 103 million is funded. Maybe not doing so well because we're not funding capital, maybe not doing so well because we all recognize there's more to be done, but there is 103 million that is funded. So when you get down to it, we have a sliver of 3.2 million that we're gonna spend most of our day on today. And, and I apologize about that. I'd rather be talking about the bigger pie, but we really, really need to emphasize how we can solve this and start getting your feedback, what resonates with you, so we can start moving forward and bring back more information. Maybe it's May 14th, maybe it's May 28th, maybe so we're leading up to a June 11th adoption. So that's our goal today is to focus on that sliver um, that will take a lot of our time, and I recognize that. Different for me, standing with a clicker. I, I think I like it. Um, 
jumped into our head a decade of deficits. I'm not sure I like that term. But 2015 through 2024, we're forecasting, we're, we've had and we're forecasting eight of those 10 years to be deficit years. We don't want that to be our future. We wanna turn that around so where it's eight out of 10 or, or balanced or surplus years because we need to start building reserves so we can start making dynamic investments. So we wanna turn that story around from a decade of deficits to a decade of surpluses or a decade of service deliveries. Um, you go to our community, so, but we've got some work to do. And so today is just like last year, which is the year before, we've got work to do and we keep doing the work. And so I'm proud about that. We'll talk about a little bit later, our general fund reserves. So these are my, our themes. We're projecting deficits in the general fund. Again, the 156 million of the city is doing fine. Their, their operations are balanced. Within the $100 million general fund, we've got some forecasted challenges. It's largely because of things we've talked a lot about, revenue erosion with tax bases and backfilling the state on pensions and uh, less money coming in. The state has a lot of surpluses, but we're not seeing, uh, thankfully for homelessness and how some housing programs, we can use more help. But if we forecast, <coughs> even our smaller deficits that we're looking at now, our reserves are gone in two years and that's a scary thing for a finance director to say and this isn't the sky is falling because we'll take action and we'll correct that. But our, our, we're gonna power through and flow through a lot of our reserves and we don't have set aside funding for dealing with a larger scale environmental event, whether it's fires, river, levees, whatever it might be. We don't have in the general fund the type of resources that the general fund would need to respond, pay in advance, and then wait 15, 18, 20 months later for FEMA to come back and reimburse us. We're also not funding our capital improvement program. While we don't have a precise number, anywhere from three to five million is a minimum what we should be doing. We're seeing the pain threshold of our department president of our CIP capital program every year coming up with a $2 million, $4 million minimum need for funding. So we, we need to get back to a funding level where we're adding two to $5 million more into the budget to fund our capital and our infrastructures, our parks, our sidewalks, uh, bike lanes, all, all those fun things. So we, we need to turn that deficit into surpluses so we can build up our reserves. We need stronger reserves so we can have more flexibility to invest when we want to. And we need to build up our CIP so we, fixing things when they're broken is a lot more expensive than maintaining and investing early on. So we, we need to break this habit. What our goal for today is really about the general fund. We say it a lot, we spend all our energy on a very small sliver of the general fund. We'll have most of the afternoon available for questions, comments about where you wanna go. Um, I realize there's, we have a $20 million capital investment program. I realize we have 156 million of other operations, water fund, wastewater, uh, refuse. Those are all areas that got great stories. You've heard the department presentation. There's a lot of information in there. Should you wanna dive deeper into those spaces, uh, We'll, we'll hear that, we'll record that, and we'll come back on those conversations um, in, in subsequent meetings, but we really want today to be talking, spending time to talk about the reductions that were in budget solutions and getting that feedback on uh, are we ready to go and, and then we've gotta do some more work to, to bridge our gap. So we'll, we'll, we'll start with just a recap of our budget document, just make sure we're recognizing it. And we've done a lot of work, so maybe it's just selfish. We just wanna acknowledge some of the cool stuff in it. We will review our, the funds that are fiscally sound. We'll talk about very briefly our CIP investments, and then we'll spend most of the presentation, most of the comments today in the general fund and how to solve it and getting council direction and public feedback. Tracy. Hi, good morning. So we're just gonna take a quick overview of the budget document. Um, some of the changes that we've made, uh, made it a better uh, more visual appealing document um, in the next few slides. A lot of research went into reviewing what other cities are um, producing and we realized we really needed to kind of up our game on, on this document. Um, we are going digital with it. Uh, it's online, our, our uh, adopted will be online, oh, online only so we won't be printing any uh, of those documents. Um, all right. Okay, so what you need to know and where to find it. So um, quick overview, the budget in brief, which is actually the budget dashboard section of the uh, document that you have in front of you. Um, it's meant to be just a quick, um, quick look at the summary of the budget. 
Uh, we've got the city manager's message in there, uh, soon to come the finance director's overview. Also in there is uh, the personnel narrative that talks about uh, the ads and, and that, uh, that went into this year's budget. Uh, back at the back of the section, you'll see the breakdown of the personnel in the index section. Then also in the budget dashboard, you'll see the debt and pension liability that the city has. The workload indicators, this was a direct request from the budget focus group uh, that we met with last May of May of 2018. Um, every department uh, worked very hard to get these workload indicators into the, uh, the document. Uh, the departments got to choose three to five um, indicators of their choice. Um, and this is kind of a test year. This is the first year we've done this. So we'll reach out to you know, the council and the community to find out if they like these. Um, these uh, workload indicators. Uh, we've got some examples here that you can read. Um, uh, next year and, and in, the, in the years to come, uh, these will be dr uh, driven by the strategic plan um, of the city council, um, and we'll hopefully get to move more to a, to a performance measurement uh, type of um, indicator as well. Okay, I think you're... Um familiar with this one, but I thought I'd give you a, a, a quick overview, and if you have questions, you can ask about it, dive a little deeper into it. But uh, the budgets, uh, this is an example of the department summary of the finance department. Um, you'll see that there's three years of data, that's the uh, prior year, the current year, and the proposed, uh, the request for the, uh, the next uh, budget year. Uh, the You'll see in the, um, in, this, in the current year, we have the adopted budget and we have the amended budget. The amended budget is any uh, type of budget adjustments that might come through the council during the year. So those are, those are put into there. They also include any carry forwards of purchase orders that didn't lapse and uh, were ongoing that probably will in that the current year, but uh, crossed over years. And then the, um, the Request is what we're proposing. That's the proposed budget. Um, the first um, section is uh, the expenditures by character. And the character means it's the major expenditure categories. And it's a slight little summary of it. And it's uh, broken down by personnel services, services supplies and other charges, and then the capital outlay. Capital outlay are usually something that's going to turn into an asset. Um, the next section is broken down by uh, activity or program, and it's the specific, specific purposes of the department. So if, you know, like in parks, they might have sports and they might have senior programs. And so they're, uh, they're identified by an activity, a name and number, and we list those in, in the summary. And you'll see the expenditure first. We also isolate the uh, general fund, so you can see what the impact is to the general fund, the cost. And then uh, other funds follow that. Um, all, uh, and then there's a total at the bottom in that section. Um, the, la uh, the fourth section is resources by fund. And anything that's, um, anything that is uh, supporting this uh, directly, like if there's fees for an activity in parks or something, that would be listed here. Uh, you wouldn't have general revenues in here, but anything specific to the department that or the activity is included in that. And then your last line, uh, well, second to the last line, is the net general fund cost. So you can see anything that, uh, it's the difference between the activity revenue that's brought in and the expenditure. And so you see what the impact is to, the, uh, to our discretionary or general revenue, <coughs> mainly taxes. Um, so in the very last line is the authorized personnel for that department for the three years. Next one is a CIP document. Um, that previous slide that you saw does not include the CIP, even in the, in the enterprise funds. The CIP document is uh, outside of the operational budget, which we just went over. Um, the first one, the first column is the prior year. Uh, projects are non-lapsing, which means they go across several years. Usually it takes several years to get a project done. So uh, you'll see in the first 
uh, you'll see the project number, the description, the name, and then uh, prior year costs. That includes, that could go back five years, but you'll see that total there. And then you'll see the current budget, which is the, appro the current appropriation, and then an estimate actual. The estimated would be, usually be the whole budget because we know that it's going, if we're not, if we hadn't done, if we haven't done the work, that year, we're going to carry over the appropriations to the next year. Um, and they will be added to the next year, the first year that uh, where you see 2021, that would be your original, that would be the budget that we're, uh, oh, the 2020, that would be the budget that we're going to adopt. The, the following years in this are for information, but we don't adopt that portion. We only adopt the first new year. And uh, that, uh, I just wanted to add that the estimate actual that you see there, anything not spent will be added to that new year. Um, so, thank you. So new this year, uh, we added this community profile. Um, it's, uh, it's a way to highlight our community and um, feedback is absolutely welcome on this. It's the first year that we've introduced this, so it's kind of gonna be uh, kind of a work in progress for the next few years. Um, we base this loosely on, um, I'm gonna admit it, we stole it from Berkeley. Um, it, we, we saw it, it looked great, and we're like, okay, well, we're gonna steal this. Um, and I think it's a great graphic tool that um, we can add, definitely add to in the future. Here's some more ledgers here, but um, uh, you'll see that um, we have uh, the personnel profile, which is in the first part of your budget book, and then this uh, this listing of positions by uh, department and uh, listing of the position titles is in the back of your book. So the two go together, but uh, we thought we'd put the ledger in the back of the book, so in case you need to refer to it, you know, you would have. But the first part is just a narrative of the changes to, um, to positions in the city. Uh, you'll notice that we have no new general fund cost increases. We might have changed positions around, but or we might have uh, revised uh, the type of position if they're usually they're vacant or you know we we say or someone is retired and so we think uh, there's another position that might be better, but we make sure in the general fund that there's no cost increase going forward. Uh, the following is, uh, we did have increases in uh, um, the water department and the enterprise funds. Next uh, section is the debt and uh, you can see in, uh, it has the two years uh, for history, it's like, uh, you can see the citywide debt before pensions, uh, and then we take out the, the pension obligation. And uh, just as a little, I don't know, I think you you know this already, but when we went into the public safety pool for uh, retirement, there was a side fund that we had to pay off, uh, which, uh, because we weren't funded as high as the other uh, uh, agencies in the pool, and in 2010, I believe, we uh, took out pension obligations bonds because we saved the interest. Uh, CalPERS was charging us more than what we, we were able to get with the pension obligation bonds. So uh, you're looking at the pension obligation bonds uh, in the next one, we're looking at our, our pension debt. And we add that to that, the uh, citywide unfunded portion, which is what CalPERS tells us with their actuarial reports that this is what we have a liability for in the future. Uh, they're projecting, you know, they use how, what the cost is going to be for our retirement for our employees. And uh, when we have that, when we, you see that, it becomes a really large number. Uh, what I wanna say about the pension obligation bonds is um, they'll be paid off in a couple of years. Uh, the difference is in the beginning we were paying an annual uh, debt service payment of approximately a billion dollars increase, but these next two years are uh, around $3 million, so it's a heavier hit, but then they'll be finished. And just to recap, there's some data in there. We we're not adding any positions to the general fund. We're not increasing positions in the general fund. There's 11 added to our entire city workforce, and really five of them are the library system. That's not technically the city's oversight, the, their, the library systems employees are embedded in the city, there's five new ads. 
So you take those out and we've got four ads in water and two in public work. So for our entire organization, we're adding, proposing six new positions all in the enterprise funds. Now we'll just recap the healthy, great stories that are in our other funds. So our water fund, resource recovery fund, wastewater fund, our wharf, housing community development. A lot of our funds are doing well. They're, we have robust budgets. Water is a $46 million budget. Many of our enterprise funds are in the $20 million range. Outside of stormwater, most of those funds we look forward and, and we feel like they have the ability to manage themselves. Um, we have a couple one-offs like the low and mod housing fund, that's Granton, that one's a very unique fund that recall your presentations by economic development. There's a lot of nuance within that fund, but our enterprise funds are doing really well. The wharf has long-term needs, certainly, like most of our capital investments. There's a wharf ERR plan, there's a lot of big goals for reinvesting in the wharf. So I'm not saying that the wharf doesn't have, they have long-term ambitions and opportunities there, but right now in this budget, the, the wharf has most of the resources they need, not all of it, but most. They still require some help from the general fund and unfortunately we're not able to give them the help they need. There are some of the reductions you'll see today are the impacts of us reducing the general fund could impact some wharf maintenance. Um, we're trying to mitigate that to a certain extent possible. But by and large, these are the funds that we're not gonna dive deep in today. If we wanna spend more time into their budget, we're always happy to. You know me, if we wanna talk budget, Anytime, any place, let's go. Um, but we really want to focus the priority today on, is on the reductions because you're seeing those for the first time. So if, if there's an interest to dive deeper into their operations, we're happy to, to bring that back. Come on, clicker. You've seen this graphic, I don't need to repeat it. So what I mean by that is we have May 14th, May 28th, two scheduled council meetings where while May 14th agenda is being finalized now, we, we can squeeze in some conversation about the budget. May 28th, we do have allocated time to come back to you about the budget. We expect to have a more revised, have the final plan on how we're gonna balance the year's budget on May 28th. And should, should there be more information and more discussion that you wanna have, we would come back on the 28th for sure with a budget conversation. And then June 11th, there'll be more budget conversation with the goal of adopting the balanced budget on June 11th. In the CIP program, kind of a similar story, we have funding in place coming from a lot of our uh, enterprise funds, largely some grants. Uh, water has zero million, I forgot to take out the word million. It's one of the first years I've been here, they have no new money coming into the CIP program this year, and that's not an oversight. They have a lot of big projects already on the books. Uh, their their resources and bandwidth is focusing on the projects that they've already committed and working towards. So they've already got, by and large, the bulk of the funding they need in place. So this is a new year where there's not, you know, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million dollars of new water projects coming on board. I believe there's one small uh, investment that they're doing, but by and large, the water fund is working on the projects that are already in place. Uh, you can see the allocation of some of our other Types of projects, scenic trails, about 9.9 .9 million. That's the Monterey Bay scenic trail, I think phase seven, I forget the, which phase we're on. Uh, we have a solar PV project that we're working towards, $400,000, it's in the CIP. The library, well I just said briefly about the library positions, or not the city's positions. We have two, two primary branches that have investment coming into this year's CIP program. Uh, Garfield and Francis Foy, these are city projects, city branches that there is library funding coming to the city to invest in those projects. So we have $4.2 million coming to invest in Garfield and Branson 40. Yes. I do. So the projects by department or projects listed here, the numbers represent new capital projects. Yes, correct. The money may be sitting there already in reserves or it may be coming in new. Yes. But these are new big capital projects yes. in this budget. Yes, this is the new additions in 2020 for the capital improvement program. So this is a summary of the types of projects you'll see. Uh, we've spent some time doing a debrief on the CIP program overall in the mid-year. Uh, you've heard the presentations by departments that touched on many of these projects. Again, we're happy to go deeper into these, um, happy to, but we really want to focus today on, on the reductions to balance the budget. Just a different way of looking at it by type. Uh, 
and this is finance director Lynn, so I was trying to distinguish new project, meaning not new money, but something we're investing that we haven't done before versus investing in something that's uh, rehabbing, working on, a, on an existing project. So I'm sure I'm, you know, some of the departments are gonna come back to me and say, well, what's your definition of new? This was late last night, just thinking of how to break down the numbers at some different way. So I just wanna give you a glimpse. The yellow bars represent the water department. They have a two and a half million dollar that's coming in. It's largely to invest in the current system um, versus transportation. We have a lot of new projects, uh, expansion of like the, the Monterey Bay Scenic, Tail, Scenic Trail. That's a large project coming in that we're developing and building. So that's an order of magnitude of the CAP program by uh, types. And that concludes our conversation about the CIP. That's unusual for this hearing. Um, so like I said, we, we have more important things that we wanted to get to and create the space and time for it. Uh, we're getting a lot faster than I thought. Um, we are available for questions, so I, I didn't, I forgot the logistics. Um, happy to stop and, and, go and spend some time on questions. There's also a format that has worked in the past before We've got this afternoon allocated for a council discussion deliberation. Should you have something that comes to your mind anytime during this presentation or anytime during this morning or late in the afternoon that you wanna have added to the discussion list, let us know, we'll track that and we'll create a, a live tracking list of all the different discussion items. We wanna talk about planting trees, let's, do, let's go, let's do it. But uh, whatever that topic is, just let us know. We don't, we're not requesting that you do a motion. Your, your body can decide how you wanna do that in the past. It's worked well to just put up the ideas as they come to you and we, we can discuss them collectively in the afternoon. Um, that's a recommendation that's worked well in the past, so I forgot to, forgot to open with that, my apologies. Thank you, Marcus. We'll go ahead and maybe and take the, a moment to pause and sure. see if there are any questions from council members at this time in regards to the presentation so far. Council Member Cruz. Thank you, Marcus. Um, what is the uh, the new project library 4.3 and the refuse on your on the CIP by type? Uh, Page eight of the handout. Yep. The Garfield Garfield and Branson 40 branches have 4.2 million dollars coming into them. I believe Garfield's got three million dollars and Branson 40 1.2. Or Mike, actually, I think I'm reversed. Branson 40 is I think is the larger one. Um, those are the again money coming from the measure S from a couple years ago voters approved measure, different measure S to fund the cap county library system. So there's capital money coming to us to build out those branches. Are you, are you taking input, oh go ahead, sorry. No, no, no. Are you taking input on um, the list that you just mentioned? Uh, it, right now? Let, let me, in what way? I have, th I have three things, um, cool. gasoline purchases, um, sure. pickup trucks, and what you just said, street trees. Other questions, Council Member Crone? Thank you. I could just say, um, look, uh, Council Member Crone said pickup trucks. I would just expand that to vehicle purchases and leases. Marcus, I just have a quick question. Yes. Or maybe just, I didn't catch it. But you mentioned wharf maintenance. Yes. And, and how that impacts, or where that fits within the general fund. Would you mind explaining that a little bit further? Yeah, the, the wharf is a component of the general fund. We have it set aside as fund 104, but if, if technically if a fund starts with the one, it's part of the general fund. But the wharf is a 104 fund because there's some special grants and tidelands and some other things that we really need to report in a distinct, we're required to report distinctly different. They require, they always require general fund support and general fund subsidies, not wrong word subsidy, but there's a general fund investment always in the wharf. Uh, within this list that we'll get to in a few minutes, uh, one of the proposals is to make a moderate reduction in some of our wharf maintenance. It's Parks and Rec when they're looking at how would they, how might they reduce their budget operating costs. One of them is to think about reducing some of their wharf maintenance. I don't think it's the top of their list, but it's one of the things that we need to unpack a little bit more with the departments and then come back to you May 28th with a more thought, not thoughtful, but more detail on what the impacts of these would be. Thank you. Councilor Myers. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding our debt. debt uh, uh, so on the slide that says debt and positions on it, yep, debt and positions, I believe it's slide. Upper right corner has a number in it. Ah, there it is, number 11. Um, 
So the 218 million pension, that's the obligation that we have financed through the bonds that we are now, could you just explain a little yeah. bit about, just, just so I'm tracking and the public can track on sort of this obligation, sure. yeah. As I've talked in the past and recently with a few of you, it's a, it's a deep dive conversation to get into the pensions, the state system, the difference between the cost of the pension and the, and the, now the new layer of two thirds of this new cost is attributed to paying back the state for investment shortfalls. Right. So by order of magnitude, Santa Cruz Local is a new podcast and I'm not, they didn't pay me to say this, but it's a pretty good podcast, uh, Karen, um, Guzman. 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 Just, <laughs> anyways, um, right behind you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, this is now embarrassing. Um, we were having a conversation yesterday, and she asked a really great question. What What was the origins of our unfunded liability? What was it in, in the mid two thousands? And you know, I wasn't here in the two thousands. I, I recall where I was. It was it was a small, insignificant amount, and they just fluctuated year to year based on Calpers adjusting their annual numbers. Going back to 2004, I just looked last night, of $6 million. So we had a $6 million liability in our miscellaneous benefits mm -hmm. to the system. We were nearly 92% funded. That feels like a lot back then. I, I probably remember seeing numbers like that. I go, wow, $6 million, holy cow. Yeah. It's 100 million now, 107 million. 17,000% it's grown since 2004. And, and there's been no benefit change. Is that a percent? 17,000%? No, because that's what, that's, that's what the math says. Yeah, I know. Like, it's, it's, it's never heard that before. It's beyond yeah. belief. It's, I mean, the numbers we're talking about when we talk about $107 million just for miscellaneous benefits, which are pretty comparable to a lot of private sector stuff. Right. That, that's a wild number to think about. And it, and it leads where the conversations have gone, where newspapers have gone, where a lot of the conversations have gone. It's, wow, the, the system's bankrupt, the benefits are bloated. Well, actually the miscellaneous benefits are not, and it's not the cost of the benefit, it's this new layer that's coming on board to pay back the state for their, A, investment losses in the 2000s, and since then, they haven't been achieving the results that the market has, and they haven't been achieving the results at the level that they've done in the past. So we've seen that unfunded liability grow only because of a shortfall in investments, not because the pension, the benefit's gotten bigger, because it hasn't, the benefit stayed the same. In fact, we've reduced our benefits. Santa Cruz adopted a second tier. Santa Cruz has lowered its benefits. Uh, we've had employees paying more. So we've done a lot of work ourselves to lower the benefit cost. So that's what I mean. It's a very complicated Well, that's subject. why I asked the question because I do think that it's an important thing for the community to yes. understand is that, you know, this the debt obligation, I mean, anyone that, you know, I mean, that when you learned how to do your checkbook, yep. you know, you learned that yep. if you wrote a check and you only had, you know, I mean, this is, this goes back to just the proper, and it speaks more largely to the financial security, not only of the city, but of, of our community as well, because yep. of so many services we provide. And so I think it's just a very important thing to, to really have, um, I mean, it's worth having the extra five or 10 minutes just because that obligation is clearly, um, it's in a sense unprecedented yes. and and so that is an important piece for people to understand and it speaks even more importantly to the need to be fiscally smart and conservative to get us through this obligation that hopefully we will never uh, as a individual city yep. or uh, for all the cities in California to to be burdened with again so I just think it's an important hiccup in the history of yes, cities in California it because it is across the entire state. And it does demonstrate that we, are, I, I believe, thanks to all your guys' work, we're really being forecasted, we're forecasting into the future in a really smart way so that we do not end up where a lot of cities will will yes. be in a few years. So yeah. thank you, I just wanted yeah. to dig a little deeper. Right. <laughs> thanks. Excellent question. Great point. <laughs> thanks, Marcus. Right. Question. So, did you just to reiterate? You, those 107 million are are just paying for benefits. No, no. The the bulk of the 107 million is to pay. The state is a loose word, but the state manages the investment for the pension system. The state, the investments for the state for the pension system have been underperforming compared to what they could be doing. We, we've seen the slides. We, we did some decent modeling that if the state had just followed what 
you know, a basket of index funds, normal average index funds have done, they'd be super funded right now. Instead of being whatever, billions and billions in the hole, they'd be super funded right now. And we wouldn't have seen these layers of cost increase. And the city would have $12 million more right now to, to, to manage and, and invest in our community. But because they haven't made those, those they haven't followed the market or, or followed what they've done in the past, their investment shortfalls are being funded by us and every member agency across the state. So it's, it's, we're backfilling the state pension system because of the investment shortfalls. Maybe I overexplained it. Do you have um, a notion of how that happened, just in, in terms of just people sure. just giving generous um, benefits? No, I, I think it's, it's, policy, it's policies, policies yeah. decisions by investment advisors that have said, boy, we really took a bath. We really were annihilated. The state hires a lot of multi-million dollar companies to manage their investments. It's not just staff. And they all missed it. You know, they, they, they like most, in the 2000 Great Recession, they missed it, they were annihilated. So I think it's natural reaction to be, oh, let's never miss that again, let's get ultra conservative. And let's not take risks and, and, and let's not seek yield, let's get ultra conservative so we're always green. Well, green meaning positive, not green meaning environmental. So I think they made policy decisions to become more conservative at the time when the economy is doing better. That's the wrong time to become more conservative is in the beginning of a 10 year growth period. They also have made, and we can all have opinions on the why, but they've also made a lot of political policy decisions on let's not invest here because we don't want to invest in those type of industries. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but those two kind of pathways have led to a more conservative investment prof profile and then less uh, diversity in their investments. So it's their investment decisions being made within the state pension system have led to less returns and we're the plug. So um, think of, you know, loaning money to your kids and and they go off to Tahoe and you give them 200 bucks and they come back with a credit card bill of $10,000, you're the plug, you know, uh, we're, the, we're that plug, you know, the, the state investment didn't, I'm not sure if that's a great analogy, I don't know why I went there. <laughs> um, it's, kinda, it's a complicated topic, but the state missed their targets and whenever they miss it, they make us pay for it and then they charge us seven and a quarter interest on that. So it, it's, a, it's a, like I said, it's, it's a deep dive, probably could have two other people who standing beside me and go a lot deeper into this, but my bottom line is the, ben the miscellaneous benefit is, is not driving the cost of this, it's investment shortfalls. Councilor Brown? I don't wanna go too far down this road yeah. today, given that there's not much we can do about it here <coughs> at the moment, but <coughs> I'm, I'm just, um, I've been really following this and trying to understand since I came onto the council. And so based on what you said today, uh, it's, I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. So after the CalPERS system took a bath on those investments and then became conservative, there was already that um, loss. So then we weren't, they didn't make any of it up in addition to being very conservative. Is that right? Yes. So they're like, we were, they were starting from a 30 deficit of their, position they lost and 30%. then got conservative. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thanks. So we, we all recognize that the system will take a hit. We're going to have to, we're partners of that. What we didn't recognize is that they wouldn't hit their, their benchmarks um, or, or do better. I mean, typically CalPERS has done 11, 15, 18% returns in good times. We've had a 10 year run of good times and they're not doing that. Um, there's, there's years in this time period, 0.6%, 0.6%, less than 1% returns in these good times. There's a 2%, there's a 1%. Uh, there's numbers like that in this 10 year run that's like, wow. That's, so when they're not hitting eight and they're hitting 0.6, that's an immediate increase in our rates because we're the backfill. Thank you for the clarification, Marcus. Yeah. I think I'll just add that I think there's a lot of work happening within the League of Cities and really yes. looking at how do we advocate, you know, as cities who are now stuck in this position. So you'll keep us informed if there's more that we can do in yes. that regard. Please continue. A question about the municipal wharf. Do you want to put that on your list or should I just ask you, maybe there's an easy question, uh, answer for it. it appears in th uh, several different places, but one place it's 104, yes. which is 180,000, and then it appears in Parks and Rec uh, for 2.3 million. What, what is that? 
the that, that's the annual cost for the wharf. Yeah, um, just just maintaining the wharf for yeah, the yeah. parks and rec. Two point three million personnel. Um, there's a it's 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 a very, it's our most <clears throat> challenging asset with wind, water, and erosion and other things. So there's a lot of maintenance that goes on that we never see beneath the wharf. So it's a very intensive system to maintain and keep open to the public. And uh, what was 104, the fund? That's the fund number. That's just an internal what, designation. That's 180,000, what does that mean? Um, I'd have to look at it. That might be their net number. Um, um, there was a settlement for the, the Oh, there's a resource coming in. There was an insurance settlement for repairs that, that that's that's for. And that's where that money comes from? Uh, it was an insurance settlement, yes. So it's there until the repair, the, the cost of the repairs are, they haven't finished them yet, so. Thank you. Marcus. Um, so where are, where were, a year ago we were projecting this year to have a $1.6 million deficit. And why we're at three now, I just want to kind of unpack that a little bit. We're in labor negotiations, and labor negotiations are like any negotiation. We projected what it could be, and we're a little bit, we, we're choosing to invest more. We're losing staff. We need to attract, retain, and develop. So we recognize that. So our labor costs are trending higher than we projected. So that's that's a big change from where our forecast was. Um, I'm now regretting saying council and committee support, but some of it is, I'm not necessarily, I'm saying you guys, but we, we've all collectively recognized things like the housing task force and, and there's other initiatives with updating strategic, uh, developing a strategic plan. Um, there's things we need to do, health and all policies, things we need to do that have, you know, numbers of 20,000 to 250,000. Collectively, when we pile them together, there's about $400,000 of additional investments that are coming into the budget. So that's pushed our number up. The 911 center, we're, uh, we're part of a pool that jointly manages the 911 center. It's collectively run. We don't have our own center. We rely on a shared resource system. It's very cost effective. They have an outdated records management system that your police department can talk to you all the time about. About We want data, they want data, but the 911 system is just, it's a lot like our Eden thing yesterday when we were talking about 20 year Eden, um, our city's financial system. Their system needs an upgrade. They're doing that. So they're getting closer to selecting a vendor. They're getting closer to finalizing the price. That number is bigger than what we had allocated in. But this, this is a good investment. I'm just going through the list of what has changed. Um, we've always have liability claims. This past year, we've had a couple bigger ones than expected that you know we haven't got to the place that this is the number, but they look like they're gonna be bigger than we expected. So that's pushing our budget up a little bit. And there's just generally a lot of other support things that are popping in, even things like the census for next year, 2020, every 10 years is a census. And so we wanna have small investment to help make sure that goes. Uh, so we've got collectively almost doubled our deficit from 1.6 to 3.2 million. Those are some of the bigger ticket items of how we got there. Um, the, the question, you know, Kara uh, asked yesterday and I haven't got back to her, what are we seeing on cost increases from our shelter from the Ross camp? And, and to date, we're not seeing significant increases. There's a lot of chatter about that. Most of our time is staff time out there. Uh, we do have some direct costs and we're still collecting and paying invoices and working on getting that information to you. Um, but this, this deficit is not largely driven by those numbers. Uh, the city manager's office had smartly included some allocations of budget capacity for, for those types of programs in their budget. So we believe we've got, we fairly represent, we, we believe the budget that we plan for will be enough to cover our, our direct additional costs. But it is staff, staff intensive. There are a lot of city staff involved for sure. And then we, we want to just touch on where we've been. We'll, we'll get there again. This 2020, because I, like I said in the beginning, was a big year for us a couple years ago. We looked at 2020 and said, wow, that's a big, that's a big, that's that's when our gap gets really large. How are we gonna, how are we gonna tackle that? And I'm proud that it got down to 1.6 million and I'm still nervous, 3.2 million, we'll get there, but it makes me a little bit nervous. Um, but more recently we've, uh, in April and May, you've heard department presentations priming you for what's coming. Um, we have the opportunity to schedule special study sessions should we wanna dive deeper. We've got today's May 8th hearing May 14th, May 28th, June 11th, the next three council dates. Um, May 28th and June 11th, we've already got an allocation for budget. So I'm repeating things I've said before that 
if you feel like you want to dive deeper on things and we're running out of time today, there's the, today's the beginning, not the end. Uh, so we'll have more opportunity to, to go deeper. Things I've said before, uh, how we prepared for today, really we have a fiscal sustainability plan, a fiscal 2023, that we've identified a lot of things starting around 2015 of how we can start uh, dealing with 21, 22, and 23. Last year we had a very award-winning uh, action lab process that generated 67 different initiatives and ideas to think about, look deeper on. We've to date researched about 19 of them. There's uh, nine actively in play right now that the committees are doing amazing work and I was part of some presentations that are doing and I can't wait to bring you their stuff, but it's getting closer. So we've been working towards some other solutions. We had last year's budget ad hoc committee, budget revenue committees, a lot of work went into place last year uh, with, with a lot of you. Uh, we were seeing a lot, all your faces in different times and places on a, repeat different roles. Um, so there was a lot of work last year on getting ready for the stuff. We have budget focus groups, one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work prior to today, but recognizing that there's still more to come. Um, a little bit about our fiscal 2023 sustainability plan. It's kind of a guideline document. Um, we recognize that it's an evolving tool. It's way, it's really, to some respects, it's a way for us to catalog the stuff we've been doing. So when we, we started looking at all the stuff we've been doing in the last three or four years, um, we weren't surprised by this number, but still felt really proud of $14 million of new general fund resources has come out of our fiscal 2023 sustainability plan already. So were it not for that plan, we'd have a we'd have $14 million less of opportunities right now. So it's been a very uh, well-designed, smart uh, initiative that's included things like measure, last year's measure S sales tax. We've, we've re-engineered how we present budgets. We've re-engineered some of our starting points of budgets. We've updated cost allocation plans, updated fee studies. Um, we've done a lot of work um, setting up retirement pension trusts. A lot of work has come out of that that's starting to pay big, big, big dividend, dividends, almost compounding dividends. You saved 200,000 three years ago and it grows to 600,000 by now. So we've been making a lot of good effort and there's more work to, be, to come. So I just wanna acknowledge that we've been acting smartly, forward thinking for quite a while and more work to be done. This is all stuff you've seen before, so I'm gonna go through a little bit fast. We're getting closer to the longest, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I do have a question on these last two here. Um, you mentioned the action labs and you've been very proud of those. We just haven't heard details, which yeah. is not your fault. We'll do that offline, but um, uh, have, have those ideas um, either uh, already in progress or potentially saved some significant amounts of money? Yes, yeah, so we, we or, have. Or just nibbling on the edge. No, there, there, there's some significant, there's some possible nibbling that could, uh, could also be culture change or organizational change, but not, might not be big dollars now. But there is some big stuff we're talking about. Uh, one of the ideas, you know, I don't want to dive too deeper because I want to respect the group that will be likely presenting to you on it. But one of the ideas is re-looking at our impact fees and how we might redesign some of our impact fees. Because we need to find a funding source for, I mean, call it what it is, our fire engines do not have a funding source. And when they come due, we need to be ready to replace them and they come with a big price tag. So can we get a, a re-engineer some impact fees um, so our parks and fire vehicle, large fire vehicles can have stable, dependable funding sources. So that's, that's an idea that's being researched thoroughly. We've got some ballot measure ideas that they're looking at. Um, so there's some big initiatives certainly in play. Um, there's also some different yeah, things. Without going into detail yeah. here, but I, I think we'd probably all like to get an update on that because yes. so far it's just been kind of theoretical. And yeah. I think many people have been saying, what about this, what about that? And you're already working on them. Yeah. So, um, so we're, we're just, again, it is probably worthy of a more deep dive conversation, but where we're at right now is they've, they've finished a lot of their preliminary research. They're getting ready to present and go through a grilling of like executive level department head testing of their assumptions. And then a lot of those ideas will be, we, we hope presented by the group to you because this is also about succession development, teamwork, yeah. bringing people together. Do you have so, a, a timeline thought on that? Uh, we, we're envisioning this parallel. So May 28th, oh, you so might see a first review, uh, you, May 28th or June 11th, one of those two meetings. Yeah. We're moving towards those dates to have a few things start coming to you. Great. Thank you for the question. And then, um, Again, it's really impressive in the slide 18, um, uh, 14 million in 
bud general fund budget solutions is impressive. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'd personally just like more information on that too. I'll get yeah. together with you. That um, rectangular sheet that's shown there, I think yeah. Tracy, you showed that. But do we have that? Where? <laughs> I believe they were um, handed out during the mid-year um, mid budget. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll, push yeah. that, we'll push that out to you. Yeah, I, yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll send it out. Yeah, it was not at my fingertips. <laughs> Great, thank you, Marcus. Would you prefer that we wait until you conclude this portion of the presentation and then ask questions, or would you? We've done both ways. I'm, I, I think it's okay to ask questions. I mean, it's fine with me okay. to ask questions while we're there on that slide. Okay. Uh, okay, Councilmember Myers. Just, I just quick question. Measure as sales tax. Yeah. That's that. That's the measure that was passed. Twenty sixteen. Yes. Uh, Twenty eighteen. Last year. Sorry. Last June. Okay. Yes. So yeah. not the library tax. They were both, both called Measure Correct. S. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. And what's our current uh, tax rate right now? Off the top tax. of your head. Uh, nine and a quarter. Is it nine and a quarter? Is that and that's, that's max, the max. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We're at the ceiling. Okay. Thank you. Funny how they. The most obvious questions I want to go home. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Pull out a receipt, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this slide is not a doom and gloom, but it's just recognizing next month in June will have equaled our longest recovery period in our nation's history. Um, again, it doesn't mean that we can't go longer and because we had a second worst recession ever, we're not surprised it's going longer. But things do come to an end, and, and good times do come to an end. Recessions do happen, typically about every five or six years. So we're well beyond <laughs> the time frame when a recession would have already happened. So we've had a good run. It's, for us, it's not felt like a good run because of revenue erosion, backfilling the state pension system. We're not seeing those good times that the private sector is, or downtown, or the boardwalk are. Um, but we do recognize that the economy is doing well, and we, we hope and hope that it gets bigger and does more, but we're not optimistic about that. We think at some point in time, it's gotta stop. What this means for our forecast is we're a little bullish in a downtime, meaning we don't expect a 5% loss in revenue in a downtime. We think property values will stay okay. Sales tax will go down a little bit. The boardwalk tends to do really good in downtimes. Um, so we have a diversified economy. We can talk a lot more about that at another point in time. So what it means for us if we, if our projection comes true and next year we start, we start to hit a recession, it means a moderate change in our economic outlook. If the economy stays humming, the downside is if we projected a 2% growth rate and we get three, then that delta isn't that big. If we thought we were gonna drop five and we got three, then you got an 8% swing, then you're doing, wow, this is much better than we thought. Um, so I just want to alert you that it's, it would be great news for this recession to not come, but it also doesn't alter our forecast a whole lot if it stays good for a couple years. It'll get slightly better, but we're not expecting a big drop for us. Maybe that's too complicated, but um, talked a little bit about this. If CalPERS had just done things that they've done in the past or followed the market, 65 billion, billion, billion more right now they'd have than they need. They'd be a surplus position. Um, instead of 144 billion behind. So that's just a reflection of if they'd only, if only, uh, what if? What if they had followed market returns? What if they'd followed average returns that they've done in the past during good times? Um, so this is stuff we've talked about before. Again, recognizing that these are very deep dives. Uh, our tax bases, sales tax, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm rolling. <laughs> and I, I forgot all about Tracy and Cheryl, who we had a strategy on. <laughs> Anything at me. Okay, uh, it just dawned on me. I'm doing all the talking. It's okay. Um, this is more about. Uh, this is a uh, three items in our general revenue. We talked about the general revenue before. Where, if you see the net uh, net general fund cost, this is where the support comes from, and uh, where these were set up before to be able to bring in adequate revenues to support that. The the change in uh, the way that. Uh, citizens are, uh, the way we're spending is is uh, changing and it's changing for everybody, but um, the taxable items are goods and goods, uh, services aren't taxed and find a, a, like the baby boomers are spending more on services. Uh, even uh, other uh, age groups are spending more on services instead of, instead of goods. So we're not seeing that revenue 
you know, uh, something that the baby boomers would be spending on is health care. There's no ta sales tax on that. Uh, the gas tax, we've got the fuel efficient cars, and so we're not bringing in enough in that respect too because uh, they're not going, they're not buying gasoline. And then um, just the difference in the way that our entertainment is or our uh, landlines are vi uh, vanishing, so we're not bringing in the franchise and utility tax on that. So what, what ends up happening is, as our tax base is rosing, as we're making more to backfill the state for pension investment shortfalls and other things happening, when we look at our general fund primary <coughs> reserves, uh, 11.5 million feels great right now. Um, it starts shrinking, and if if we if we don't solve the 3.2 million deficit, and we don't solve the out year deficits by 2022, we're in the red and we're borrowing from somewhere to, to sustain operations, or we're having to make big cuts. So this is not a great story, certainly. Um, but we will act, and I'm, and I'm confident that we'll have, by June 11th, some solutions in place. But this is just it gives a sense of what we're facing. Um, again, I'm thankful that we're in this community. We have a diversified tax base. We have a community that's thoughtful, responsive, ask, engaged. Um, so we like to think we can collectively come together with a lot of great solutions. But we don't have a lot of time to wait. Um, we're not in a position, because we're forecasting multi-year deficits, we're not in a position to say, hmm, let's see what happens next year. Um, and I'm not, not saying most do, but some agencies yeah. get so busy they forget to, to, to plan ahead. So, Councilmember Brown? Quick question. Um, so forecasting deficits, um, does that include forecasting around additional revenue enhancements? I mean, assumption, are you assuming that that will happen? We're assuming some things, but like ballot measures, it, okay. we, were just, we don't typically uh, assume those because of their nature. Um, but that would be great if, and I know we're thinking about ballot measures. So if sure. we could add that for afternoon discussion. Thanks. Absolutely. Councilmember Matthews. And um, I'm just reading on this chart, our goal is a 10% reserve. Uh, we've achieved that in our uh, 100 million general fund for 2019, but we're already seeing a, a drop below our target for 2020. Am I reading that? Yeah, in fact, in, in 19, we're gonna finish below where we should be because we'll, yeah. if, you, if you look at our 20 or 10% reserves plus public trust funds, plus economic development trust funds, we probably should have closer to 12 or 13 million at the minimum. And we're starting to eat into those Big time uh, then. Yes. Like half. Yeah, what so what, what it means is by the end of, by, by somewhere early on in 2022, our public trusts are empty, our economic development trust is empty, and our general fund reserves are gone. Again, we're gonna act and we're collectively get there, but that's, that's what we're facing. It's just around the corner. Just a thought on this in the future then, it might be good to have the different colors in that bar. That's a good point. Of the components. And I'd emphasize as a finance director, I have to recommend that we should be thinking about other types of reserves we might want in place. Uh, it was really alarming last year's fires and the nature hearing fire chiefs and other people talk about the projection for future fires. And to look at our, our community, we have a high risk there. And it would be smart to start building up some what if funding just in case we have a, a disaster at a bigger level than we've seen before. Uh, and we don't have that in place. It would be good to have Every year we have a capital project failure or something that comes along the line. It'd be nice to have a place where we can touch to go to, to grab some funding without dipping into reserves or, or minimum security reserves. That 10% is really there for like, oh my gosh, you know, we've got a three year economic recovery or recession coming and we wanna, we wanna start pulling a little bit from there. I mean, that's, that's really the model where you want your reserves to be is that last stop because you need to preserve things because you know something's coming that's gonna be better. Right now, because we see a revenue erosion continuing without tax reform, and because we see we don't know how long this next recession will be, we're nervous about saying let's pull from reserves and hope that good times will be coming later. Because I, I think it's gonna get worse, not better for governments. And, and so does the budget that you've presented us here assume a drop to a $7 million or? Yes, until we fix this balance, until we, we, we offset our 3.2 million, yes, we will, we will and erode and into. And if we can achieve that, we return to a healthier, healthier balance. Yes. And we need to also start thinking about, I know it's hard to think about planning.
plan surpluses. Like we should try to plan right, for some surpluses right. to build up. Right, build the reserves, yeah. yeah. Councilmember Myers. Um, I guess I just wanna follow up a little bit on the, I'm, I'm very supportive of the disaster contingency fund. Um, this could also very easily be called a climate, um, mm. a climate resilience fund, frankly, um, because that's really probably what we're looking at short of another earthquake. And I would say we've already had ours. Um, <laughs> we need another one, but um, it's a really intriguing idea. I think um, the County of Sonoma ha is the lead on this sort of, the, this idea of resilience. And uh, I know they just completed an extensive resilience report that I think would be worth looking at. It's something that I think we um, and our local cities should really look at in, in partnership with the county eventually. But um, we, won't, we won't ask for that money this year, but um, I think in, in terms of sort of state state um, forecasting, uh, this is going to be so incredibly important. I mean, it's absolutely shocking what has gone on in the last two summers. It's yes. unbelievable. So I'm really, really um, pleased to see that you are thinking this way. And while reserves used to be proper um, fiscal policy, they actually could mean the difference between um, uh, really how if people can survive through some of these things. So this is just a different level and I just um, just wanna compliment you in thinking this way and um, very much appreciate you guys bringing this forward. Don't wanna be doom and gloom, but this is a really important thing for governments in California to be really thinking about, so thank you. Thank you for that name, that's a good one. <laughs> I'm gonna, if I just pause for a second, I'm gonna remind those in the audience, if you do have a poster to keep it, to, to please keep it down, because it, does, it will block the people behind you from being able to see, okay. Now we get to the, uh, our budget solution. So staff have been working aggressively with uh, department heads and their managers and identifying how we would bridge a gap um, we've we've confidently got to about 2.4 million. There's other ideas, so we're not done. We've had a list of other ideas, but we just need more time really understanding the impacts of them to be able to recommend a thoughtful recommendation to you about how we get from 2.4 to 3.2. So we recognize we're 800,000 short of our goal right now. Um, and we haven't talked about this afternoon and what may, might change. So there's more work that we have to do and we're, we're doing it. We're doing it now. We're just not at that place where we can confidently recommend this versus that and, and explain why we're recommending that. Um, but we do have $2.4 million identified and we'll spend some time, again, recognizing that you're seeing it in slide deck for the first time. Um, some of the stuff we were still fine tuning yesterday um, and conversations. Um, so what you see here is uh, resulting of an allocation by functional groups within the general fund. City Council all the way down to Public Works in alphabetical order. You see the total amount of reductions that are coming out of those operations. I can pause here. I don't think I need to read the numbers to you, but um, if there's any questions just in how we got here. So we met with department heads. We asked them, what would you do? What can you do? They came up with a long list of ideas. We've had meetings about those individual ideas collectively. Is this probable? Is this realistic? Is this sustainable? So we've been through a lot of filtering of those ideas, and these are the ones we feel confident that are sustainable, are smart, and by and large wouldn't alter the face and look of how the community is getting services now. Um, there are some things that might, and we, we'll, we'll talk about those, but I'll, I'll just pause right here. If there are questions just about how we got here or about the numbers. Okay, Councilor McCrum. Oh, I, I would ask, what, what was the 24,000 city council? Uh, we'll, we'll ju I'll jump right into that if you don't oh. mind. We'll just... Okay, you can please then continue. Again, recognizing that <laughs> that's a particular interesting one. I'm not laughing at that. I'm, it's, it's, you know, it's staff recommending to you what we think you should do, but we haven't got your input on what we think you should do. So we recognize there's a chicken and egg process, and this is that process where we will we'll discuss that. So starting with some of the bigger departments, I'm gonna start with first police and fire. We recognize that their operations are really compounded by a lot of service demands and they don't have the flexibility to alter their operations a whole lot, even though they came forward with a lot of ideas. And let me tell you, they did a lot of hard work 
of what they could do, might do, and we're just not comfortable with some of those outcomes of not hiring, uh, going slow on positions, eliminating certain positions. We're not comfortable those are the right solutions. Um, so that might be something we have to do further down the line. We recognize that, but we're hoping we don't have to get to those points. Um, what did come out in police and fire is a fire department a first responder fee, recognizing, again, there's, we're not saying yes today. What, we're, what we wanna get as daylight is the types of things where we wanna bring back May 28th and really firm up, but highlight what it is we're thinking about. So the first responder fee, the fire department's been doing a lot of work um, over the last couple of years looking at how they might become a more responsive department in, in the community. We thought about things of working with uh, ambulance provider contracts. Yeah. But this is an outcome of those types of conversations. There are a lot of communities that, there are some communities that have a fee that when the fire department responds for a medical call, it's really a way to build the insurance if the person is insured. Uh, we get into that billing process. If you're picked up by an ambulance and you have insurance, the insurance is backfilling the cost of the ambulance. When we show up and we're first on scene and we're treating and providing resources to, we're, we're doing that at, at no cost to anybody. I mean, it's our, our dime. But the ambulance shows up and they're billable by the minute once they get there. So it's kind of replicating that model for us. So if we're first on seat and we're providing medical response or whatever it might be, that we can get into that billable space for largely for insurance purposes. And I would certainly defer to the fire department when we're ready to have this conversation. You know, today's not the day to say, yes, let's do that and let's go live next week. Um, but it's to acknowledge this is one of the ideas that we come that came forward that seems worthy for consideration. So that's the first responder fee. Can I ask a clarifying yes. question? Is that something that other jurisdictions do? Um, is it something, or is it some, would it be something brand new? No, there are other jurisdictions oh, that okay. do that for sure. It's, I wouldn't sense. say everybody's doing that, but there are a lot of, yes. I see the logic, okay, thank you. In the police department, one of the ones we, th we felt comfortable having the conversation, we've had these conversations before about first alarm. Uh, we. we, we contract with First Alarm Private Security to supplement things we do, and also just to be eyes and, <coughs> eyes and ears out there in the community. Um, just by design, they're not able to do a lot of things that a police officer um, or even a, a ranger might. Um, they're more eyes and eyes, walkie-talkie, calling in things, um, a little bit of, of, of interaction with, with issues. When we're looking at the police department, it feels like a worthy conversation to have. Should we reduce the level of our use of private patrol? So things like patrols in Lower Ocean Street, uh, patrols around uh, the wharf area. Those might be areas that we're not seeing the bang for the buck. And I think our police chief and the team can talk more about that as more questions evolve. But those are two perfect examples of things that are, are probably are definitely worthy of this conversation and definitely more interaction, more information is, would come as compared to the fire the finance department working on lease negotiation, lowering our lease rate. I'm not sure a lot of people care a whole lot of them just, just do it or passing on certain credit card fees to transactions that people are used to paying those. Those feel like just do it things. These are not just do it. These are conversations we wanna have with council and make sure before we go forward, do you support generally these ideas if you say, you know, we, don't, we want first alarm, in fact, we want to double first alarm, I'm not saying you would. You know, that's important for us to understand. Um, we want to recommend the reducing first alarm. We think there are better ways of doing it um, and to allow the police department to further research that and come back May 28th with a very concrete proposal of what that might look, look and feel like. So that's an example to get warmed up of, of two things. Councilmember Matthews. And are there in all of these um, other just do it type? Yes, things? for sure. For sure, I mean, yeah. we, we, very candidly, there's easily 1.6 million of the 2.4 that would have just been built into the budget anyways. Um, and there, there are things that, you know, we, if we have to reduce the things we, we could do without a lot of a lot of notice, a lot of impact or, or people even knowing that we did it. I mean, it's, we, we talked a year ago and I, Councilmember Myers, are, are, are really noodling on this climate resiliency idea. Um, but that was our theme last year's budget of the cuts we're making are starting to really eat into our resiliency and you're starting to see it. We're not as nimble as we were a year ago. But, you know, we're delayed on giving you certain materials. Um, so the reductions that we would do, I would say, are something that we can do and we will do, but it just restricts us even more. Um, we're, we're losing 
where it's not just resiliency, we're losing response time at some levels for us. So I, I'm not, I'm over explaining that yes, we would do it and yes, we recommend it. We wish we weren't doing any of this. So as I read it, all these things that we're gonna go through now are things that you anticipate merit real conversation. Yeah, some do and some are, we should probably just do, to be very candid. And, and, I can and under all this is the realization that as we eat into the just do it things, that's the low hanging fruit and it gets harder and harder. Just fewer Yeah, it's not the fruit, we're breaking those. limbs off now. Yeah. We picked the fruit, the fruit's gone, now it's breaking that small limb off. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying, I'm not sure if that that's works, perfect. but it just really popped good. in my head. Better than the Band-Aid one. Yeah. <laughs> So these, these are essentially rep representative of the entire list. The numbers are still fluctuating a little bit, like what would that save, how would that look? Um, order of magnitude of first responder fee is a couple hundred thousand dollars. Reducing first alarm could be, you know, 100,000 to 400,000, I think 200,000 to 400,000 or 300,000. But, um, but my point is, we've got a really reasonable framework of how that might look and we wanna come back with more. So today, if you say, absolutely not, do not consider first alarm reductions, that's important for us to understand. If you say, absolutely not, my gut tells me that we don't wanna explore first responder fee, that's important for us to hear to say, to hear. Again, I recognize that you need more time with this, so we're not making those final decisions, but we're just looking for your feedback. Does this feel like the right direction? Because we've gotta do something. And again, it's just procedurally. Do you want that feedback now as we go through all these, or will be will we be coming back to? These I think let, I think this might be a place. Let me power through it, and I think it is okay just to get started about how this might flow, and then be able to respond. We have a lot of people <coughs> from our departments who are better positioned to answer some of these questions. Yep. Okay, we'll go ahead and then yep. finish up, and we'll hold our questions yep. till the end. So, you know, so police and fire, again, they, they had other ideas. We just were uncomfortable with things that impact staffing and direct operations. We're not sure that that's, we're at that place yet. Uh, public works operations and engineering. Public works, as you know, is in the general fund, they're diverse, but outside of this, the whole city, they're incredibly, uh, incredibly diverse department from wastewater to uh, resource recovery, landfill management, um, storm drains, engineering <laughs> grants, capital improvement programs, facilities. Um, but within the general fund, there are some direct areas that we, we directly fund, engineering, traffic, and some of their operations, um, and some parking stuff. Uh, that's general fund parking revenue supported. So the ideas that came out of the public works um, came out of, we have certain services that we make available for people who need emergency <coughs> work done or emergency engineering or some last minute permitting stuff. Public works is part of um, community support projects. Um, what we would recommend there is reducing our level of responsiveness in there to even less than we have now. Other ideas that are coming out of the public works, we, we spend a lot of time looking at energy resource and this is a painful one to talk about. Um, I don't, we would not eliminate all ideas, but we'd have to recognize we, we can't keep spending multiple levels of resource staff time and consultant cost on analyzing every great idea on how we might do things differently with energy. We have to be a little bit smarter, maybe a little more strategic about that. Again, they could talk to you a lot more detail about this. Uh, reducing flood control maintenance, which includes some surrounding vegetarian vegetation. Um, those are examples of things that are nuanced. Um, again, this list or outside of energy stuff might be something we would do anyways, and we would have probably built into the budget anyways. Um, they feel more smaller scale impact, but certainly if we have questions, they're available to get into it. Within their parking and traffic, um, they're looking at, and they've heard the idea about increasing parking rates. So beach area would be definitely an area that we would aggressively look at. Um, getting into residential and guest permit pricing, um, those would be areas that we would also look at. So if there's a concern or, or, or don't go forward, that's certainly something we wanna hear today. Street Smarts Outreach Program. I'll let them talk a little bit more. That's one that uh, definitely would be on the radar of let's have a conversation about it, um, as would funding for some, some bike and pedestrian crossing areas. Those are, we recognize that those are areas that probably wanna be, have a little bit more conversation on. So those are public works. Some of our other developments, economic development, planning and parks and rec. 
uh, economic development has several that are important to talk about, reducing, not eliminating, but reducing facade improvement program, reducing graffiti contract, and reducing some public art work. Uh, we have staff that are heavily involved in a lot of those areas, and we have contractors involved in, in many of those areas, and we do direct grants for facade improvements. So we'll be reducing, reducing those areas. Facade improvements, we've been doing that in the past. So every year we're, we're looking like we're taking a little bit less out of that pot. And it is a valuable program. Uh, we've had some great successes out of that. Um, they've also got some temp staffing and contractual staffing that help them do their job. And I don't think they would love to reduce that. It's probably not the top of their list, but it's on their list of ideas to think about. Planning and economic development, or planning and the community development, excuse me. They, they have a lot of um, professional resources, whether it's people helping, help, helping review plans or helping support research or supporting um, housing initiatives. <clears throat> they rely on a lot of professional resources to help them provide information to you and to the public and to the commission. So their impacts would reduce their ability to use as many resources, and which could reduce their ability to do some of the project work. They would also reduce some of their ability to support counters, um, be responsive to client support, as well as they were in the last several years relied more on some legal support for various research projects, ideas, initiatives, project, um, to reduce the legal support, we'd have to reduce some of that project work. So it's not just as simple as we won't use attorneys, it's we have to stop the work that's triggering the attorney's use. So there's, there's some pain in that space for sure. Uh, parks and Rec, there are some things in here we might do anyways and some things we want to be more thoughtful about. Um, already had the conversation about, for example, delaying wharf. Um, but also there's some museum maintenance that we do. Again, these are moderate delays would noticeably be seen. We hate delaying any maintenance. So it's not something we want to do, but that's, you're breaking those limbs off. I mean, these are not easy choices. But if we want to bridge the gap, these are things we can do. We have staff time and some direct costs to help with fencing and maintaining fencing around some of our parks and other areas. We recognize also that we can reduce some of our water costs. We're, we're a client, a customer of our water system. And so Parks and Rec pays a lot of, uh, buys water from our water system. So they would reduce some of their water usage by browning out certain areas. They have other programs, summer programs, um, our museum program that they eliminate they eliminate the youth museum programming. They reduce some hiring for sports officials, some of our camp uh, attempts. And they could talk to you more about the, the impact statement. It's not eliminate, it's reduce, reduce some, as well as reducing trail and some cleanup costs. Um, there's also some advertisement for some promotion efforts we put into our, some of our summer programming and some bus trips that would be, that would be stopped. So that's the nature of those types of changes and impacts. Finally getting into <coughs> where we started with council, what, what's the council stuff and, and community support programming and some of the admin departments. Um, the last of the service departments, finance, HR and IT, there's a combination of things that would happen. The city invests and in, is a partner in Leadership Santa Cruz. We often send people to Leadership Santa Cruz. I, I went a couple years ago and I was blown away by what it was. I didn't understand what it was and I was just amazed by it and the connections, the information, the, the content you get of who this community is and the history behind it is amazing. So that's not a great one that we want to think about limiting, but again, we're, we're at that point where we're pulling the branches off the trees. Um, we have other things that are done in human resources, compensation class studies, and some specialized work that they do for particular recruitments, or they invest more in helping other recruitments. We're having a hard time recruiting certain positions, so it would be reducing some of our resources to our net would shrink as far as the amount of candidates that we would be pulling in. For finance, we have a couple things. We we have a courier service that goes on site to pick up and streamline deposits and checks and some other transactions that happen where they show up on site instead of people walking around the city with cash or resources. So we would look to reducing the amount of scope of those pickup sites. It's not something we would like to do and we're looking for other alternatives, but that is you know, it's a trade-off to, we've got core stuff that we must maintain. One area that was an absolute, and we've already started making progress, is expanding credit card convenience fees. There was a point in time when I was a little bullish in doing this, um, because we wanna see more people using credit cards. We don't wanna disincentivize at it. It streams like operations, but there is a cost to it. So we're at that point in time where we can't absorb those costs. We already implemented 
uh, last year council gave us the authority to do a lot of credit card fees. So this would be taking a step further into almost all of our transactions. So TOT was a place where we hit aggressively, but business license, emissions tax, some of our other tax payments, some other counter payments, we would start having a convenience fee added onto all of those. Um, again, we've traditionally wanted to encourage people making credit card payments because it just makes things flow so much better and takes off internal control risks and other things. Um, but now we're at that point in time where it's just a no-brainer, we need to pass those fees on to, to the consumers. There are some modest staffing reductions we're looking within in finance, HR, and IT, as well as within <coughs> IT, reducing some of their help desk responsiveness time. And we've got some lease costs that when finance temporarily moved offsite, we might be, we should be looking at a, a lower cost and there are some opportunities that could have us in lower cost space, but there's a trade-off to that being further away from, from our clients and our community. The closer you are to City Hall, prices are higher. The further out you get, they're less. So there's some trade off there. We've got to try to value judge that. So that's kind of your primary operating departments, getting to community support, council, city manager, city clerk. Um, within the community support, uh, there would be a recommendation to reduce some of our community group funding. Typically, when the general fund is facing a reduction, we, we look at an equivalent level of community group funding reduction. So if we're looking somewhere of a three, four, or 5%, whatever that number ends up being, then we would look to an equitable level of community group funding as a recommendation. Again, recognizing that there'll be more discussion that would come out of that. Uh, CPVAW is a committee, we would do some of that budget support. We have funding that we set aside in the city manager's budget every year for some homelessness. We would reduce some of our flexibility in that space by reducing some funding for our coordinating committees. We also have programs, hope support and open streets that would reduce some of the funding there. Concluding with things that would impact council, probably the reducing travel and training, that would be the one that you would first see. Most of, most of the staff would be look at that anyways, but that would be a space that could impact you directly. There's also some special projects and services that council members have placeholders for. Uh, typically some special projects, they're not often used, so it would be eliminating that a budget authority. So that's, that's the nature of what the impact would be on council. Um, the city manager's office does a lot of communications, outreach and support, a lot of time and some resources are spent in that. We would redu reduce the scope of, of those resources, reduce some of the publications, maybe reduce the frequency of some of our external meetings because they all come at a cost of renting space and, and supplies it to support that. And lastly, which is on the top list is we work with, and we were talking yesterday about how do we get information from the state to us and us information to our, to our state about what we want them to do and what we know that they're doing. We have a state legislative strategist uh, strategist that helps us stay in line with what's happening. They're, they're, they're cluing us in on things and they're also help, help us advocate for. So we would look at reducing that contract or changing the scope of that. Uh, again, these aren't all, the, last year's stuff was a little bit easier. The prior year's stuff felt like, okay, we didn't wanna do it, but that was easy. But now we're really in that place where I don't think there's anything on this list we want to do, but things that we can do that wouldn't be incredibly transparent to the public, recognizing that some of these would. So that's that's the, your first preview of the types of impacts we would have. I think what we would do next is then develop more comprehensive, if you haven't seen the finance director's overview, including that schedule within the budget document, we'll detail these out a little bit more. It'll have a little bit more narrative about the impacts. Um, you're not getting the full scope here. Some of the stuff sounds big, but it might be small. Some of the small stuff might be bigger than you think. So you wanna, you wanna be able to provide some narrative, some more narrative behind that to get us ready for May 28th. So I, I can pause here. Um, this effectively ends our staff presentation. Well, not on a very high note, I'd oh, say. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but anyhow, Again, we're not, we're not talking of an $8 million or $12 million gap. So that, no, that's, I, there's, there's good that's news true. there. And you know, we're not closing operations anywhere, so that's great news. Good point, it's all perspective. Thank you very much. And thank you for the presentation and to your staff and the staff in the audience. Um, we had a nice full day of presentations yesterday and really great work that was highlighted. So um, I really wanna echo the comments that were sort of kicked us off by our city manager in that regard. Um, in terms of sort of process, we had, a. Uh, 
the schedule sort of laid out for us is to, um, at this time, kind of before we go too deep into some of the um, details, because I have a feeling a lot of us have questions about what that could mean, yep. um, that I would propose that we'll go ahead and maybe see if there's any sort of um, questions in regards to some of the, um, maybe the earlier content, and then open it up to public comment. Then we'll return back, because I think a lot of the deliberation, decision-making, kind of more in-depth questioning will lead to sort of the afternoon discussion. Yep. Um, and is there any, does that, Feel, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I have, I think, a pretty quick procedural question. So um, just for the benefit of the public, all these suggestions are new to us, yes. too. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Act. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, and looking at them, I realize from the department's points of view, these are all things, oh my gosh, we don't want to do these, but if pushed, here's what we'd suggest. Yep. And um, to my mind, a quick review, almost all of them look like we got to discuss them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these are suggestions coming from people who know their departments yep. work the best. Um, I would really like a lot more detail about what we're currently spending on these. And most of these I look at, I, I will entertain, reduce, but not eliminate, sure. et cetera. Uh, I mean, uh, entertain, yes, eliminate, but not reduce. I said mm -hmm. it wrong. Um, can we schedule some significant chunks of time with you in the yeah. next week. Absolutely. <laughs> is, that, is that kind of what you're anticipating for this? Yeah, I mean, again, we recognize this is your first glimpse. There's no way you're positioned to say yes, do, do all this or no, don't do any of it. We need more discussion. Um, I think doing some more intimate one-on-one -on -one meetings, letting us produce some more content, some more materials to get that out to you so you can get a bigger sense of what the impacts are. Those are all things we, we want to do between now and May 28th. And another question, I guess, for city manager, would it be appropriate to meet with the department heads, particularly on their take on these things? Yes, absolutely, that, that would be fine. And I think the, the what we wanna get from you today, hopefully, is just a sense of, is this the, you know, these sure. are the overall numbers for each of the departments. Obviously, within those are a variety of things, and you may have questions about those and want more information about those. Um, and like, as Mark has pointed out, there's, you know, we can adjust those somewhat. Um, and then as you're suggesting, uh, that would be totally appropriate to uh, meet with the departments if you'd like to do that, or we can set up special meetings to provide you with additional information on those uh, as well. Okay. But uh, I think just getting a sense of, you know, that this is, you know, kind of the target for those departments, recognizing too also that uh, uh, this is just 2.2 million, we've got the 3 million. So, uh, and then I'm, I'm sure also council members have other suggestions and ideas that they wanna bring forward. So we wanna hear those as well and then get a sense of how you feel about these, get a sense of what else you have in mind, so then we can then develop a plan for the next time. And I'll, and I'll just say that, and that will be the conversation we'll have after our lunch break. Okay, Councilmember Brown. Thank you. I, just another procedural question for members of the public who um, would like to uh, comment to us. We have, I think 11 to two, that's what I've been telling people based on the schedule we saw, 11 to two with a lunch break scheduled for public comment. I just wanna make sure that that's honored if we if we don't take up all of that time and we begin deliberations of people who show up later and thinking that they could comment or will they be able to still weigh in? Public comment? Yeah, because there, so people think it's 11 to two if they are taking a break from work to come over. I mean, I don't know that that'll happen, but just in case, I just wanna, for so members of the public who are tracking this or watching from home or their workplace understand what the, what to expect. Yeah, if there's folks that are in the audience here that wanna comment and we are able to get through public comment before lunch, my um, schedule says up to 1.30. Um, okay. So we'll have 11, between approximately 11 and 12 for public comment and then return okay. after the lunch break um, to uh, entertain more public comment if there's folks that are wanting to speak at that time and then begin our council deliberations around 1.30. Okay. But if you have somebody who comes in between 1.30 and 2 because of the information that was shared. That was just what we talked about in budget at, in our subcommittee. So 
Oh. I was telling people 11 to 2, but I'm sure people will figure it out. Okay. Thanks. So I think we'll, we'll definitely want to get into some, some of, of this, I think, absolutely. And I believe that will be after our lunch break. Yes. So why don't we go ahead at this time, maybe just have about a three-minute break for our council. And if those who are wanting to speak to us um, for public po comment, please line up to my left, and you'll have up to two minutes. And we'll at this time just have a short a short break. Three minutes.
taking a, a quick break with us. I'm going to go ahead and bring our uh, council meeting back into session. So thank you for um, in the in the short period of time for uh, lining up to my left. I, I apologize for not mentioning this earlier, but if there are members of the community who would like to address our council uh, just very briefly within one minute, I want to invite you to speak to us first and um, I'd be happy to have you um, sort of step up, say your statement within the one minute time frame, and, um, and then we'll go ahead and move on to those who'd like to address the council within two minutes. So anybody interested in a one minute uh, comment here? S excuse me, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, just because budgets are so important and I know people have taken time out of their day to come and be here with us to share their perspective, just to offer them a little bit more time, I'd like to make a motion to extend public comment to two minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, there's a motion for two minutes and 30 seconds by Councilmember Glover. I'll, I'll second that and I also just wanna make a, comment on for years and years, uh, the city has had a three minute standard for people who come to the, uh, to the microphone and it's been eroded over the last several years and I would like to see a restoration. So I'd support three minutes, but two minutes and 30 seconds, I support. Councilor Quick comment, I'd support that. Given the number of people, although I see now I see more people coming into the room, but given that we don't have a huge crowd, it seems, and the time that we've allotted, it does seem like it's appropriate to give people a little extra time, prepare for two minutes, and you go, usually go over just a bit. So I'd support the two minutes and 30. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Or, sorry. Aye. Oh, I was just gonna make a comment that um, I, I think that we've been, over the course of the past year, we've had, or sorry, over the course of this year, we've had um, a lot of issues with managing time and many of our meetings have gone, um, resulted in 12 to 13 hours. And I think that, um, you know, given the fact that we've been uh, extending time and having issues around managing the time of the meeting, um, I'm not gonna support this at this time and stay with two minutes, so. Okay. Um, Councilman Glover. Um, while I understand uh, Vice Mayor Cummings' statements and concerns about previous council meetings that have gone for extended periods of time, those council meetings were consumed with not only uh, important issues around homelessness to provide people the opportunity to speak, but also were compiled throughout an entire day of other issues. This meeting is only scheduled until 4 p.m. Uh, to my knowledge, and we have the allotted time already put into the schedule for that level of public comment. So I would implore Vice Mayor Cummings and the rest of the council to make sure that the people can have a, an extra 30 seconds to express their pr perspective on the budget, which is a huge issue for Santa Cruz. Okay, Councilor Matthews. Um, briefly, I'll oppose the motion. Um, I, uh, I think we have seen that people can express themselves quite fully in a couple of minutes. And also, um, many of those who speak in public uh, communic in oral communications also have written to us, have met with us personally. So there are many, many other opportunities um, to meet with us on budget and other items. And uh, so I'm gonna stick to the two minutes. And I'll just remind the community and the council that as you saw in the calendar, this is the first and we'll have many more opportunities in the next several weeks to um, discuss the budget. So um, it looks like it should, will likely be on our agenda. So we have a motion by Councilmember Glover, second by Councilmember uh, Crone. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. 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 That fails with Councilmember Brown, Crone, and Glover voting in support. Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, Myers, and myself uh, voting against. So those who are interested in speaking in one, for one minute, please self-select and you're welcome to come up um, and you'll have up to one minute. As soon as we're uh, done with the one minute folks who are interested, then we'll have uh, up to two minutes for the remainder. <laughs> Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'd like to acknowledge your dedication and hard work as you grapple with the many challenges our community faces. The mayor has expressed her wish to see community health be a foremost consideration in every city endeavor. 
How does bringing more traffic congestion, noise, and pollution into the heart of our downtown contribute to our health and sense of well-being? It does not, whereas a well-designed town commons at that location could. I'm talking about lot four and funding for the garage. Um, how does it look to spend $41 million to house cars when pe housing people is much more urgent? I realize the money comes from different sources. But. So please hear the many voices who have said no to this garage on this site for many years. Help preserve what is special about this place. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> You'll have up to one minute as well. Hi, Council. This is Deb Tracy Prue from Santa Cruz City Schools, and um, I greatly appreciate the challenge that's before you, um, being a, from an entity, um, S Santa Cruz City Schools, as well as all public schools, we don't generate revenue, and so we're at the mercy of the state and taxes. So I highly encourage council when you're making your deliberations to not cut off any possible revenue generating development. Um, also, I will say that I fully support a mixed use space. We need housing, we need parking, and we need a 21st century library. Additionally, the pub we, we have our district office um, here in town. We do own some property, we do have some parking, but we are currently paying uh, Holy Cross for overflow parking. And I'd much rather pay the city of Santa Cruz and the Catholic Church to help our staff and faculty come to meetings and training. So just wanted to let you know that, and good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Were you interested Good morning. in Morning. Fred Geiger, Santa Cruz. Uh, you're probably familiar with the Santa Cruz Climate Action Plan as passed by the City Council and the City's Efficient Vehicle Policy as a result of this Climate Action Plan. So you're also probably aware of the budget emergency you declared a year ago, or roughly, and the $3 million deficit that's upcoming. So how are we doing? Well, we're not doing too good. Uh, I see a lot of stuff in this budget that is either unaccounted for or is a not progress. How about fuel consumption? How's the city doing on fuel consumption? You don't know. I don't know. Who does know? Somebody knows. They pay the bill. Why don't we know? Why don't you know? Why can't you track it? Are we making progress? Are we going backwards? I can tell you this. We've got a police fleet with dozens of cars getting less than 18 miles per gallon. We don't buy the Ford Fusion police approved hybrids that get 39 LA, Detroit, many jurisdictions are using those. Why not? They're heavy duty, they're tested by these departments, they're used and they're successful. I see in our budget we have a... Well, your time is up, but you're welcome to leave the uh, comments if you like. You guys spent more time okay. talking about our time. So yeah. we, uh, just, just to make sure there's sure. clarification, is there is anybody who's interested in one minute? Okay, we have one minute and then you, we'll go to the two. There, there you go. Thank you. We'll give you an extra minute, how's that? Okay, <laughs> go right ahead. Hello council, my name is Yannicka Strauss, I'm the director of Bike Santa Cruz County, and we put on the Open Streets event each year. And um, I'd like to urge you today to not reduce any funding for the Open Streets event. We've been receiving $15,000 from the city of Santa Cruz for the last two years, um, and before that it was actually 22. So two years ago you reduced it to 15. Um, we were able to find alternate funding sources, but at this time um, that 15,000 is critical for the future of the event. Um, we do already uh, maintain a pretty lean budget, um, and so reducing that even more would be would be a big significant drop for us. Um, this event serves more than 10,000 people. 51% um, of event attendees have said it, their favorite thing about Open Streets is having a safe place to bike and walk. 32% have said that it has Led. Thank you, Shoot. and Sorry. you're welcome to leave your comments if you like, and we've received your emails. Okay, you'll have your re additional one minute. Thank you. Sorry about that misunderstanding. I, I wanted to mention the $68,000 Tahoe that's in your budget replacing a uh, compact Toyota Tacoma, and also the um, fact that what you're looking at for vehicles is not a need list, it's a wish list. It's like, what would these people like to have? the city pay for them to drive around. Well, unfortunately, some of these people don't appear to be very enlightened. You can replace that Tahoe with a minivan or an SUV, holds eight people for half the price, gets about a third better gas mileage. So I'm urging you to take a look at these vehicles in here. Uh, I don't know what's going on as far as any kind of monitoring or compliance with the Climate Action Plan, but please do better. We need action and accountability on this. Thank you.
Hello, my name is John Hall. I'm a member of the Downtown Commons Advocates, and I'm here to express my concern that the council avoid having the tail wag the dog, that is, making non-budgetary decisions by default in a budget document that might commit you to a course of action you need to consider more fully. As your staff has noted, the city of Santa Cruz is experiencing a budget crisis. Others, including consultants addressing this council, have pointed out that the construction of a 600 car garage is not necess necessitated by demand. Over the period covered by the budget, the city is committing to spend $32,369,000 for a garage, 32 million. My sincere hope is that the city council ultimately will decide this is not a good use of city funds. The money can be spent better by renovating and or building a world-class downtown library on its existing site or elsewhere than parking lot four and creating a permanent farmer's market facility in downtown commons on parking lot four. Parking lot four is a location superior to any other for the farmer's market due to sunlight, traffic, size, and safety considerations. I therefore request, and there you have it specifically, that you keep your options open by first on CIP page 154 for the farmer's market structure, eliminating specifying any location, and Cathcart Soquel doesn't exist as a location anyway. Second, on CIP 150 for the downtown mixed use project, eliminating 2020 <coughs> allocation funds from the Affordable Housing Trust mm -hmm. Fund and Measure S. Taking these simple budget actions will ensure you the latitude to fully plan how to best create a great downtown library and a great farmer's market in downtown commons. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, I'm Dana Bagshaw. I live in downtown Santa Cruz. Um, it's obvious that we need to make cuts to our budget. Um, so I was looking over the budget. It is really uh, awesome but I was, tried to focus more on public works and transportation. And the items that came to fort that I noticed the most were things like in, improvements in the um, intersections to improve flow of traffic. Now, what we need really is to reduce traffic, not improve traffic flow. If those intersections is for bikes and um, for pedestrians, Fair enough, but if you use that as a cover for adding another lane for cars, not a good investment. Um, I also noticed roundabouts um, to improve the flow of traffic. I happen to volunteer at the Exploration Center by the wharf, and I see terrible traffic jams at the roundabout. To me, that's a waste of money. Another, th oh, and speaking of wastes of money, expanding the width of the bridge over the Highway 1. That is another place where we just, that's a big expense, and all it's going to do is encourage more cars. So um, I would cut that from the budget. Um, I noticed that also that in Public Works, there's a, a lot of line items for storm damage repair that is only going to increase with time. So it just tells us that our real imperative is to find ways to cut carbon from the budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Pauline Seals. Donna Myers, Council Member Myers referred to the climate crisis. Well, what we've seen so far is less than the tip of the iceberg of what's coming. And what we are doing is woefully inadequate. Modestly, we need to be reducing greenhouse gases by at least 5% per year. This would put us somewhat close to getting to 50% reduction by 2030. Uh, probably we need more better than that, but that would, as a round number, that's not bad. Um, looking over the items in this budget that were listed as climate change related, I seriously doubt they amount to 1% of our greenhouse gases. 
S some of them are great. Safe routes to school, excellent. Um, improved lighting for the ballparks, sure. But that's not the big problem. The cars are the big problem. And we have to get away from that. Dana already mentioned the fact that some of these traffic things are speeding the traffic up when we need to slow it down and improve bike safety so that people get out of their cars, walk or bike. They're not going to do that when the cars are whizzing past and the car is right next to the bicyclist. Um, and the buying of the gas guzzling vehicles, as um, Fred pointed out, is really a very bad idea. Existing vehicles that need replacing can be repaired until EV alternatives are available. There are already some EV pickup trucks available right now, and many more will be coming. And this would save money and get us on a climate future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor Watkins, members of the council, my name is Benjamin Eichert. I'm the director of the Romero Institute's Green Power Initiative. We're a local nonprofit dedicated to fighting climate change globally, but especially here in California and even more especially here in Santa Cruz uh, in the city and county. Um, I want to speak specifically to the items already referenced about the purchase of new gasoline-powered internal combustion vehicles for the city. You know, in 2018, unfortunately, global greenhouse gas emissions continued to rise at their largest rate since, I believe, 2013. We're at a point now where we actually need emissions to be declining, and instead they're going up, and this is very concerning. Um, so I want to speak, you know, Santa Cruz, I believe, should not only be doing its part, but should really be a leader, uh, an example to the rest of the state, an example to the rest of the country. And so I think that one of the ways that we can do that, and there are many, but one of the ways we can do that is to implement an immediate moratorium on the purchase of new gasoline-powered internal combustion vehicles, and number two, aggressively investigate zero emission alternatives like electric vehicles, and I would encourage you really also to explore those possibilities with Monterey Bay Community Power, which I know is preparing to offer incentives um, for the purchase of electric vehicles and may also be able to come up with some really creative ways that the city can help eliminate entirely emissions from uh, the vehicles that it operates. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Dr. John Conway, and I'm an environmental scientist and a resident of the city of Santa Cruz. I'm here today to ask you to set a better example of sustainability for the people who you serve and for all future generations of Santa Cruzians. The science is unequivocal. We are causing a climate catastrophe. We are burning fossil fuels that are causing this and will result in rising tides, extreme fires, devastating storms, saltwater intrusion to our already depleted aquifers, disappearing crops, and disappearing forests. All this and more lies in our future if we do not take this dead serious right now. So to know all this, to be in a position of responsibility for this city and its people, and to intentionally choose to lock in years more carbon emissions, from an unsustainable vehicle fleet, for example, is simply unconscionable. Are we in a climate emergency or not? It's far past time to stop, start acting like we are, because we are in one of our own making, largely from driving around cars like that have been included in this budget, using taxpayer dollars. <laughs> we are living in an era of climate change. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Every single decision we make now must now be made with that in mind. I appreciate the challenges of working with budget constraints, but please, I implore you as a scientist and as a lifelong Santa Cruz resident to rework this budget to include electric vehicles instead of internal combustion engines, and more broadly to pass policies supporting electrification, carbon-free power, divestment from fossil fuels, and environmental justice. Because climate change is happening right now, and if we don't take rapid, drastic steps immediately, we are placing the entire future of this city in jeopardy. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so 
I'm up here because I think the council needs to take into uh, account a, a public health crisis that is currently um, wrapping through Santa Cruz and uh, the rest of the United States. And that public health crisis is the fact that uh, on half of the nights, I know I personally and plenty of other people have a hard time actually going to sleep because looking forward into the future, we realize that 10, 15, 20 years down the line, we're looking at something that we have really no idea what to expect. But I think that there are a few things for sure that we get to look at. And one is a recession caused by climate change that has no um, that has no ending because typically when recession is solved, it's because people trust that the economy is gonna go back into order. But with climate change, all we look at is inevitable decline. And so when you have a never ending recession, you also start to get to have riots. And you have rising food prices as well because farms stop working at the same level. So I want to just suggest that it's not just disappearing shores, but also kind of a disappearing civilization that we might be looking at. And I unfortunately have the um, benefit of living through all of this myself personally. So last night I had about maybe two hours of sleep and I continue to have about two hours of sleep every night doing so. It's hard for me even to focus on doing any kind of work that gives me a future in 40 years because looking at a retirement based on a pension is almost like counting on a tricycle to take you halfway across the world. I mean, it's just not enough. So I would ask you to look forward to helping the people in the city and kind of all around the world in making a budget that reflects the carbon realities of what you can actually do here in Santa Cruz and is also in the United States. I mean, if you presented this budget to people here without actually saying, we don't know how much we're spending, we don't know how much we're taking in, but we're gonna do these things and just sort of hope for the best, I think people here would kind of laugh you out of the room and ask you to either do what you have to do to figure out what you can actually spend or find someone who can. Thank you. Hello, thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. Um, my name's Megan, I'm 43, live in Seabright neighborhood. And my daughter really wanted to be here. She said, can you put on the back of your sign, mom, that I wanted to be there too? because she knows a lot about what's going on with our climate, probably more than a lot of people know. And I guess I just started learning about two years ago and I would just wanna implore if you can take the time out of your life to really look and see what's happening. Like I think things would be changed here because people would really face the facts and um, know that we need to be reducing our carbon emissions by drastic amounts that no one is really willing to do unless they really face what's going on and know that my daughter, she's already like, I'm probably not gonna have kids, right, mom? Because why would I? Like, she's thinking that way because I'm telling her the truth. And most people don't wanna hear the truth. And I feel sad, I can't put her in this position to tell my daughter the truth about what's happening. And I'm not just scaring her doom and gloom, but this is the reality. So I just implore that people take time to, to research and know what's going on and create allies and create people that they can cry with. And then through those tears really face like what, What's mine to do? And how can we change strategically and huge structural changes that need to happen dramatically in order to create a future that we can all live in and cope in? So I just really wanna look you all in the eyes and say thank you for listening to my heart. I feel like I'm speaking for the future generations and um, just appreciate you all being here and all that you do and all the time you put into it and all of the many issues that you're thinking about. I know this isn't the only one just for me. It's like, well, if this one, we don't look at this one, then there's no, we have to solve this one also. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. My name's Shelley Kniep, and I'm here today because I really am wondering what kind of world your children's children are gonna be facing. She just said she doesn't know if her daughter's gonna have children. My daughter's not. She doesn't want her child to suffer through what's coming up here. On the budget matter, you said that we have lot, or it looks like we have lots of revenue from the boardwalk. The boardwalk isn't gonna be here. Because of climate change and how uh, water is gonna rise, it's not gonna be here. So that's gonna be gone. We're gonna have higher costs of fires as evidenced by what's been happening in the state of California. We're very vulnerable, especially in Santa Cruz, all around us. I noticed that there's $9.9 .9 million being 
appropriated for scenic trails, but 0.4% on solar. And you said that we have a loss of gas taxes. I suggest that you raise them. People in Europe pay a lot more money based on taxing oil and gas than we do. It's time to raise it. That would get people into electric cars and would give you more money. I see that you're cutting energy exploration. My husband was a co-author um, for the Kyoto Protocols on how much energy conservation would do to reduce global warming. And it ended up that it was 8%. You don't have to spend a lot of money in energy exploration. Just find ways that you can conserve and reduce your energy, or your energy usage. He's been in this business over 42 years. It works and it pays itself back. I would like to ask two actions of you. Number one, please read the book Falter by Bill McGibbons. It will wake you up. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Brett Garrett, and I'm hearing wonderful comments this morning. Pretty much everything that the previous speakers, I think all of them, uh, pretty much agree with me. Um, and I, I, ho I hope you'll take these comments to heart. Um, m many of my comments are written, I think you've received piece, copies of this piece of paper. I have very serious con concerns regarding the downtown mixed use project, also known <coughs> as the library garage project for lot four. It's budgeted for $32 million on page uh, CIP 150. It's a very controversial project, so it needs a big disclaimer in there saying the garage depends on being reapproved by city council, or better yet, remove it from the budget. Um, many reasons we don't need a new parking structure of this size, transportation demand management, parking management as described by Patrick Siegman recently, uh, current trends, um, automated vehicles, and climate change says we need to be doing something other than creating infrastructure for cars. Um, and speaking of transportation management, I didn't see any line items in the budget for transportation met demand management. I know it's in there, but maybe it should be itemized. Um, the farmer's market structure item is rather confusing with possible errors. Um, it's, it shows a million dollars estimated actuals for the current fiscal year, but I don't think it's happening yet. And the location is confusing Cathcart Soquel. Um, I agree with other speakers who talked about too many gas guzzling vehicles. Um, and in addition to my written comments, I just wanna offer some low hanging fruit for increasing revenue. Our parking permits downtown are too cheap. I believe they could be increased much more than what is planned for increases, except in cases of special needs, of course. I don't understand the philosophy of offering a deep discount for more parking. We need a broader discussion of how parking funds can be used. Thank you. Good morning, council members. My name is Vivian Rogers. I'm the director of the Friends of the Library. And I'm here this morning uh, because my board members and quite a lot of my volunteers throughout the county asked me to come here. The, uh, given me some notes, so hopefully I'll get through them all. They first say thank you for dedicating your time to creating a better future for San the city of Santa Cruz. They understand that you right now, you all are facing some very hard decisions and they find that your work is very commendable. But for that same reason, they ask you please do not act hastily in cutting any funding to the lot four parking lot or uh, where the farmer's market is and where we hope our mixed use building will be. We, they ask you please retain the funding in your 2019-20 budget to keep options open for potential projects on this lot. This community needs a thoughtful and feasible decision on the future of the downtown library. And if you cut the budget today to lot four, you will end that ability to, to look at it creatively and uh, could likely result in a downtown library that's half the size of the current one and definitely would result in cut of services throughout the community. So we, the friends ask you, do not limit our city's possibility for a great downtown library or for great library resources throughout the county. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello, I'm Susan Cavallari. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, in September of 2018, the City Council passed the Climate Emergency Resolution. Also in 2018, the IPCC issued a report stating humans have about a decade to dramatically reduce emissions to limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Several days ago, another UN panel reported mass extinction of species linked to climate change, which also threatens humans. The fiscal year 2020 budget does not acknowledge a climate emergency. We must have dramatic changes in transportation, energy, and land use um, in order to uh, change the, ca the, the trajectory of the catastrophic future we face. Please heed the warning of scientists, listen to constituents, and make changes in this budget to dra dramatically reduce emissions in Santa Cruz. <laughs> Budgets today and in the future are climate documents. The co-chair of the panel, uh, which uh, released the report on extinction, reports people, and I quote, People shouldn't panic, but they should begin drastic change. Business as usual with small adjustments won't be enough. Thank you. Hello, Gail McNulty. I live in Bonnie Dune and have three children. Evie's 13, Jack's 11, Henry's seven. Evie attends school in town and Jack will join her next year. We love Santa Cruz and we spend a ton of time and money here. While I've been shuttling my kids to soccer and junior guards, worrying about what they eat, reminding them to brush their teeth, their future has become less and less certain. Most of us feel growing despair, but while we're rushing from one thing to the next, avoiding difficult conversations, and numbing our souls with chai and yoga, our climate is getting scarier. By the time Evie, Jack, and Henry are adults, it will be too late to avoid climate-induced economic and humanitarian crises, increasingly catastrophic fires and storms leaving more of us homeless, making it difficult to insure our homes, longer droughts, crop failures, food shortages, unless we make dramatic changes now. Passing a climate emergency resolution was a nice gesture, but our house is on fire and our children are trapped in the decisions we make today. We need courageous action, not gestures. The United Nations estimates there are more than 65 million refugees now, many displaced by climate-related disasters. Our friends in Camp Ross are not just today's problem, they're the front lines of a growing divide between the wealthy few and the suffering masses. Living here, it's easy to forget that low-income residents and communities of color in California and around the world already live with dirty water and smog-filled air. In March, I attended an interfaith call to moral action on the climate crisis at Martin Luther King's Church in Atlanta with Al Gore, Reverend Barber of the Poor People's Campaign, and many other leaders. Climate cap catastrophe may be the greatest moral issue humanity will ever face. Our glaciers are melting. We must thaw our hearts and forgive one another to band together. The sea is rising, and we must rise above bureaucracy, pull the emergency brake on this business-as-usual budget, and dare greatly. We don't need a new convention center or library, and we certainly don't need a new parking lot, we need to save beach flats and Thank protect you, our children's future. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Um, no, it's okay, brother. Thank you. I'm holding this one because I cannot be wearing all my hats today. So this is a support of what is at the core of myself, okay, climate change. But I'm here today to wear the um, hat from the Tenant Sanctuary, and I'm here to ask um, for the City Council to release the $15,000 that you promised that we will have uh, in order to start the services, uh, providing um, help to the uh, community and to the tenants in this town. I wanna let you know that even though you have no uh, made good in your promise, 
we are already starting uh, providing three times per uh, week uh, a clinic. Uh, we have uh, trained 25 volunteers and uh, the staff is working with uh, the hope that we will have uh, the money that you promised us sometime. Uh, the lawyer is uh, right now refusing to start working with us because we have no money at all. So um, just uh, as a reminder and uh, asking politely if you can please uh, release the money that you promise, it will be very appreciated in the community. And just to, um, in the other hat, I wanna say that uh, we don't need a new parking lot and we don't need uh, a new library because <laughs> all of them are gone in 10 years. And you can also look at that for the US Ge Geological Department and the maps that they have in there. With all that is already underwater in 10 years. So thank you for your time and uh, uh, for listening. Thank you for doing your job, too. Good morning, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Robert Singleton with the Business Council. Just want to encourage you to not do anything hasty with regards to the funding, the parking funding from Lot 4. Um, if you look at downtown parking right now and the status that it is, you know, we have a 1,200 person waiting list for downtown employees to get on there. We expect to have a new clinic opening with Kaiser soon that expects to see around 40 people an hour um, as a brand new facility. Um, we expect to have around 600 new housing units downtown in the next five years. Um, and we expect to be losing about 200 spaces from surface lots. Um, so. We need the money in the parking district to help balance that demand, but really what I wanna talk today about is kind of how this project is kind of a, a linchpin project for the future of housing in downtown Santa Cruz, and especially affordable housing in downtown Santa Cruz. Now, if you talk to anyone who develops housing, affordable or market rate, you can talk about the biggest bottleneck and the hardest thing to manage is the parking requirements that are assessed on housing development. Um, right now, the city requires that you have a space per bedroom in all new units, and that is really hard to meet, especially if you're on shoestring budgets and balancing a capital stack from a bunch of different sources. Um, so in order to make that work, uh, essentially by consolidating consolidating parking, we're gonna plan for a net reduction in parking over the next five years in downtown. Um, and overall, and never gonna reach the levels that we're at right now with current parking, but we're also gonna have a tremendous impact with new housing units coming online. And by not investing in consolidation of parking, you're requiring those housing production or those housing projects to shoulder the burden of additional parking. For every parking space that you require of them is essentially a new unit of affordable housing to be campering online. I would love for you to unilaterally reduce the parking requirements for housing, but in spite of that, we still need to provide for it when we're building out these tens of millions of dollars of capital stacks. And you have to build for the worst case scenario, which is the current demands that housing uh, has for parking. So in that context, you essentially by not uh, or by uh, reallocating that money, you'd be taking money away from the affordable housing that's relying on that new parking funds. Thank you. Oh. Hi, my name is Josie Buchanan. I would first like to thank staff and the city council for all the work that has gone into this budget. I know that there's some really complicated things to grapple with, what to keep, what to cut. Um, quickly, I would like to say that I really don't think that any funds should be reduced for open streets. I think it's an amazing program that really reflects a lot of the climate conscious and alternative transportation character and rhetoric of this community. As well as that, I would really, really urge you to not cut any funding for the Lot 4 project on top of everything regarding housing that Robert went into. If we do not have parking, then we cannot really have a budget because we don't have people coming downtown. Our employees are parking here because they're being forced to commute every single day from South County. If we get them somewhere to park, if we get them somewhere to live, that's what is going to affect our climate crisis. Saying you can't park here, telling them to bike here, telling them they should pay more for parking. That's not fair. It's not fair to ask someone to pay an hour of their daily wage for a parking spot. Get them a place to live. And I think lot four is essential in that, and I think it really deserves a lot more consideration. Thank you. Good morning. I guess it's still morning, Mayor and Council people. 
Um, I just wanted to remind, I know, first of all, I just want to take a minute to appreciate the difficult position you're in, whoa. Um, and I, wa I did serve on a shared decision-making process when I was a teacher for the budget, and it's never easy. So I appreciate all your time and expertise. Just wanted to remind the community about the fiscal emergency that was called for. And, um, and encourage us to uh, support the state's efforts to, for pension reform. I think a lot of our problems stem from the pension crisis. Um, with that being said, I have a few ideas about my, my important pet projects that I'm, I'm looking at, if I were to look at the budget, I would, I, one thing I was thinking is that consultants can be um, just hired from, let's say, planning, uh, if they come in under 100,000, I would say, why don't we make that 50, so 50,000, so that um, you can uh, take a look at that and see if it's reasonable. A little more oversight might actually help the budget. Um, also, uh, I am in support of the bike and pedestrian improvements with Highway 1 and 9. Um, and uh, also, the chair of the Parks and Rec Commission, if you've not already received it, will be writing a letter recommending um, uh, instead of 25,000, moving it up to 50,000 for heritage tree um, consideration. Um, and thank you, and you're welcome to leave your comments. Thank you very well. much, be well. Thank you. Okay. Next speaker. Good morning, my name is Joe Ferrara. I've owned my business downtown for 43 years. <clears throat> we went through the earthquake, you should have seen this place after that. You you didn't have any problem parking. We live in this town, of course we want to support climate change. People in support of the Lot 4 mixed use project are not against the ideas that are being put forth. That's why we live in Santa Cruz. I spent two terms as the president of the Downtown Association. I served a term on the Downtown Commission. We spent a year that I, ch I chaired a task force to try to find viable ways to pay for the next parking structure. It involved representatives from the public, from the um, farmer's market, from city staff, and we all were, we were all able to come together and discuss this. I don't see that happening right now. I don't wanna give you all the same quotes that you've heard already. You know what the information is. Some of it is misguided, some of it is accurate. You need time to figure that out, but it's gonna take courage, as one previous speaker said, to deal with all the forward thinking you're gonna to need to do. Right now, there's not enough parking to take care of the employees downtown. There's over an 800 person wait for the Locust Garage, and we just got a call, another business wants 50 more, and they were told you're gonna to have to wait at least two years. If those businesses can't stay here and be profitable, we lose them. We lose them, we lose tax base. Tax base is flat right now. You lose tax base, none of this gets paid for, none of it. So you have to be careful in your examination of what to do. I fully support the idea that we need this parking structure because what about customers? Nobody has mentioned the fact, we've talked about people who work downtown, people who try to shop in my store. One guy has his wife circle around while he's buying stuff, which is not helping climate change. Thanks. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Beverly Deshaux. I'm the President of the Electric Auto Association of the Central Coast. Our organization has been in existence for just about 50 years, promoting the use of electric vehicles, and it's finally catching on. Um, in light of the climate emergency, not only that exists, but also that the City Council acknowledged and passed a resolution about, um, there is absolutely no need ever to purchase another gas-fired vehicle. All, all that is, um, any kind of vehicle that's needed for the city can be bought 
as an electric vehicle. And when you pay off your solar panels, you'll be plugging them in for free. They'll be free to the city, no cost and no emissions. And those people who have electric vehicles say they hardly notice on their electric bill that all of their uh, transportation use is almost costing them nothing. I have one, maybe $5 a month. So there's a budgetary concern and there's definitely the climate. So I would urge you, I'd be happy to consult with you. I keep up on what's available. I don't always read the whole article, but I know what's available and can find it out for you. So I encourage you to consult with me, consult with us as the electric vehicle community. Um, I think that's all I'm gonna say. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Nancy Crusoe, and I have seven to get through, so I'm gonna try to be coherent and quick. So the first thing is about um, homelessness and what we've been dealing with recently and what we've been doing. I looked through the budget, I spent all night reading the budget, and I can't really find a long range program that makes any sense to me that actually will solve any of the large problems. It feels like we are in a reaction state and we are spending a lot of money for very short term solutions that help a few people. And I would like to see some really bold, innovative policy changes and uh, some wise thinking and look at the programs being offered and the models being offered and look at the thousand people living outside being hated more every day because they don't appear to be getting any better or getting or improving. And I read next door, so I know the hate is rising for them. Um, I do. I do appreciate that this is a huge problem, but I think it's it's only really bold steps that will make a difference now. Um, the second one is for funding Janus, our only treatment center for uh, addiction, and they turn people away every day. Um, they turn away homeless people who then are scorned on next door because they don't get help for their problems. And I'm so tired of reading it, but there's no talking to people who believe it because they believe it. So we really do need to do something about that. We're seen as providing for these people and we're not really providing. There's a lot more to be said about Janice, but they need some support. Oh, you have to be kidding. You're welcome to leave your points if you, if you mm. want with that sim, if you have mm. to look through. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Okay, next speaker. <clears throat> Good morning, council members. I'm Rick Longinati with the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. And I wanna to suggest to you that um, all over the country and the world, people are discovering that if we're trying to get serious about reducing our carbon footprint, we need to reduce our auto dependency. That starts with not building projects that increase auto capacity. So we're not widening roads anymore. We're not expanding intersections. We don't wanna build a huge new parking structure. So the good news is that we don't need a new parking structure downtown. We need to resolve some spot shortages. According to the two experts, these are nationally recognized experts on parking that you met with on March 19th. So just to remind you of their conclusion is that we have an excess capacity, even at the peak Christmas week parking census, we have an excess capacity of nearly 30% on that peak hour. And on the weekends, that's even more. It's, it's 40, upwards of 40%. Empty spaces in garages. Weekends are our, we're a tourist town. That's our, that's our time when we wanna attract visitors and we have an excess capacity. The other conclusion that they reached was that parking demand is not gonna rise over the next 10 years. Now, city staff might disagree with those conclusions. That's fine. But if they do, they need to bring forward some kind of contradictory evidence or some kind of, uh, uh, you know, reasons why they think that these nationally renowned experts were mistaken in their conclusion. And it's not just, you know, anecdotal. I couldn't find a place driving around today. I couldn't find a parking place. Or the Locust Street garage was closed. Because as we know, when the Locust Street garage is closed, there are spaces open elsewhere. So, you know, if, if we're not gonna spend 
87 million over 30 years, and that's just the garage portion of this project. That's a 2.9 million per year expenditure. Then we have a lot of money left over. 10 million for the library. Thank you. Good morning, council members and mayor. My name is Jim Mulheron. I'm a research associate at UCSC Sociology. And I wonder if you, if there's anybody here in the council or the staff who has not heard of Greta Thunberg. Anybody not hear of her? We need to pause the time real quick. This is a chance for us to listen to you, so we don't okay. generally engage with a, a dialogue here. Sorry about that. Well, let me just say a few words. She's a school student. She's now 16. She's been doing school strike for months and months, and she's galvanized hundreds of thousands of students, mostly in Europe, to strike one day a week on the climate. And what she has mastered is political will. And what I'm hoping from you, following Greta, go look at her in the YouTube videos, there are many of them now, meeting the, with the Pope, talking to the EU. She knows what the situation is. She has done her homework as high as I have. And what I want to particularly recommend for you is to learn from her political will, given the situation that we are in. And in particular, pursue electric trucks, small change. If you can't do it this year, save the money. Do more repairs on what you've got. And move the city, if necessary, first with a hybrid. You can get a Ford F-150 hybrid now. And if possible, wait. There are at least three or four manufacturers in the wings to bring out uh, pickup trucks Thank you. this coming year. Thank you. I'm Ryan Baumgartner. I'm really getting tired of all this. We're, I'm crying all the time. I'm really hurting. Ever since Trump came into office and was about energy dominance of oil, this is killing our planet. We got to change right now. There's all these people all the time. We're talking about finding places to park. It's ridiculous. Ride the bike, walk more, get out of your cars. We don't need these cars all the time. And if we do, how about going to some auctions and buying some cars that have been repossessed, taken, and buy them cheap. Have city people do that instead of going out and buying brand new vehicles. Certainly all the buses need to be converted. I went to a, a, an event at Seymour Marine Lab on, on the polar crisis. We're dealing with polar bears. Nobody was there that took the bus. I was the only one that took the bus. The bus went right there. People, that, and all these people are still driving here. They can get on buses all the time. It's ridiculous. And taking away bus stops so people have a hard time sitting. Okay, now that we've destroyed these people's lives at Roth Camp, how about creating a long-term solution instead of these little short-term solutions, these temporary shelters with all these rules? Too many rules. Are we going to do that to people in houses? Go to their house and tell you can't do this and you can't do that and can't do this? This is ridiculous. These people are scratching for their life. We push them over the edge of the cliff. We need to make a nice, good transitional camp and show the ways to move forward in this and spend money a lot more efficiently on ways and help them and help the community. All together, we could work on these little houses, modular houses, your village, teepees, growing food. The, the, have the, 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 the management of these grounds is ridiculous. I'm over at San Lorenzo Park. This guy comes out with a gasoline blower, loud, noisy, blowing a bunch of leaves and dust around, hardly doing it, going into the bathroom and doing this. We could be doing a lot more efficient things with our workers than doing that. We'd be going through restoring okay. natural systems. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> uh, I'm Casey Beyer, uh, CEO of the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce. 
uh, I rode my bike from South County this morning to get here. I got to my office uh, and then in the elevator to our building uh, to go to the fourth floor was not working. So I helped a disabled person get up to the second floor so she can go to her counseling. So I'm sorry I'm late. Um, you wondering why the uh, empl employees and employers are not here. They're working. We have over 600 member companies that I represent and over 23,000 employees countywide. They're working to create the tax base that you're talking about for your budget today. And there's conversations and emails from, that you're receiving from a select group of people that are saying, we don't need any more parking downtown. We don't need, even or, uh, e need a long-term plan for use of other city property. They're misleading you. I'll say that again, they are misleading you. Read, read the report from your own city staff. Read the work that the last city council and the last work has been done for the last eight years in this community. What are the lack of issues that are facing most of the employees in this area? Lack of affordable housing in the downtown. <coughs> Inability to get from South County to workplaces in the downtown. And what you're doing by some of the questions in this proposal is you're restricting the opportunity to look at city development properties that you can be used for mixed use uses and other viable uses in the community. So don't sell to yourself short. Think about the 23,000 employees that are not in this business right here. They're asking representatives like myself and other associations to speak on their behalf. Don't misstate them. Thank you. I believe that you'll be our last speaker or we have one, one more speaker. Is there any other member of the community who would like to address the council before we close for now? Okay. Um, I'm, my name is Rena Dubin, and I'm very concerned about uh, the libraries and particularly the downtown branch being adequately funded and for us as a community to have an adequate downtown library. Right now, the library is not serving the needs of our community. It's um, a mess. We c I can be happy to talk with you in detail about all the problems that are going on in that facility. It needs uh, money and care. And also, we, as a um, member of the Downtown Library Advisory Committee, we studied the issues in the downtown branch specifically to try to understand what it is that we can do. And we did conclude unanimously that the only solution that would meet the needs of our community is to move to a mixed use facility. Um, you've been listening to the budget and I'm kind of surprised at um, some of the bleakness of it, but the, luckily the voters have overwhelmingly supported libraries. We had passed the Measure S fund overwhelmingly, so the voters really support libraries and we wanna make sure that the city council also is supporting the library in the way that it needs to be supported. Just one last note, I consider myself a progressive and I consider this city council progressive and libraries are the most progressive aspects of our society today. They um, are the only place that people can come no matter what they believe, no matter what their income is, no matter what is going on in their lives and be able to have services for them. They don't need to buy a cup of coffee. They aren't going to be harassed if they're behaving in a decent manner. So really, we need to preserve the libraries. We need to preserve the um, ability for everybody to be able to have Wi-Fi, able to have access to early childhood education, early childhood classes, and there's a lot of things to support about the mixed-use facility. Thank you. Okay. I believe you'll be our last speaker. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Cynthia Berger with Santa Cruz Tenants Association. Uh, there's a short supply of widely accepted, I'm gonna read something, sorry for not looking at you. There's a short supply of widely accepted impartial data about the scale and scope of displacement in Santa Cruz. Specifically, there's no comprehensive database to quantify the number of families forced out of their homes in Santa Cruz through evictions or rent increases. This lack of information has hindered public dialogue and functioned as an impediment in the evaluation of current housing policies. <clears throat> Equipped with a nonpartisan data-driven analysis of the city's rental market, elected officials and the general public will be well situated to make informed decisions about housing policies tailored to the city's unique circumstances. The policy, the city can address this information gap by implementing a simple, easy to administer ordinance 
that gathers data about the most salient pressures in the rental housing market. State law already requires that landlords provide tenants with a written notice in order to terminate a tenancy or raise the rent, and the city could mandate that landlords provide a copy of these notices. Importantly, such a policy would not regulate whether or how a landlord is able to evict a tenant or raise the rent. Landlords will simply have to notify the city when they do so. In some cities, they simply have to sell a, send a cell phone photo. <clears throat> By collecting this data, the city would be able to precisely answer important questions like how many people are being evicted. What are the primary reasons tenants are being evicted? How large is the average rent increase and how often are rents being raised? <clears throat> Are there specific, specific neighborhoods facing greater displacement pressures? By simply collecting data that's already in the hands of the city's landlord community, we could begin to answer these questions. A data collection policy could be easily crafted to ensure maximum compliance with minimal city oversight, could incentivize landlords to voluntarily comply by specifying that any rent increase or eviction notice that's not provided to the city within a specific time frame will be I, null okay. and void. Finishing Thank my sentence. And you're Thank you. And you're welcome to email us as well. Okay, so um, that will conclude the public comment for now. We'll uh, at this time break for an hour and return at one o'clock. I just also want to remind those in the audience as well as those who may be watching at home that you're welcome to email us or reach out to us individually to um, share your perspectives uh, with us. And I want to thank those who were able to make it in person today as well. So we'll go ahead and adjourn until one o'clock and we'll see you uh, then. Thank you. dollars to the
point. So we'll go ahead and resume our uh, special meeting here today on um, our budget. Um, we concluded our uh, 12 o'clock time with uh, the end of public comment. And I'm wondering if anybody in the audience here um, wanted to address the council before we move into deliberation and uh, recommendations. Okay, please step forward, you'll have up to two minutes. Okay, um, dear city council members, I respect the commitment you have to our city, given the many pressing and important issues you are dealing with. I am here as a mother, a former journalist in town, and a new member of Extinction Rebellion Santa Cruz. A few months ago, I was volunteering for Citizens Climate Lobby, calmly going about the somewhat slow and laborious business of trying to influence Congress to pass a carbon tax bill. Thinking that after 2020, we could turn this global warming ship around. I was not aware at that time that a sea change of science and reports from the Arctic were indicating we have now entered a period of non-linear warming due to positive <coughs> methane and other feedback loops released from the Arctic permafrost as ice melts and increased warming coming from the loss of albedo or the reflective capacities of the ice and snow that keep sunlight from further warming the planet. As recently as March, scientists in the Arctic watched in surprise and horror as one of the largest ice sheets in the Arctic began to calve and fall into the sea. Times have changed and the science here is moving rapidly. <clears throat> the IPCC report from November is quickly becoming obsolete. Santa Cruz not only faces sea level rise, but possible mass power outages, as well as increasing threats to water supplies from fire and drought, and even food security, as Midwestern and global grain belts experience increasing weather extremes that threaten food supplies for everyone. Academics and researchers like Guy McPherson and Jem Bendel, along with many, many others, are now positing that perhaps our window of opportunity has actually closed. I know you are both busy and part-time. Even Tiffany is part-time. Santa Cruz, your, we need your time is up, but you're welcome to leave your comments with us or okay. to email them as I'm well. I'm asking Thank for you. a citizen's uh, assembly Thank to you. address your, your the time issue. is up. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay. So are there any other members of the community who would like to address the council at this time? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and return um, to the uh, council process. And I thought, um, and, then, and please, uh, City Manager Martin Bernal or Marcus, uh, feel free to weigh in. I thought what we could do is have our council ask some clarifying questions um, in regards to the presentation, and then we could shift into uh, the document uh, that I believe will be presented before us in terms of potential areas we want to adjust to help us move forward with adopting a budget by June 11th, and some recommendations. Um, does that seem a accurate to how you anticipated this going? Yes, I think if, uh, if there are any uh, additional questions in the presentation, then I think we can go through the reductions department by department um, and uh, answer questions. Okay. Um, and then again, get a read from the council as to, okay, these are, these are fine, or we have a question on this one and we'll re return back. And then we'll keep uh, an ongoing list. Uh, Marcus is prepared to have a, to track all the various changes um, as we go through each of the departments. Great. So are there any questions from council members on the presentation we had earlier? Oh, just however, I mean, in general, however, any questions before we move forward into looking at the reductions? I just don't understand the, the plan. So were we thinking of going back today to those lists of departmental cuts for more detail? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. We, um, I'm not sure we're ready to like open them up and get down to exactly what dollar value or the exact impact is, but we're looking for those headlines of those items that we just moved through that we can pull back up on the screen. Are there some on there that we should absolutely stay away from? Or are there ideas we should add to this list that we're not including? We wanna come back May 28th with a very strategic aligned list. 
And, you, and what you have before us in the presentation was to get to that 2.4 million, yes. and still there was there is still a gap yes. to meet the Absolutely. additional cut. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, if I could just um, proceed with that, let's just take police and fire for starters, because that's the first one on the list. At least I'm looking at the columns, yeah. Yes. There are two items there. Uh, we have noted in the other column, um, 352,000 from fire, 282,000 from police, but it doesn't really tell us much there um, what those cuts are. So, at some point, I'd like to go through them and get more detail. I'm not sure if we yeah. want to take up everybody's time. So, to the extent of the private security police will be here shortly, I'm sure. The areas, we've heard their proposals in the past and they haven't changed. They feel the private patrols on Ocean Street and around the wharf area are just not as efficient as they should be and the, the bang for the dollars aren't there. And that could be close to $300,000 in savings by re-engineering those services, uh, providing substantial savings. So that's the order of magnitude. It's very similar to proposals they presented maybe a year or so ago. I know council and some business owners had some concerns about reductions in those areas. I think, I'm paraphrasing now for the chief and his team, we just haven't seen the effectiveness of those particular patrols other than the public perception that their eyes on scene, somebody's there. I get all that, but just to take this one for example, um, let's say they have uh, 300,000 and cuts, is that reduction or is that elimination? That would be reducing patrols in those areas, but it could also then end up, after they look more, they can come back and say, we might keep a little bit of in the wharf and maybe reduce in Harvey West. I'm, I'm just throwing out there for an example. The, the, what, we're, what we're representing is, we believe we have a firm proposal, but we're moving really fast on a lot of this, so there might be some smarter evolutions of this. We would start with, the wharf and start with lower ocean as a primary reduction area. You mean upper ocean? Or up, I'm sorry, yeah. upper, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure my issue is still resolved because these are, these are cuts that are really, really important to people, yes. that and all the others. So um, I have neither a sense of the order of magnitude of what these things mean. Mm -hmm. All right, so when police gets here, we'll have them okay, you know, but talk about the, the alarms. All the others, too. Right. Okay. Oh, it looks like we... Oh, here we go. Hi, I'm Patricia Dodge from the police department. So we're talking about the order of magnitude. Should the um, proposed cut um, be included, it would basically be the entire first alarm contract. So, so eliminate so, is what we're talking about. Correct. Now, we can certainly entertain other scenarios and just spread that burden around elsewhere. Um, there's no painless way to do that, for sure. But the entire amount of the contract is both the neighborhood patrols, the, uh, the wharf, as well as, as um, the prisoner watch. So accompanying the prisoners, um, as we talked about yesterday, instead of having our officers hang out for hours at the hospital as well as some special events uh, support. So that would be all of it. Okay, well, let's just start there. I'm not in favor of eliminating it. But potentially <laughs> to reduce it. Yeah. Is what I'm, okay. So how you anticipate going through all these, one by one, thumbs up, thumbs down, or sideways? Yes, that's. <laughs> well, I'm just trying I mean, to get I don't know another way of doing it. I mean, yeah. practically speaking, we also recognize, again, this is your first time. And so this context is, is helpful for us to understand where your concerns are at, where your pain points are at. Councilmember Brown? So, I mean, I just want to make sure that I'm clear as well. We have proposed reductions to consider. <laughs> Some of us, maybe all of us, have other ideas about potential cuts and additions. And so I'm just, I wanna make sure that, because I have a lot of things to say, um, I wanna make sure that there's an opportunity to do that. If we're gonna go through them one by one, I can, we, I can weigh in on first alarm right now, um, or I can, we can wait and I can give you all of my suggestions. I just wanna make sure that we do this in a, in a rational, coherent way. 
I think if I could, one of the things that I want, or I, I think at the end of this session today, is that we leave with some direction for our staff into how to bring back a budget that accounts for the 3.2 million shortfall, so that we're fiscally responsible. And so what I interpret what the staff did is go to their departments to get input from them on what they think would help sort of um, buffer the, the the experience, right? And so ultimately at, at this point, we could go through what their recommendations are as well as entertain other ideas as the policymakers here essentially. So Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Glover, and then Councilmember Matthews. I understand that. I just am wondering, do you want each council member to to give the full list of our um, considerations one at a time or go department by department? How do you, I'm, I'm fine with going department by department and then going into other, you know, um, proposals at this time. Is that great? I mean, but if that works for, I mean, I'm the will. That would be better, department council. by department. I think, so. I think that makes sense. Because then we okay. can have the staff here answer questions or respond yeah. uh, at the same time. Okay, so we'll start with that then. So I think, um, if I, going back to the original kind of um, question brought forward by Councilmember Matthews in reduction to private security patrols, what I'm hearing is interest in um, entertaining the reduction but not necessarily <coughs> complete elimination. Is that correct? In terms of your interest, Councilmember Matthews? That's mine. Okay. One out of seven. Yeah. <laughs> Councilmember Brown. So, um, I just, for, with police and fire and the, the staff recommendation, or the, the recommendations that we have before us. I agree with Council Member Matthews. I think particularly for um, the um, prisoner watch and some special events, for sure, there is gonna be some need. And if we eliminate that, there will be additional cost to us, to the budget, right? So we're not actually gonna really be saving necessarily. Um, so I think uh, some kind of partial consideration is warranted given what we're hearing about the effectiveness of the overall contract. Yes. And what I'd like to do too on this one, maybe we can skip this one for a little bit because I'd like to have Andy mm -hmm. here respond to it because our conversations, it'd be interesting, I mean, not interesting, it, I think it's necessary for you to hear about the operational mm -hmm. impacts of that because mm -hmm. we have had conversations about that um, and I just want to be clear that everybody's clear about what it actually means. Yeah. It does mean cutting some of these things but I think the police department, they brought it forward, they felt they could manage it is my understanding when in our internal conversations about it so I'd like for him to be able to clearly give you that, that outlook. So as soon as he, he gets here, uh, we'll, we'll do that. So we can skip this one and just move on to the next one. That'd be okay. great. So under police and fire, we also have the first responder fee. At this point, does anybody, I mean, I'm supportive of that. Um, so Council Member Brown, Matthews, did you want? Did you have something on the first alarm? Now, did you want to? It was on police and fire. Okay, so maybe we'll pause any conversation on the first alarm security patrols, but move on to fire um, at this point because we'll wait for Andy to be here. So we'll have Councilmember Brown, then Councilmember Glover, back to Matthews, and then Vice Mayor. Supportive of exploring first responder fees. How does that work? Councilmember Glover. Um, yeah. So I mean, with regards to the private security patrols, we heard from the chief yesterday about there being areas that it could be reduced in uh, and where it was providing more of a s visual sense of security as opposed to it, as well as the weak data that they've been collecting from first alarm in general. So that does warrant an analysis of the weather or not to reduce those, because I, I agree that there are uh, places for it with regards to the prisoner watch and other kinds of stuff. The other stuff um, around police and fire, which I don't notice on the list, and that was brought up by community members, is the fleet uh, and the proposed purchase of additional vehicles, especially gas-powered vehicles, and the uh, perception of it being more of a wish list than a needs list. So uh, I'd love to get a critical analysis of the fleet, the uh, proposed purchases, and then any comparative uh, analysis that's been done to the cost of maintaining the vehicles as opposed to purchasing new ones and then what's been looked into with regards to electronic or electric alternatives. Okay. And then in terms of the proposed uh, first responder fee, is there consensus amongst the council to explore that moving forward? Okay, yes. Councilor Matthews, yes. Council, Vice Mayor. Yes, but here again, my, my question is when we look on the general fund budget solutions, when we look at fire, 
um, it shows 352,000, and that I read as 352,000 in cuts. But we don't see any fire department cuts here. All we see is a possible increase in revenue. They're, they're either cuts or revenue. So it's a solution, not a reduction or an increase. It, it could be okay. both. So in that case, 352 is a placeholder for the, for the first responder, for example. That's a one-to-one. -one. Other departments are not one-to-one -one that way. Okay. So, and again, this is just for clarity. So um, the solutions, in we, when we look on this graph here for fire, it should show 352,000 income, maybe, whereas in police, we're looking at 282,000 in cuts. Yeah, I, I think you're correct in that. Like I'm titled, the title of that slide could, instead of saying budget reductions, budget solutions, it, it's misleading. You're right, the first alarm will be a reduction of service. The revenue, the first responder would be an increase in revenue, maintaining existing services. Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Cron. Um, I'm supportive of exploring the first responder fee, but very cautiously because I feel like it's another expense that's added on, especially if people are experiencing a crisis with regards to their house catching on fire or what have you, and or if they're um, having some medical issue and it's another fee on top of what they're already experiencing. I think that we have to be pretty careful with that. Just ambulance. Okay. ambulance. We have a fire chief here. Yeah, I think we can have Jason explain a little bit more of it because I think it, it involves also insurance coverage and things like that, and, and there's exceptions. Yeah, I just wanted to add my question is, what can you just like start from the beginning? What is a first responder fee and how did that come about as an idea? So it's, it's a first responder fee and it does not go to house fires or people uh, experiencing a vehicle accident or rescue. It's not a fee for service for um, the array of services that we do. It's really uh, tied to the fact that the fire service as a whole has evolved beyond just fire suppression. Uh, yesterday in the, you know, in the presentation, we talked about all the different services that we provide and specifically within there is ALS or paramedic level care. Um, we are part of the continuum of, of care uh, within the county um, as far as when you have a medical event. Um, our paramedics are there to provide that level of care because um, we generally are able to respond faster than what the, um, the approved ambulance provider does within the county. And then you're transported to the hospital and we're part of that care package. And that includes 12 lead EKGs, it includes medications um, that are involved with that. And so the first responder fee is something that other jurisdictions uh, within the state have taken on that we have an ambulance provider that is billing you for that service. We are supplementing their times or stopping the clock for the penalties for those times as per for providing that. And so the idea of a first responder fee is not an additional charge that we uh, charge every, we, we can bill everyone for ALS level care. It's not going to be for rescue. It's not going to be for um, fires. And that is generally accepted um, for insurance companies, which are large corporations where it's a, it's a fee base. Think of it as uh, when you go to your doctor and you pay a copay. So we are part of that care continuum and that fee would be um, charged um, as part of that. And then the city can adopt um, a very um, lenient uh, collection policy for, for how they um, you know, recoup that cost. And generally speaking, most large commercial uh, insurance companies, they, that's a fee that they uh, readily accept and that they pay for. Um, when we were looking at doing ambulance transport as a whole within the county, we really explored um, the different models that are out there as far as funding mechanisms and how those fees are generated and what we are allowed to charge. Um, and looking at our payer mix, uh, the number uh, 350,000 is uh, fairly conservative given our call volume and our existing payer mix here within the city. So it wouldn't be a fee for someone uh, you know, on the sidewalk, someone in a hotel, someone in a vehicle accident. It would be a fee for ALS services that are delivered as part of that care that are billed to commercial uh, insurance companies. Thank you for the clarification. Council Member Kern? What does ALS stand for? Advanced Life Support. So yesterday um, I, t I, I talked about uh, we, for, within the medical world, we provide both advanced life support and uh, basic life support. Advanced life support generally involves uh, drug, drug delivery, uh, whether you're in cardiac arrest or an overdose or a diabetic who's low on sugar. So um, IV uh, medication. And then also uh, some of the more advanced um, tools that we have, um, such as 12, 12 lead EKGs, to determine whether or not you're actually having a heart attack in the field. 
I assume you, you, the fire department goes to Sunshine Villa quite a bit. Yes. And so when my mom was there, I remember trying to race over there to beat the ambulance every time she fell, because every time someone falls, they have to call an ambulance. And it, it was like the bills were like $3,600 for you know a, the AMR. Mm -hmm. How much would we be charging if we got there first? What would what would the fee or the the cost be then? Are we charging the? So generally, if there's no transport, there's no bill, um, and that's even with any, and that's changed a little bit with AMR. But for the most part, um, unless you're transported, there there's not going to be a fee associated with it. Um, and we have some rules about how we can leave people um, as far as whether they have implied consent, informed consent, or they even have the ability to consent to um, you know, denying that transport or that treatment. Um, and I don't know the particulars about your mother, but yeah. you know, obviously we, we do go out on a lot of uh, what we call uh, public assist for people. But we're not transporting, we're just maintaining the person until AMR gets there. Uh, yeah. And so if there's a transport, then we, the uh, city would get reimbursed. If there was ALS level care associated with it, then yes. Yeah. So if, if we went out and all we were doing is we're assessing, generally speaking, there would not be a bill uh, associated with that. It's for actual treatment delivered within the ALS realm. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you for the clarification. I think unless there's any additional questions, Vice question. Mayor, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Cummings. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, my last question with regards to this topic, currently, do you have any sense of how often the fire department actually does transport people or do they do provide that service at all currently? No, we, okay. we were engaged in doing that um, and that's probably a bigger conversation, but each county has a local EMS authority and as part of that uh, dynamic, they award what they call an EOA or an exclusive operating area and um, by law currently, uh, that uh, provider that wins the contract is the only one who's allowed to provide transport and is the only one who's allowed to bill. Or for transport. We are billing for services that we would render as part of that. Currently, we are supplementing them um, and not receiving any compensation for that. Thank you. So it seems to me that there's consensus, if I can tell, amongst the council to explore the first uh, responder fee under police and fire. We'll come back to police uh, and discuss security patrols when uh, Chief Mills gets Actually, here. Actually, I think Dan, Dan is here for oh. that. And I'm sorry about that. I think they were expecting 1.30 and I can't. Oh, uh, no, that's no problem. Good afternoon. Hello, Dan Flippo, Deputy Chief, Mayor, Council Members. What, what question, sorry, I was... No at problem. our other staff meeting, no so I, I missed there was, the question. There was just some questions around um, your recommendation or your department's recommendation in regards to the uh, reduction proposal for private security patrols, and just wanting to learn a little bit more about what that um, looked like or entailed for us to consider. Okay, so um, I know there's some figures uh, that were at yesterday's presentation, uh, but just to be clear, so it's about $230,000 for the um, patrols of the neighborhoods that include the wharf, um, Ocean Street, the Harvey West, uh, and then at times uh, some of the San Lorenzo uh, River as any one of those different uh, areas, uh, the other areas are less impacted. Um, and so those are, that's that's the budget, that 230,000. Uh, we have um, 15,000 that is for the um, custody watches or the, the watches that when there's somebody at the hospital and instead of having an officer sit there, we first alarm will come in there, watch the person until they are medically cleared to be booked into jail. And then we have about 30,000 that's set aside for all of our um, major events um, for Halloween and New Year's Eve. And to be honest with you, most of what that uh, funding is for is we get security lights or we get other equipment that needs to be watched so it's not vandalized or something like that and then security is watched. Uh, um, um, so if any reduction in that would impact how many eyes we could have on any equipment that the city is, is borrowing or renting. Um, so the biggest reduction that we would look at is um, the reduction of the private security patrols in those different neighborhoods. The impacts are, uh, as we've continued to struggle with this model, uh, you know, having private security is an extra set of eyes, but you don't really have an immediate need uh, or immediate ability to make an impact sometimes because they can ask somebody to leave for whatever they're contacting the person, but they can't, they don't really have the legal authority to make the person leave. So that could generate a further, further uh, contact. It, it would, especially uh, for the wharf and for uh, upper ocean, that would impact. I mean, I think the community is very responsive and very supportive of having the, that extra, just the presence. I think just the feel of the presence. 
Um, for us, that would, where our impacts or the staffing is, is we, we don't have that extra set of eyes out there that can directly call us on our radio and say, hey, this is what's going on. Can, is if an officer's clear, can they come and respond? That's, <coughs> that's the real reduction in, in that we would have, that reduction of service. Um, as we're talking about cuts though, we feel like we would uh, continue to try to provide the same service as far as uh, making sure that staff's available. I think with our neighborhood policing teams, as problems arise in a neighborhood, we're able to direct what resources we are in a more kind of strategic, not, not just a continued pre presence, but more of a strategic presence. Um, and that's what we would uh, have to do and keep in place um, if these cuts were made. Um, for the council that's newer, you know, this isn't the first time that we've recommended when cuts come in. Um, th this seems like it would be a service that we feel like we, we could cut and maybe backload with, it puts a little more burden on us, but we feel like we could where other cuts, you know, I, I just don't know how we would do some of the programs that we do if we made those cuts. I mean, we just physically need to have the funding to do those programs. And I think that this would be a little bit less to us, like significant, I don't think it would be less significant to those community members by any means. I think I think there would be some uh, very strong opinions about keeping those uh, patrols. Okay, thank you, Deputy Chief. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I think maybe um, there was a couple questions by, well, I'm, I'm looking to Councilmember Glover. I, did you have additional questions now that we have our? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the first one was to get a, another report back on the impact of the private security patrol, so thank you for that. Really appreciate the breakdown and the positives and impacts, but also the ability for there to be potential reductions. My other question was about the fleet, and some of the community members came and spoke <clears throat> a little bit ago about the concerns about the plan for a $68,000 truck, um, and they were talking about that specifically with the police fleet. I haven't had a chance to check if that $68,000 truck purchase was in fact for the fleet, but I wanted to get your perspective on vehicles, uh, vehicle purchases, the realistic possibility of focusing on servicing the vehicles instead of purchasing new ones, and then the transition from gas-powered vehicles to electric. Perfect. Um, so as far as the $68,000 fee for a particular vehicle, that I'm not aware of because what we've asked for um, is the replacement of three of our patrol vehicles, and we roughly budget around 50,000. Now I do know that they were adding one vehicle to be a command vehicle, to basically be like a mobile command post where it has all the drawing boards, and that adds to a, you know, because you have to have more equipment, and that adds to a, so that may be <coughs> that individual. What I, so I should know the individual. I know that we asked that the, we roughly budget about 50,000 for each vehicle, um, and then that goes through public works, and then through their leasing program and all that is where the individual fees uh, come out, and then then we get a total like, hey, you're authorized to buy, I believe, with this year, uh, three emergency vehicle replacements, or I'm sorry, this current fiscal year was three emergency vehicles and uh, an unmarked. Let's talk about our fleet. So our fleet has. Um, we have obviously the marked emergency vehicles that um, the lights and sirens and all that. And then we have uh, vehicles for our investigators. We only have two admin vehicles that's, that several people share if they've got to make court runs for paperwork or down to city hall. Uh, most of the people do walk to city hall, so that's good news. Um, but when you, look at, um, when you look at our emergency vehicle fleet, I believe it's 31 vehicles that are, that are emergency equipped. All the other uh, vehicles that are in our fleet are our we'll consider them our non-emergency. Those 31 vehicles, other than our transport van, which is a large uh, van, all the other 31 vehicles are shared. They're shared vehicles across the entire staff. So that means when we put in, um, uh, I, I have to have a vehicle that can be used by every officer for every given assignment because they're shared, they're rotated. We don't have like, oh, this vehicle is just used for these people and that's their only assignment. With our staffing, every, guy, every car has basically gotta be equipped to go out, handle calls for service, take people into custody, transport them to the hospital or jail or wherever it needs to go. So for that reason, um, as far as electric vehicles, I'm all in support. If I could get an electric vehicle that was large enough, I would. You made a comment earlier uh, about you know the, the size of the officers. So when we're sharing vehicles, I have to have a vehicle that when we put the screen in between the uh, driver's compartment and the passenger, and it's well, let's call it what it is. It's a spit screen and all that, so the officers aren't going to get anything on them while they're transporting somebody that may not be happy that they're going to jail. 
um, I, I've got to have that buffer. When you put that screen in place, that really limits the driver's capacity of, of a car. So if I have a very small car, not everybody's going to fit in that. When you look at vehicles or agencies that are using all electric vehicles, uh, those agencies, I heard it uh, earlier in the community portion, somebody mentioned Detroit, LAPD. Absolutely. If, if I had, if I could add to my fleet, I would add vehicles if they were specifically designated for specific duties. I, I can tell you those larger cities have whole divisions that don't do a police officer's job. They may be police, but maybe I'm the DARE officer and all I'm doing is driving to schools and I'm never transporting anybody. I'm the community watch officer. I'm, I'm coordinating all these community groups. I may be in a marked vehicle, but I'm never taking anybody into custody. I'm never doing that police officer work. Yeah, have at it. We, we, just our size of our agency, we don't have that. So one of the things I did ask for for this year, um, uh, or our current fiscal year is, is we're adding a uh, Chevy Volt to our investigations unit. I will say all of our, most of our support vehicles are hybrids. Um, I added a Chevy Volt because I think that's more of a hybrid. Why didn't I go a full leaf or something like that? Because you know what, they may still have to drive up to Santa Rosa or something like that. And I need something that's gonna actually get them the distance depending on what that duty is. So I'm more than willing to explore those all electric options. I just don't think with our current fleet size and then having officers that have to do a multitude of jobs and that car has to share that. I, I just don't see strictly because of currently what's on there. Unless you wanna buy a full size Tesla, we'd be totally happy with that. I just think the price tag on those is a little bit, uh, is not gonna meet the market value of what we can get. So does that answer your question? Thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? And if I could just add in there, I can remember somewhere around 2002, getting my first real exposure into managing a fleet or being part of fleet decisions. and understanding the purchase price of a public safety vehicle is different than the final price because of the light bar sirens, customization, the, the, the onboarding computers and systems that are integrated in with other regional agencies. There's a lot of equipment that goes into the vehicle once you have it. So I think in the budget we have 65,000. That's not the price of the, just your average go to the lot and get the vehicle. That's a low price and then it takes a lot of effort to outfit them to get them into. And, and we do try to swap information, uh, some share, like if that light bar is still functioning and working, then we'll try to share, you know, switch it over. There's some things like it, it's electrical equipment. So think of how long <coughs> your smartphone lasts, it, it gets weared out. One, I, I failed to answer one of your questions and that was on continuing to maintain them versus buying new ones. You know, right now we, we are running out to about 100,000 miles. Doesn't sound like if that was your personal car. Remember, these are cars that are drive, driven on surface streets 24 hours a day going from start, stop, start, stop. So it does get to a point where the maintenance cost, trannies go out, uh, water pumps, all the other stuff, the electrical system starts going out because of that constant draw on it. So we do, part of the reason is, I mean, we don't just go, oh, automatically this car needs to go because of its age. Some cars are older and their maintenance records are lower. As they start to get higher, you get to a point where you're paying more to keep the car on the road than you are. And that's, that's where our, when we're managing our emergency vehicle fleet, that's exactly where we're at. So it's not like an automatic, now there's a new lease program, so I understand it is more of a rotational, but prior to that is that we would run the car as long as that cost per maintenance mile worked. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Cronin and Councilmember Myers. You mentioned that you had 31 emergency vehicles and a transport van. How many other vehicles are there? I, 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 I can get back to you on that. I, I'm sorry, I, I do know the number. I'm, I, I'm are we talking 10 more, 20 more, 30 more? It's, um, well, we at least have 10 more. Um, I would say probably up to about 20 more. And with the chief city vehicle, with our investigations units, about 10. And then you have the two support vehicles uh, for our administrative staff that they share. And but, but so just one volt, I mean, can we can we get a plan you think to, tra to transfer or to move toward all so, electric on those right. that aren't emergent, non-emergency? So maybe? the only reason I bought one volt is because the mile, remember we're talking about mileage versus maintenance costs. It's the same thing for my, my unmarked units as well. So the only vehicle that was up for replacement was that one vehicle and I replaced it with a volt. The plan is, is if next year public works comes and say, hey, these vehicles are costing us a lot of money. We suggest that you rotate them out of the fleet. Then it's my intention to buy either a hybrid or a Chevy Volt. If, if I had a staff vehicle, I can look at an all 
I mean, a Chevy Volt is all electric, but it does have a gas motor, so I, I, I get the difference. Um, but yeah, that, that would be my intention. The only reason I bought one is that was all I was authorized to actually replace this year. And um, it'd be great if you could get us the gas, you know, uh, how much you're spending a year in gasoline and diesel. If you have that, that'd yeah, be great. Yeah, I, I heard that question. So. I, I know that number's out there because every time we, um, that is something that goes through our fleet cost with, with public works, but I know as soon as I ask how much, so uh, there, there should be a means to find out how much we're spending in, in gas on that, but that it's kind of a, um, that's one of those costs that when we're putting into our budget, it's kind of like, hey, this is the, the three year actual of, of the cost of the vehicles. Now we actually get that number from public works and that's what we put into our budget uh, as far as base, uh, and, and that's what it's off those actuals. But uh, any vehicle, I should say, hey, this is the maintenance cost and the fuel cost. I, I know we can get that. I know you were kind of joking before about the Tesla, but what if you, the analysis was done and you know you buy in bulk from someone like Tesla or something like that, you know, there could be a savings at the end of the day if we know how much all the other costs are. Are you, do you have to buy Ford Explorers? No, I mean, we. the reason we bought the Ford Explorers, there's a lot of testing that goes into each vehicle for it to be rated. Currently, the only vehicles that are rated um, for patrol use, other than the Ford Fusion being the electric hybrid, um, are the uh, Dodge Charger, the Ford, and the, uh, there's a Chevy out there. That, that's it. None of the other cars are rated for law enforcement, code three driving, and that, that high pursuit. That all goes through the Insurance Institute and the California Highway Patrol, and they come out with their studies and say, these are the vehicles. Part of the reason we stick in those ranges is because the fleet pricing comes from the fact that the state, all these other law enforcement agents are buying that particular vehicle, and they're, and they're trying to buy that vehicle. Um, they only do U.S. vehicles. They don't they look at other. I know that the CHP was looking at a Volvo for a while, but yeah, I don't. I don't know why we're not looking at Subarus and all that. But yeah. oh, thanks, Councilmember Brown. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here and, and racing over to answer some of our questions. My question isn't directly uh, related to the police vehicle budget, but I think it. I mean, I'd just like to make a recommendation that we save some time to have a discussion about vehicles in general because these cross over a lot of different departments. I see some confusing things in the budget where there's vehicles related to city council. So I, I would like to have that broader discussion, maybe not when we talk about each department, but just later, if that's, I think it would make it more efficient. Just, just an idea. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and so then in regards to uh, sort of the proposal before us with the reduction of the private security patrols, um, do council, individual council members want to weigh in in terms of direction and where we can find consensus at this point? Um, Councilmember Glover. Yeah, I think so. I would uh, support having an analysis done of and a report provided by the police department of the different locations and the areas that they feel are not the highest priority for there to be security patrols for the opportunity to reduce the, uh, the budget associated with that. Okay, does that seem, uh, Councilmember Matthews? I, I don't know how the others feel. It seems like the custody watch is just a smart use of <laughs> resources. And the major events seem, again, uh, as close to a no brainer as we get. Um, I certainly would entertain some I think significant reductions there. Seems to me particularly the beach wharf area and upper ocean are in high demand. I, I have a question, I don't need to get it answered right now. I'm under the impression that there have been some um, matching allocations, whether it's from uh, businesses in the area or no. I don't know, Dan, if you know this. I, I mean, I could speak a little bit just yeah. because I feel that or having that with some West. of the folks yeah, so with I Harvey West, there are the matching. opportunity to get, so let's call it a copay. So potentially a reduction, and, yeah. but not elimination. And again, we don't need to get into a long thing on this, but I understand the value between actual impact and perceived benefit. And sure. I just think the perceived benefit, I think there's some benefit, it's just so important to those areas that are most beleaguered and feel like uh, um, Deputy Chief has talked about, well, we'll backfill this with neighborhood patrolling, but what we hear is the frustration well, we tried the neighborhood policing, but they were called off on the regular duty because we're short 20 active officers, you know. So anyway, yeah, <coughs> I'd like to try and strike some kind of a yes, balance. I think there. that's fair, and I share that. Uh, Councilmember Myers. 
Yeah, I just, yeah, I think, uh, I think let's get a report back. Um, I do know that the beach and wharf area um, is an important area for tourism as well as residents. Um, I know there's a lot of problems in the beach volleyball court area. So I, I just think we need to know more fully about where the surfaces are um, and uh, make sure our community understands what, what we're potentially looking at uh, in a little more detail. So I'm comfortable with having a report brought back. Okay, okay. looks like we're good. Um, so shall we move right along to the public next works. column, which is public works operations and engineering. Um, I don't know if we want public works. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know much about what this what this actually means. But if you want to speak to it, or if council members have questions, we can go ahead and do that. Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. I can just give you a brief uh, overview of what that is. Um, really, we have three groups that we've taken the reductions from. In operations, we have about 125,000 in in reduction. Majority 65 or 63,000 in reducing facility maintenance and remodeling, uh, 50,000 in reducing flood control, vegetation management, street striping and signage, and then uh, seven and 5,000 in energy project reductions and some of the SWIP courtyard work that we have to do. Um, in engineering, we re were looking at reducing other professional and technical services, 30,000. Uh, reducing street smarts funding 15,000 and reduction to bike and pedestrian projects another another 30,000 so our total of 75 and then under parking we we are going to delay the meter hood replacement which is 10,000 we're proposing to raise the beach meters by 24 percent in the summertime um, which we can do without coastal commission approval um, and then increasing residential and guest permits um, the the Beach meters would bring in about 137,000 general fund dollars and the residential and guest permits another 20, uh, 23,000 in total. So that gets us to about 370,000. Questions? Okay, Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings. So um, thank you for clarifying some of that. I have a perspective on various elements, but in terms of the beach meters, the increase um, and then the, the residential parking permit increases. You, you've costed that out, and those, my understanding is it's 24%, which I support, um, and then for residential, it's a nominal increase yeah, to the they're $2, currently at whatever 25, it is. Yeah, I think it goes, yeah. to, it goes to 27 or $28. So a little over $2 a month. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> a, year, it's a year, it's a year. I mean a year, yeah, yeah. so $2, $2 a month because it's, 20, it's $24. Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm, I'm just talking about what, yeah, it's it's a pretty, I'm just wanting to show it's a nominal. They haven't been raised pay. in I think 10 years. Right, or yeah, I mean, when I paid my 24 bucks to, you know, for downtown all, parking all the time, I thought, wow, that's a really great deal. It still would be a great deal at 27, so I absolutely support that. I mean, it could go to 30, it's up to you. It's really a council discretion. Uh, Vice Mayor and then Council Member Mack. That was actually my question. Okay. Was, yeah. Council Member Mack. Um, in the uh, parking and traffic, th those all sound like go ahead to me. Um, frankly, I benefit from the parking permit. <laughs> it's been 25 for 10 years, put it up to 30. It's not big bucks, but you know we haven't adjusted that one. Um, uh, the street smarts you have reduced here. How much would remain for street smarts? Um, we still have about 30,000 that we from measure, uh, measure D, but we're also working with the regional partners, uh, Watsonville, the county, and looking at bringing in revenue from them also to supplement, so it'd be a more regional program. So it would be some reduction, but also some offsets, is that what you're Yeah, we're hoping, to, we're hoping to bring in um, more than the 15, maybe close to 30,000. Well, so that's a 15 income that you No, that's a 15 reduction, actually. Okay. Of, well, of I, I support fund. that. That's, yeah. that's a, a cut, but not an elimination right. of a program. And on the bike and pedestrian, it says crossing. Yeah, it's a reduction to bike and pedestrian um, projects. It's probably 30,000. Um, it may be some striping or it may be uh, green, green lanes, those type of things. It, it's really general at this point because we don't have specific yeah, projects identified. And is there something left in that fund? So yes, there is. There? Uh, main, mainly with measure D um, projects. So we, it won't affect the major projects, but it's really just maintenance efforts at this point. 
how much remains in that. I will, I will get that for okay, you. Okay, I'm just trying. It, it doesn't eliminate it, but it, but it does reduce it. And then um, you ran through all those others in that middle column, operations and engineering. Um, and just like it's not clear, what does reduced support for emergency or higher priority engineering services mean? Um, it, that, we, we have, we have <laughs> un, unspecified dollars for consultant fees for projects, unanticipated projects that come our way that we have to deal with or we can deal with uh, simply and quickly. We will have to come back to council for um, approach for those. There for again, and I, th I think I'm gonna have this question, a lot of things, it says reduce. What are you looking at in terms of reduction and what remains? Um, for facilities and um, maintenance and remodeling, we're, we're reducing it 63,000. There's probably another 50,000 left. Um, but that'll just, the nice to haves will kind of have to wait, basically, is what, what it'll be, so. Well, uh, I'll just say, without knowing much more, those kind of reductions, which it's just a, you gotta tighten the belt, but right. not eliminate it. Right. Those are things that, seems to me to make sense for, but I, I kind of want to know what are the numbers in those two okay. columns. We'll, we'll provide that to you as far as what the what the balance is. Okay. So Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, then Councilmember Glover, then Councilmember Crown. Yeah. Just to finish up um, with Public Works, my comments. I, um, you know, I, I tend to agree with Councilmember Matthews uh, wanting to have that information about what's left, and it sounds like um, you're looking at creative ways to maintain those programs um, while making some some reductions. I just wanna say, I, I actually, I don't support any reductions to um, bike and pedestrian projects at this point. I mean, the small reduction, I mean, that's like one vehicle. <laughs> We're talking about, you know, if we, if we re make those reductions that are very significant to bike and pedestrian safety, green, way, green lanes, et cetera, that's like one or two vehicles in our big budget. So I, I wouldn't support those reductions. I think those are critical and they should be prioritized. Mm -hmm. Mayor Cummings? Just wanted some clarification around the um, third item in the second column with reduced flood control maintenance, including surrounding vegetation control. Just some clarification on. Yeah, we spend, boy, it's, um, I think last year we spent over 150,000 on the river, San Lorenzo River maintenance as far as uh, vegetation removal. Um, we also have sign maintenance and striping that we're constantly upgrading. So we looked at the overall effort on that budget and um, found our reduction that we could find to make it. So it, again, it's not specific. We'll have to identify the areas that, that we'll have to reduce or, or you know, to do what we have to do within the budget. Uh, Councilmember Crone, Glover, and then Myers. I mean, no, Councilmember Glover, Crone, and then Myers. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Dettel. Yes. Good to see you again. Um, so, uh, just since we're doing these one by one, um, can the I'm open to discussion, and I want to learn more just about the reduction support for emergency or high priority engineering services. Just a quick. Yeah, we have typically budgeted between 50,000 a year for unanticipated projects. We'll bring in consultants. If we have to do a design um, of a, we'll have a road failure or something like that. If we have a geotech that we have to bring in, it just gives us some flexibility to manage, the, manage those unanticipated problems. Um, what we've done, we didn't eliminate it, we just reduced it so that we have less of a buffer. We can still get the critical ones done, but we'll have to come back and get authority for more uh, funding if we need it. Great, um, so I support that, absolutely. Um, then uh, I'm not in support of reducing the resources to explore energy projects because I would imagine, and get, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that that means uh, exploring alternative energy programs and ways that we can move away from our reliance on fossil fuels. Yeah, that's $7,000. Um, it's really just to oversee um, potential, potential other options for energy reduction, that's correct. Great. I'd, I'd, in fact, I'd love to see that increased. Uh, but um, then with the uh, reduction of maintenance for the surrounding vegetation control, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, again, that majority of that's San Lorenzo River and we, we have a, a maintenance program that takes place early August. Um, we do a lot of vegetation management. Um, we'll bring a 
contractor in dur down in the river, they'll cut all that vegetation back. Um, so we're preparing the river for uh, the winter season as it comes forward with, with the flooding. Um, we'll, we'll do as much as we can, but we're just gonna have to re you know, look at areas where we're gonna reduce that. All right, what I'd love to see uh, with that, and also I'll talk about it later with parks, is, oh, first of all, I'd love to see a report on some of the consulting fees that we have been paying with regards to uh, vegetation control and other kinds of stuff like that, because I'm always interested in finding ways that we might be able to inc incorporate uh, community involvement and through volunteerism in some of those services as opposed to paying outside contractors. Um, I uh, support the increase of parking meters in the Beach Flats area. Um, I am uh, hesitant to increase parking rates for residential people, uh, especially because of our cost of housing here in Santa Cruz. If we have required permitting uh, on streets because they don't want other people parking in their neighborhoods, it seems uh, difficult, especially if someone's moving into that neighborhood to increase their rates for parking. Guest permits maybe, but I'm not in favor of residential rates. Um, or I'm in favor of um, increasing the rates on people of over a certain income level. So I need to understand if that's feasible so that there's scaled or uh, tiered parking payments. Is that something that's feasible? Um, I don't know that you could do it on income. You could do it on the first permit is one price, second permit is additional. Could be a higher price if you wanted to do that. So someone who had six cars, well, they only can get five, but five cars, they would pay a much higher price for that last car. If that's, if you wanted tiered, that's probably the only way I think you could do it. Great, I'd love to explore any options on how we might be able to, just to make sure that people of lower incomes or with less means aren't being hit with the same uh, <coughs> cost as other people. Uh, with the Street March uh, program or the outreach campaign, I'd love to see the data associated with that. So the amount of issues and street dangers that existed before the implementation of the Streets Park program and then the resulting years following, just so that we can understand the efficacy of it and sure. figuring out where we want to put our money. Um, and I uh, do not support the reduction in funding for bike or pedestrian crossing since we want to keep our community safe. Something that did stick out to me though, uh, which is not on the list, was the potential increasing of uh, downtown parking permits, specifically for companies, because I know that came up in uh, our presentation for our study session with parking, and that we were severely, I mean, in my opinion, undercharging corporations like Amazon and other large-scale corporations that have deeper pockets uh, while making our own staff play kind of musical chairs with parking spaces. So I'd love to see uh, how we could increase parking permit costs for uh, large corporations. Those are not general fund, but that's something that we could be looked at. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Crone, and then Council Member Matthews. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I won't repeat, I support um, pretty much everything that's been um, said so far, except I like the idea of tiering it. Um, you know, in fact, leave it at 25, possibly for the first one, so you're not dinging, you know, low income people because they're not gonna have more than one car, I don't think, okay. usually. Um, but then putting it up to like 30 and 35 for your second and, and, and your visitor one. I, I didn't know you could have five. Like, what is the, f what is the third, fourth, and fifth one it's cost typic now? It's typically, they're all 25. Typically, the first three are um, for use of the resident, and then the two guest permits are allowed. So you could have up to five <laughs> permits per, per parcel. I would love to see a tiering of five dollars each for the you know as you go up, <laughs> similar to like having car, owning cars. I think you should be paying double when you have a second or third car um, in registration fees. But um, the other issue is how much does it cost to park at a meter now in the in the beach area? In, in um, I believe it's a it's a dollar fifty an hour to park in the beach area, um, which in the limited time parkings, and that actually doubles after two hours in the area like Cal's lot where it's two hour minimum. We don't have time restrictions, but it increases by cost. But if you park at the boardwalk, it's $15. Right, so we're definitely the cheaper alternative if you you can find a spot. <coughs> right, that's what I was wondering if, because I I'm, I support getting up to um, the, the market in that area because that's when they're used. They're used by you know folks coming to visit the boardwalk most of the time, I think. Um, and maybe you know more, better than I, if, if that's true. Is it mostly tourists that are using those meters? It is, and 
we, we, if we go over 25%, then we have to go back to coastal for approval for that, but we can raise it 24% at this point. So is it 24% on top of the dollar fifty? Yes, it would, it would be that rate. It would be 24% uh, in, on top of the dollar fifty. So we're getting close to $2 an hour? Close to $2. So, I mean, and people are staying for eight, seven, eight hours. I mean, if there's typical, I don't know what the typical boardwalk visit is. Typical boardwalk oh. stays at three to four hours. Three to four. So he might be renting those parking spaces three and four times a day or just three times a day on busy weekends, yeah. That's what I thought too, but just it's good to get some uh, verification. Um, yeah, and as far as the funding for bike and pedestrian, I totally would not want to see money come away from that. Thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Councilmember uh, Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. I think we're going to say the same thing here. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you go ahead. Well, in terms of multiple parking permits uh, for a single parcel, um, at least in the downtown where we have both lived, uh, a lot of those are houses with a bunch of students or, you know, divided up. And so it's not one family with five cars, right. a bunch of people. So right. something to consider. I would just add, so in terms of the question about tiering, it's like which tenant gets to pay the lower <laughs> fee. You know, I mean, I, I just think it, we're personally, it's, they're already pretty low. So even as a low income person with a permit in the downtown, it wasn't a huge stretch for me. So I, okay. So I it's simple. So in terms of Keep it kind of consensus, I, I share the proposal to increase it, um, you know, okay, m modestly. Um, and you know, we could explore a different time for an increased tiered system, but I'm not sure if that would actually get at the equity piece, which I know is sort of the intention behind that request is sort of what I'm hearing also. And, and would you agree? I think keeping it simple makes a lot of sense just for the operation and implementation. Um, <laughs> we, right now we have some properties with limited number of permits available. And when you have multiple tenants trying to, students trying to jockey to see who gets the permit, it's always kind of a challenge for our parking office staff. Okay. Could be something to explore in the future. Council Member Clifford? Yeah, so I just want to clarify as I understand what um, people are talking about. So we're facing a situation right now where we have $25 parking passes and people can have how many? Um, a total of five per parcel. Up to five per parcel, okay. And so we have the potential for those people that have, let's just use an example if someone has five cars, I'm not sure how many people have five cars, um, but instead of asking people that are affluent enough to have multiple cars to pay more, which would then go into our funding, we want to maintain, we want to gradually increase it by a small percentage and then just have that across the board so that people that want to have multiple cars under their name don't have to pay additional money. I, I find that hard to understand because why are we not taking advantage of the opportunity for people that have enough money to have multiple cars to pay additional funding into the city since we're in a deficit? I just don't understand the logic between, like why resist that? Okay, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, I had a question with regards to what was in the department summary for public works. Okay. There's a line item for off street parking right. that goes up by a million dollars um, from the estimated actual this year going into 2020. And it looks like it also went up, um, well, it didn't go up by as much in the previous years. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to why we're seeing a million dollar increase. That's basically, we just increased the parking rates um, based on the project coming forward. Um, so we're seeing increased revenue from uh, those increased rates. So that's really, that's revenue projection is what, is that what you're looking at? As far as it, it says fiscal year request 2020, <clears throat> um, it goes from. Oh, let me grab my book. Okay, sure. Councilmember Brown. Um, but I was just going to respond quickly to Council Member Glover's question. Maybe I can, but it, it looks like our city manager is interested in doing that. Um, and then I, I, I just add had on a, a suggestion, if I may. The, I mean, the, the most important thing we need to hear from Council now is whether you're interested in increasing parking revenues. And it sounds like there's a consensus uh, with respect to that. With respect to the actual <coughs> rate structure and all that, I mean, the, that's going to has to come back to you anyway. Um, so I, I, I don't think you need to resolve all of that. I think in the interest of time, um, but it will come back to you. So there will be an opportunity to 
uh, further discuss it if you wish. So just a suggestion. Did that cover what you were? Yeah, I'll just say I'll talk to you offline about because I share your commitments. And so I think it's just maybe clarifying. We can talk later. I'll get back uh, to we'll go back, back to Vice Mayor Cummings and then to Tom. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I, do, I will talk a little bit about fleet if you, if you it's an update on philosophy. So okay, if you did want. You, did you get? Um, I'll get back to him. You'll get on, back to him at a different time. Okay, yeah, let me gotcha. Let me research okay, that. Okay, Councilmember Glover. Thanks. The, the reason why I brought it up, and I understand that there are future meetings to have to do with all of this, but if we don't give direction to come back with the analysis of the potential impact of the different fee structures, then when they come back, they're just going to come back with an analysis of if we increase it by $5 or whatever it is. So if we're giving direction, it seems like we should be able to explore all of our options on how we might be able to generate additional revenue for the city. Even if it's a direction that we don't take, we need to have the data in front of us. So I would encourage uh, the staff, ideally, uh, but also my colleagues to at least encourage the data to be compiled so that we can make an informed decision. Councilmember Matthews. Understood, but we're asking all this to come back in a week, and I think we have to do some focused effort here. Okay, so in terms of um, cons sort of consensus moving forward, I think in, there's a shared consensus in that regard in terms of the increase. Um, and then I don't know if we, if you have what you need or if you want us to individually go through and see where the majority of the council falls on some of the individual proposals before us, if that would be the most helpful approach at this point. Yeah, that, that would okay. be great. Okay. I th okay. I th yeah. 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 Okay, do you, I think we've heard from certain council members, council member Myers, um, I'll share sort of where I am and I think we've heard from Councilmember Crone and Councilmember Glover what, in terms of about what about these individual things that you like you were suggesting you wouldn't support reducing funding for this or that. I just want to make sure we get a tiered when it comes back. I think a, an obvious one would be five dollars per vehicle. Like so, we have one vehicle is twenty five. Don't change that and see what the numbers are. And thirty dollars for two the second, thirty five for the third, forty for the fourth, forty five for the fifth. We've got that down. As okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, we can look at that when we bring it back. Okay, do you want to share sort of where you are? I'll just, yeah, I'll just make a couple quick. Um, Mark, I had a question about the uh, flood maintenance. Um, a subject I know a little bit about. I'm just curious, how do we, um, how do we rectify the maintenance that w keeps us within the O&M operations and maintenance requirements by the core? Right, we will have to do, there are minimums that we will have to do. Right. Um, and we'll look, we'll have to look at uh, where we take that funding from. Uh, we may have to go to the, the overlay fund for some of that, which is hurting right now with the flood control overlay, but um, we're optimistic we're gonna get a reimbursement from the core. So we'll see if uh, from the bridge credit we're still waiting for, that's been 12, Ten years. 15 <laughs> years. Um, but as they close out this project, it's supposed to come to us, so it might bridge our gap until we get through um, this year anyway. Um, that's so, kind of what I'm hoping. Okay, yeah, and I, I guess I would just kind of um, suggest, um, it does seem like the, the use of the heavy equipment, the ripping especially, has been effective in moving sediment, yes. which is really what we need during a, fl a flood. Uh, I'm less um, excited about watching all the trees get cut down every year, so, I don't know if there's a way that, so I guess I would lean towards, even though it uh, can be optically weird to see a bulldozer down there, um, I think that you actually receive quite a bit of benefit in terms of flood control. Plus, I, I think over time we've learned that actually um, util, utilizing that kind of equipment actually can mimic what typically a storm flood would be doing. So we're getting a lot of diversity in the habitat there. So maybe there's a way to kind of cut, because I know a lot of the hand work's very expensive. Right. Um, that's where a lot of your cost comes in. Um, I, I think with parking, um, I just think uh, simpler is better. Uh, I think you get into a, a lot of complication and you may price people out, I don't know. Um, so I think uh, just try to, try to find a good level that people will uh, subscribe to. Um, I would be disappointed to see both the street smarts um, and the bike and pedestrian uh, funding get uh, decreased. I'm hoping that we can at least hit the highest priority projects with the uh, bike and ped uh, improvements if we did do reduction. 
and then with Street Smarts, uh, I agree, it would be great to, to see if you can uh, kind of uh, extend our uh, funding by matching with, with other jurisdictions so we get better bang for our buck. Thank you. Yeah, that would be a countywide message too, so it helps, great. it's helpful. Thank you. Um, others want to share or? I'm happy to sort of. I just have one last question. Another question. Um, with the increasing meter rates in the beach areas, maybe I didn't hear correctly. Is that just during the summer, or would that be year round? And I believe we... that's a summer increase because the majority of the majority of the revenue comes in the, that four months. Right. I was just one to know for clarification. Thanks. Do you want to share any areas of support for the reduction proposal? Um, similarly, I'd rather not see reductions to the. Um, <laughs> bike and pedestrian crossing. <coughs> um, I, having lived in the beach flats area and been affected by the, um, the the way that the permit structure is, I'm happy to see the tiered structure come back, but I do understand the concerns with, um, if you live in a, in a house with multiple individuals, all of whom are renting, if the parking rates go up depending on the individual, that's kind of not fair for the people who are living in that household. And so, um, I'm interested in seeing what the tier system looks like, but I think it's going to be difficult um, to um, make that argument that we should that people who are coming into a house later at some point are therefore um, negatively impacted if they have a car because they just came in at, at a later point in time and, and then are subject to paying more for parking. Um, and then um, let's see. the higher priorities for um, engineering services. It'd be great if we could, um, I'm sorry, for the reduced resources to energy exploration, it'd be good if we could keep that money there because I think long term we'd actually save money by finding more energy efficient um, um, projects in the city. And, um, and I, as I mentioned before, just wanted to know more about the reduced flood control maintenance and vegetation control. Okay, okay. I'll just share, uh, I too, um, <coughs> would like to hopefully not see any reduction in the bike and pedestrian safety efforts. And ideally there'll be a way to offset any potential reduction that would accompany the Street Smarts outreach campaign. I understand um, based on sort of the conversation today that the proposal for the increase in the, um, the permits, uh, it would be a small increase and to potentially tier it could also have unintended consequences for folks that I think could potentially not necessarily meet what I think is the intention behind wanting to have a tiered system. Um, and then in regards to the uh, resources to explore energy projects, just more understanding of how that fits into our broader efforts around um, those types of resource, resources or um, energy put into that as a city in general. Does that kind of give you what you need? Or do, does everybody feel they had their opinion expressed? Council Member Cronin and then Council, and then Vice Mayor. Council. Just on this or the entire, you know, public works budget and stuff, are we talking about that as well? Because I had my, some similar questions about vehicles and vehicle purchases and how many vehicles public works has, how many are electric. Uh, can we go in a, in a more aggressive direction toward electric vehicles? Um, you know, how much do we depend on the internal combustion engine? Can we actually make a shift and, and, and of two electric? I think if I remember correctly, Councilmember Brown offered to have that conversation after we sort of conclude the individual <coughs> elements yeah. and to revisit it at that time, but to have it today. And when is that gonna? Was that correct? Yeah, I mean, I would just add, that is not to suggest, I, I don't want to ask the question of each and every department, but if we're gonna be asking it of each and every department, I'd like to maybe try to have a discussion and see if there's, uh, support um, on the council for having that question asked okay. across the board. Councilmember Matthews. And I think you're the department yeah. that does the vehicle purchase. So yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that <laughs> okay, a little well, bit. You're gonna do it now. Yeah, our, our focus actually. I'm just going to pause here really quick. Vice Mayor Cummings, did you have an addition? Yeah, I did have one additional question around the um, the residential and, get, and the residential permits. Okay. Is there any possible way of tying, for example, with this idea of doing a tiered system to tie to the individual? So if I as an individual own three cars and want permits for each of those vehicles that it then goes up for each additional vehicle that I personally own, rather than it being tied to the, the property? Yeah. Uh, we can check on that. That We'll look at that when we do that, write up the tiered system for you. We could also um, deal with the student issue is you show a student ID when you go to the parking office. 
you know, then you don't pay that. You, you know, if that's an if that's an issue, I personally think that I'd like to try to persuade students not to bring a car to Santa Cruz. Okay, did you? Okay. I was just going to comment that it's not just students who are renting. I mean, it's a lot of professionals and people who live here long term. I mean, we know how difficult it is for people to rent in Santa Cruz, and so it's not just students who we're talking about. Just want to point that out. Okay. Um, basically, the, our philosophy is to try to get the most uh, carbon-free vehicles that we can. And uh, Public Works, we've actually, we have seven of the LEAFs, or six of the LEAFs in the pool. Um, that's something that we started many years ago uh, on a lease program because the pool vehicles um, LEAF, they're just around town. It seems to work pretty well. We have multiple Priuses. Um, just as far as we've tried electric uh, parking scooters, unfortunately the scooters really weren't, they didn't really work out as well as we had hoped, but we were willing to try that. Um, we've tried hybrid garbage trucks. We've had with mixed success with those. We're actually, I think um, we've tried CNG. I, we're, we're hoping for an electric garbage truck. That's really where our next focus will be. Um, we. As far as trying to incur, we, we do encourage um, when a, a department comes in for a vehicle, we do explain what's available to them. We try to encourage them to get a electric or a hybrid or something like that, well, that if it meets their needs. Um, PD has been replace, replacing the Crown Vicks, which we're very happy with. I think we're almost <laughs> through with those. There's eight mile a gallon vehicles that, uh, so even if they're using an SUV, it's still getting 18 miles a gallon. So it's much, it's using fuel, but it's using much less fuel than they were using before. And so we're, we're moving them towards uh, more efficient vehicles. Um, I, we fully support trying to be the most efficient vehicles that are out there. Uh, we are waiting for an electric pickup truck that's actually um, kind of meets the market and can meet the test. There's a lot of talk about them, but they really aren't currently available at a reasonable price right now. Um, there's Ford's talking about maybe making the F-150 electric. Well, that'd be great. We'd, we'd, it, it would fit the type of use that we have. So um, right now we, we do have, ch we, we actually are also getting two electric uh, trolleys. So those are replacing the other trolleys. The issue for us right now will be charging stations and there's a limit on charging stations at the corp yard. We are working with uh, PG&E to install more charging stations. We spo we're supposed to get uh, multiple charging units there if they follow through with the program that we've signed up for. Uh, we're optimistic there. Monterey Bay Community Power is, in fact, the meeting today was just talking about more charging stations and funding um, the Cal VIP going with them and installing more charging stations throughout uh, either the city and the whole region. So. Um, I think charging stations are a, a current limitation. This is an evolving industry, and we're seeing both the types of vehicles and the charging networks kind of evolve, and, and we're, we're actively watching it, ready to implement it as it's appropriate. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Well, if we're gonna talk vehicles now, then I'll just have at it. Um, <laughs> I would really like to see, um, and I'd just like to hear from my colleagues about their interest. Some people have raised it. Um, really, a, a, a fuel cost broken out by department. Okay. Um, um, we've, we've heard from the police department that that information can be made available through Public Works. I'd like to see it for all departments. Um, and then, I'm just ha trying to understand in the capital outlay summaries we've received by department and activity. Um, I think the Chevy Tahoe was already uh, raised as a question which um, Deputy Chief Flippo answer, I think answered. Um, however, um, I'm just not understanding why the city council has vehicles attributed to it at all. Um, and um, so, and why, if, if so, <laughs> what they do, um, so that's not really a budgetary question, but I see um, under activity 7862, it's capital th um, three in the capital outlay uh, section, um, of unnamed vehicle to replace a Ford Taurus at $47,000 and two Ford F-150 standard cabs replacing uh, Fords at $34,000 each can, can I get a, I'd like to understand what that is um, and why we're replacing um, 
again, potentially smaller vehicles with these either larger vehicles or are more less fuel efficient. Mm. So one <laughs> um, activity 7205, um, which I think is on capital, I can't remember, which page, capital um, four, <coughs> uh, Ford Ranger is um, being replaced with a, I believe it's unnamed, but I think it sounds like a F-150 at a 50% increased cost, and then um, the Ford Rangers in general being replaced by full-size pickups and that's kind of on and on. Uh, typically though, um, they're not making the Ford Ranger anymore and typically the, the we don't put a lot of miles on vehicles but we put a lot of years on vehicles and um, most of the, at least in the general fund, uh, the average replacement life of a vehicle, non-public safety vehicle is probably 15 to 20 years um, public safety vehicles, we, play, we look at them very closely if they get 100,000 miles or 10 years. So that's kind of the trigger because they can be put in a high speed situation and we wanna make sure that they're safe. Um, so that's kind of the replacement trigger we look at. For a, a general vehicle, they can go 15 years. Um, they typically have under 100,000 miles because they're mostly local trips. We are currently talking with a, a potential lease company with, with Enterprise to see if that makes sense for us. Um, it may, just because you'll have newer vehicles, more efficient vehicles, but we don't put the miles on, on them. So after three or four years, they may have 10 or 15,000 miles. And if they, so we're, we're trying to work out the details if it makes sense or are we paying too much for a, vehicle, a new vehicle to sit there. So we're looking at that. There are benefits, but but there are cons too. Much appreciated. If you, if I could just understand city council vehicles. I can jump in on that one. Thank you. The city, so there's a joke here. I'll be a little lighthearted. The city council oversees everything. So we put your head, your name at the top of every page. <laughs> so it's, by, it's, it's a mistake. It, there's a the very first page of the capital outlay starts with a shared copier cost and city council as a header was continued on every page from there forward. I'm, I'm usually so. pretty good at, at recognizing your That's jokes, a good one, though. but thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Me well, I thought we were going to actually achieve some serious savings here. <laughs> okay. Other questions at this time, Council Marco? Um, I think that's even why it's more imperative to move toward. Uh, I mean, how, how many vehicles are in the f in the fleet right now? That's a good question. Did you say overall. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask our operations manager. It sounded like we were about at 51 vehicles for police, more or less. Copper Public Works Operations Manager. We have around 800 vehicles in the fleet. We have another 200 assets that are things like stationary generators, that sort of thing, <coughs> lawnmowers. Around 275 of those are passenger vehicles or light pickups. Um, of those, we have six LEAFs. I believe we have 12 Priuses. We have uh, a couple of CNG vehicles. I think we have around 30 alternative fuel vehicles altogether. Uh, every year around September, we look at our fleet. We have a computer uh, maintenance management program, spits out reports. Uh, we have somebody working on one today uh, for fuel consumption by department. Uh, we go through the list uh, and we look at four things. We look at the age, the mileage, the repair costs that have accumulated in the last three years on a vehicle, and the fuel costs in the last three years of a vehicle. And we weight each of those and we come up with a score for each vehicle. And then we go to the departments uh, to which those vehicles are assigned and we ask them, uh, is there any reason why we shouldn't replace this vehicle? Uh, do you have another vehicle that you'd rather replace? And if they do, we subject that to the same test, the same point test. Uh, thinking behind that being we weed out the vehicles that have excessive mileage, which really is police vehicles for the city. Uh, not unusual to have a 10 year old vehicle with 40,000 miles on it. Uh, and then if they want something else, um, 
we try to accommodate that. Uh, most of the passenger vehicles, people are pretty flexible on. Almost everybody wants some alternative fuel vehicle. We get that, we, we're believers. Um, the problem we have is fitting that in a capital budget because they're 15 to 20% more expensive. Uh, and then with the electric vehicles, it's the chicken and egg thing. Uh, we don't have capacity, so do we buy electric vehicles or do we buy electric vehicles and find capacity? Uh, we were offered this program by PG&E to put in 16 charging stations at the courtyard at zero cost to us, except for the charging stations themselves at around five grand a piece. That's a no-brainer. So we're going ahead with that. Uh, PG&E's kind of leaking oil at this point. We're not sure if they're going to be around when this thing's ready to go, but uh, by all indications, they're sticking by it, and so they hope to deliver it by November. So that's kind of an overview about how we look at our fleet and try to keep it current. So it, it kind of sounds like you're looking for direction from the city council to say, yes, go for those electric vehicles, pay 20% more if that's what it takes. I don't know if the council's ready to do that, but I know that the community's ready to do that. I'm just looking at the numbers here. If uh, you have 275 passenger vehicles, 20, it looks like less than 10% are electric. I believe in California, 13% of the vehicles now are electric, and in Santa Cruz, I think a bit more than that. It would just be great if Santa Cruz could be the leader here in electric vehicles that the, the city's using, but I, I don't know if you're waiting for that direction or... No, no, we, we agree completely. And, uh, there, you know, there's other factors that we have to consider as well. Uh, the, the actual physical capacity of the vehicle, you know, in relation to the use that's gonna be put, mm -hmm. the range of the vehicle, uh, what do we do with the batteries when, when they wear out? You know, there's a substantial um, disposal cost associated with those batteries. That <coughs> situation's improving. That's why we went with the lease on the Nissans uh, because they took care of all that. Um, and the program that we're looking at with enterprise fleet management, um, uh, they take care of that as well. Uh, this is something we were pretty skeptical about when it first came down the road, but it, we're kind of being won over. Uh, it's gonna enable us to buy more vehicles uh, and, and a more variety of vehicles. So uh, we're, we're with you on that. We really wanna get these alternative vehicles. What if we had a moratorium on gasoline vehicles? Uh, we're gonna have a lot of iron sitting in the yard doing nothing. Well, I mean, we got, you can use those until they're they're done, and then yes, you only buy could. you would yeah. only buy electric. Yeah, um, we still have to buy parts and keep these things in service. But if that's your direction, we can look into that. Um, also, if you bring back the consumption of each department of gasoline, could you also uh, attach prices to uh, n numbers of dollars amounts to how much the gas is Certainly. we paid for it? Thanks. Keeping in mind that the gasoline market right now is pretty volatile. To, that's that's why I'm that's why I'm pushing electric. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't been to the gas station in six months. I mean, just you know, just and I'm looking at the prices keep going up and up and up. Okay. Well, um, I'll just briefly add that in sort of the interest of time, you know, and the intention of the day, I think what I'm hearing from the council is really a, a wanting to have a better understanding of energy use, costs associated with the work that we're currently doing on um, energy efficiency strategies and and then maybe as policy makers, we can discuss <laughs> any best next steps. Um, Councilmember uh, Brown, Matthews, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, and Glover. I'm, I think I'm covered. Thank you. Okay. All along your lines, um, I don't want to get into a moratorium on purchasing gas vehicles per se. I, I, I give a whole lot of credit to what your efforts are already. You understand the imperative to be as energy efficient as possible bearing in mind the range, the function, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this has been very interesting. It kind of affirms what I think is true. Um, and I know also from Metro, we, the, for the buses, we have a goal and a de desire to be all electric. The technology is not there yet. We have a, a staged, and, and you're replacing these things on a, um, a formula, whether it's age or mileage, that makes right. a lot of sense. So uh, I think the review has been good. Some kind of summary of this might be helpful just in terms of conveying it to the public because on a lot of these vehicles, once the staff has gotten up to explain, well, these are the reasons, yeah, it makes sense. So that would probably be reassuring. Um, emphasizing our goal in the long run is to get off of fossil fuels.
Yeah, I'd just like to follow up with that just by seeing if we can get some more information about, because you mentioned, and I'm looking at one of these line items, for example, that the Crown Vic gets eight miles per gallon and the replacement car will likely have better fuel efficiency. So I think understanding fuel efficiency with the replacements would be very helpful. Additionally, um, I think it would be good to have information on what vehicles they're replacing. So for example, if we're purchasing a new truck, does that previous truck have 150,000? Has it been you know, having issues in terms of maintenance, which is a reason why we're replacing it? Um, just so that the public and council members have a good understanding as to the rationale as to why we're replacing these vehicles. Some more to come, <coughs> addition, Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Crone. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure, because uh, I didn't hear it reiterated in some of the summaries, was just looking at the increasing of downtown parking permits for companies like Amazon. Okay. Um, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Meyer. Would this be the time to talk about um, pedestrian and bicycle uh, protection going across the one and nine uh, in, interchange there. That's, I noticed there's something in the budget over this, but and I just want to make sure there, uh, you know, that we're going to get the pedestrian because it's the, probably the most dangerous intersection for for a pedestrian anyway. Yeah. Yeah, we have the the bike path that actually goes on. You know, the the safest way is to actually to go around that intersection. Um, with the intersection redesign, there is an improvement for pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, in the one and nine improvement. Is there any way to encourage in that interchange th where the bike would then like maybe where the Ross camp is now or something go th that, that way to catch the, um, the, the, the bike lane? Because a lot of people don't realize, you know, because it's, so, it's removed from right. the street so they don't know that the river levee is there. Mm, I'll talk to Chris about that. Yeah, I don't, maybe signage or something like that, a path. Yeah, I'm just bringing this up because some people were looking through the budget and they said, hey, what about that, that intersection? Is it going to be safe for bikes and, and pedestrians? I know it is a, there's, an, there's a shorter cross. I mean, it's, there is a, a little bit of an island that helps people, but um, we'll get more information on that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we've spent a lot of time talking about this intersection and, um, and the council did approve an imminent domain action to allow for this project to go forward. Um, my understanding of the design However, is that the the bike lane is kind of the minimum standard, the four foot lane. That's what the pro the design proposal is, unprotected. And given that, I mean, we do have an alternative that I also want to encourage people to take. But given that that might not happen, um, that people will be crossing, I'd really like to see pursuit of uh, increased safety measures there. Um, we could do more than the minimum. I think we ought to consider that. And I just jump out uh, to respect. We're approaching 2:30 from a time check. Yeah, and um, we're on the first. Thank you. We're on that. the first slide. We've got a few more to get yeah. through. We have a lot more to get through. I, I think, as we've Thank said you. a couple times, there, we, we recognize there's a 260 million dollar budget behind this, the scenes. That, that a lot of these things might be prioritized to come back as an informational item or report backs or additional direction. But if we can be helpful to get through this list and absolutely. Thank you for that. On that note, let's go ahead and switch gears, thank you, um, to our next bucket, which is economic development. Um, and we have Bonnie here, if you wanna say a few words about what this means for your department and our community. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. Um, so the reductions that we have before you today um, are, are listed on your screen. Uh, the first is our facade improvement program, and I should just start out by saying we don't want to reduce any of these, um, but these are the ones that we felt like we could manage uh, a reduction based on um, just based on the overall uh, projects, and it's part of it's a capacity issue too. So. Uh, we did have, I will say, 50 applicants this last round for facade improvement program. We did some uh, very extensive outreach um, and we had some translation services uh, provided in the beach flats and had a really good response. And so we've been working through those. So I, I do wanna preface that by saying I don't wanna reduce in any of these. Um, but we do have only so many projects we can handle a year. And so just looking from a capacity basis, I felt like this was, was one area that if we had to reduce, we could. 
um, the facade improvement program over the last couple years have become has become a little bit harder for us to manage because of some new state regulations around prevailing wage, dropping that minimum down for to 25,000 and then anything that has city funding in it triggers prevailing wage. And so it becomes more cumbersome for the applicant to go forward. And so we've had fewer people respond to the program. We've made some adjustments to the program and also created a signage program, which are smaller $5,000 grants that don't trigger prevailing wage that has been very successful. So we're trying to balance those two programs going forward. Um, so that's our facade improvement program. A reduction of our graffiti contract. Um, this is a fairly long, large contract. About 60% of it is funded through the general fund. 40% is funded through enterprise funds. The majority of the general fund funding is in our department. Um, and so the portion that we fund is everything that's not covered under, uh, you know, other enterprise funds, whether it's, you know, storm water, you know, just other things that get tagged on public property across the, the city. We do cross. Uh, allocate those across the departments. But everything else that doesn't fit comes to our department as part of our budget. Um, so we, overall, this roughly is, I think it's about a 21% uh, reduction to the contract, which we would do. And I think instead of having the 24 hour response, we try to take care of everything within 48 hours. So we're looking at how we could still be res responsive and have a slightly smaller contract. So that is that, is that proposed reduction. Um, we also have proposed a reduction to professional and technical um, services. That one's not actually listed up here, but that is looking at some of our geotechnical support. Um, it's related to some of our property management. So looking at the, um, for example, uh, under the Metro project, a couple of our key projects, we need to do uh, phase one environmental. We need to look at the geotechnical, both for like Sky Park and some of those. Um, and so those are just a timing issue. Can we fund some? Can we delay some? Can we fund some? Can we adjust that within the, within the budget? Um, the redu reduction for temporary and contractual staffing, we're hoping that by filling the vacancies, our recent vacancies, that we won't need the temporary um, staff line as much as we've relied on it in the past where we had, you know, we've had five um, retirements within the last two years and that's had a pretty big impact. So we've had a large number of vacancies and really have had to rely on some temporary, particularly where it comes to property and asset management. Um, so, and then finally, the reduction in public art. Um, and this is, and just to clarify, there's a distinction between this and the art funding that we provide for community programs or at Arts Council. This is specifically the funding that we budget as part of economic development. And this uh, specifically funds our overall program management, arts, arts promotion, mural matching grant program, um, sculptor, scrap, um, and the rail trail arts. All these are great projects. I will say that um, we have a, a you know one person, uh, you know small but mighty um, arts program manager who does an incredible amount with the budget. We have um, a number of projects that she's working on now, and we do have some funding carryover from the previous year, which is why we thought we could absorb a slight reduction um, for the upcoming fiscal year because we're still carrying forward those projects that she's working on. Um, so that summarizes the reductions before you, and I'm happy to answer any specific questions that you have. Councilmember Brown, and then maybe I'll just go yeah. around. Yeah. Yeah. I always get to go first. I love. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you're quick. <laughs> so maybe because so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I think you actually answered the question I had related to reduction in the public arts uh, program, but I just want to put it out, and I thank you for clarifying on all of these items. I just want to put it out there uh, for to take note of for future discussion. This is a longer conversation, but you know I'm really interested in um, the you know the relationship between the graffiti and public art in our community. And a member of the public who's actually here, uh, an intern who's working with me, uh, alerted me to the fact that the city of Berkeley has this really. I'm just going to say it now because I don't know when else I'll have an opportunity to say it. Um, the city of Berkeley has a program where they actually contract with graffiti artists for certain um, high uh, graffiti um, locations and um, as a res and they sign. And so as a result, because of the graffiti community, uh, at least uh, much of it um, actually respect, they respect each other. Um, it actually has led to um, a reduction in graffiti overall. So not just, um, re you know, so reducing is not just covering it up after it happens, but 
creating spaces that don't, that are not as prone to graffiti. And it's something that I'd really love to explore in the future. So I'm gonna put it out there now so my colleagues know it's of an interest of mine and I'll um, follow up with you, Bonnie, if to kind of talk about that for the future. Yeah, and I will say at a future point, we can have uh, Beth Toby, our arts program manager, come forward. She actually has done quite a bit of work in this area. Great, thanks. Yeah, uh, just quickly, if we could uh, get an idea, the reduction you propose in the facade program would be from what to what? From 100,000 to 70,000. <laughs> and um, the other thing that you mentioned was um, just because of external requirements, it's, it's morphed over time. And I'm wondering if, um, you said there's just a capacity of how many you can manage, but also it's it's a 50-50 match now, isn't it? I mean, I love the facade improvement program. I think we get so much bang for the buck out of it. Could we go to a, you know, 40-60 match? Or, you know, 50-50 isn't magic. It, it, there, there's a certain sense to it, but just stretching those dollars a bit. I support this. I mean, still you can do some good project for, for this. Right. One of uh, one of the things I should have said that we're trying to also do is to really encourage some of the larger projects because you can have in one building, you might have, you know, three or four, sometimes as many as five businesses. And the more that we can have participate, the more we can leverage the funding. Mm -hmm. So we're just, we're also just being strategic on the projects that we're doing going yeah. forward. Um, so I'm fine with that. Um, in terms of the graffiti contract, you're talking about going from what amount to what amount on that? So the total contract is about 115,000. And so we would propose to reduce it by uh, 25,000, which is about 21%. Um, I'm a real fan of the graffiti project. I, and to my mind, removing tags is 100% different than graffiti art. <laughs> and, um, <coughs> You talked about going from a 24-hour response to a 48-hour response. I mean, that's ballpark. Of what yeah, you're ballpark. Getting. Yeah. Well, I, I'm happy. I'm I'm okay with some reduction, but no further than that. Um, the reduction in public art, as I uh, understand it, was um, basically a one-time reduction understanding the that's right structurally i don't think we could support that over multiple yeah. years but this year i think we can because of the carry forward of some projects that we already have um that beth is working on we think we can we can support that so that goes from what to what that would go from 100 to 70 so it'd be a 30 percent in that one well um, understanding that that's not a cut in the actual program that's um, right i could support that and then the reduction in temporary and contractual staffing is from what to what there. It's a it's a reduction of forty thousand. I don't have the exact okay. um, total of that. Just FYI for all the other departments. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what I'm curious, just to get an order of the magnitude of the cut. Um, but as I understand it, there um, by your ability to fill some positions now, you think you're going to need less of that. Yeah, it's around twenty five percent. And I hate to interrupt this, and I appreciate the precision, but we also recognize that we have a bigger gap to fill. And so just just conceptually. saying conceptually, those numbers could change. We might, I mean, I'm not saying those would be the changes, yeah, but we might come back and say we need more from graffiti, for example, yeah. or, or more. So just putting out there that we're at 2.4 million now, and we have a bigger number to get to. So if, if I may, uh, Marcus, so your interest is having, is is the, is the consensus amongst the council overall somewhat comfortable with what's being proposed? Yeah, most definitely. Is what you're looking for? Yeah. Okay, so. But I, I, I recognize the, the <laughs> those are important questions to get answered. And to. we're analyzing th at that level of detail, obviously, as well. That's all. Okay. Did you have any answers? I just wanted to ask about the professional and technical services because I think that that's just the last line item. Right, so what's in that, a, a lot of what we funded and just looking at last year specifically, what we funded out of that is geotechnical. So we've done um, a number of studies. We tap into this for um, professional management, sometimes also for appraisals, um, but for site characterizations for various projects, whether it be like Sky Park and looking at the additional borings we may need to do. So some of our contracts 
um, specifically include, um, you know, environmental uh, surveys and, and site characterization. Sometimes it might include an additional boring to get additional data of, um, for example, the vapor that we have at Sky Park or looking at um, some of the properties downtown when we're considering going forward for acquisition. We'll do, at a minimum, we'll do a phase one. Sometimes we'll, we'll go a little deeper to find out um, what that risk is for purchasing that site. And so this all comes out of this, uh, this line item in our professional and technical. Um, we, you know, usually have a little more in this, in this line item than, uh, then we'll spend, we usually have a savings at the end of the year because we budget for, okay, if this project goes forward, we'll need to do these three things. And so we'll budget for that, but we don't typically spend it all every year. So we felt like we could absorb it here, um, but those are the types of things we fund out of it. And if we, all the projects did move forward at once, we'd, um, yeah, it, it could be a challenge for us. We've also, just looking at the other things we funded, we fu funded some storm drain uh, analysis at the tannery that we needed to do. Um, we actually had a housing contract out of there as well um, this last year for um, related to the housing blueprint subcommittee. Okay, I'll just say, I just appreciate the context that you provided in relationship to some of the use being carryovers or the management of the program or potential for partnership, et cetera. So in terms of my position, I, you know, I support the package that you've presented and how you want to move forward. Okay, Councilmember Myers. Yeah, I'm, I'm also generally supportive, but also um, a little bit, um, you know, the success of our small businesses in Santa Cruz relates directly to our sales tax, which relates directly to our ability to, um, you know, have success with um, our budget and the for our community. And so um, I, you know, I understand, and I think you've selected, done some surgical thinking on it, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I think especially with the facade program and, and the kinds of things that we can do, especially I'm glad to hear that you're doing more work in beach flats. I mean, I'd hate to see these kinds of small businesses not um, be able to uh, get assistance from us. So I think their success is directly related to our policy decisions. So thanks for the surgical uh, reductions and hopefully we won't have to do more. Okay. Hello, <clears throat> thank you for uh, the information. Uh, so I support the reduction of the facade program. The Graffiti contract, uh, interesting to know the quantity that's associated with that, just as far as funding goes. Um, along the same lines as Councilmember Brown, um, I know that Berkeley, the program she referenced in Berkeley, but then also there are other things that I've seen where they partner with local um, graffiti artists to go and just convert all of the negative tags into positive tags and makes it so there's more uh, positive art. So be interested in uh, looking at the ability for us to implement that um, while still making a reduction to that program. Uh, I'm firmly against uh, reducing funds for public art. I think those, those are super important um, as uh, when we get to community support also, we'll talk more about the need for community engagement and community expression. Um, so uh, really wanna see more diverse art, I think is something that I would love to see instead of a reduction of public art. And then um, for the facade program specifically and the temporary contractual staff, I have a note here so that I need some data. So just the efficacy, the response, the impact of the facade program, has it in fact supported businesses and has their income or revenue increased from their use of the program? And then um, the contractual staffing, just the list, just like from Public Works, a list of uh, history of contractors that we've used and the costs associated with them. And I'm not sure if it's feasible between now and the next meeting, but maybe between now and the third meeting, um, the bids, that, and that goes for all the different departments, the bids were, that were associated with those contractors that they went with um, so that we can look at the alternate bids and how they went. Thank you, and thank you for going down the, the, the line. Um, uh, the <coughs> facade improvement program, is that money always used? 
You mean completely? Yeah. Not not always. It used to be used every year yeah, um, completely. Right. When we had the new state regs on prevailing wage, which were really you know tightening up and lowering that minimum that triggered, we really struggled. And then we also had some challenges with the Department of Industrial Relations and just getting responsiveness. So the time it was taking to go through the program meant we were getting fewer people through the program a year. So the last two years, I wouldn't say that we fully spent the funding. We'd love to, and that's one of the reasons we did considerably more outreach this year and have been working with Department of Industrial Relations to really refine the program and try to be as upfront as possible and proactive with them so we could get all their questions answered so things could be a little more streamlined. And the question that um, Councilmember Glover was asking about, it doesn't sound like there's gonna be a reduction in the actual amount that you're spending in the art, right? Because you're carrying right, over some money. Right, because we're carrying forward money and- But, but even though you're doing that, I would still, um, uh, support carrying over the money and increasing that uh, public art budget. Um, the uh, the other thing was the rental assistance programs. Do you always use that money? It's, it's, there's budgeted right now for 22, there's, there's two programs. It says 20 and 22,000, is that money gets spent? In the, in the last year we have spent that and we actually amended it um, to increase the amount of funding for that, that program. That helping people with security deposits? Yeah, we have both the, yeah, the emergency security deposits and the emergency rental assistance. Um, is the the wharf master plan is that anywhere in economic development? Uh, yes. Where, where is it in the budget? I don't see it right here. Uh, uh, we haven't budgeted any new funding for that. That's bond funded, so that would be on the CIP side. Okay, and is it when you say bond funded? What what do you mean? Meaning that we have some of our uh, former redevelopment bond funds set aside for future. That was one of the approved projects when we issued the bonds, mm -hmm. um, but we haven't you know, we, we need to go forward with the EIR, and so we weren't anticipating moving forward on that or spending any funding related to uh, implementation of the master plan, because we need to finish the EIR first. Thank, thanks a lot, and I support Councilmember Brown and Councilmember Glovers, if we could look at that Berkeley program and, um, you know, get artists, graffiti artists, to actually make positive tagging, which would be a great thing. We'll look, we'll look into that. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover. Is he following up on the, on the group? No, that's okay. So um, is now the time to talk about economic development, CIP? It's not on the list of recommended reductions here, but I just have a couple of comments that I want to make I, sure get. I think so, and then, I mean, we, we have, um, a, you know, a, a number of other departments to get through. This is general plan here. Are we going to do CIP separately? Or are we doing CIP all at the same time? We, we don't have, we're, we're prioritizing the time on the reductions or budget solutions. Um, I think if, if, if there's a general question we have on CIP, I, I think going a few minutes with a quick question and answer, if it's deeper than that, maybe just out of sake of timing, we can come back at a future meeting and schedule those for a deeper dive. It's really, um, I mean, but, I just want to ask the question, why, given that the, the um, the council will need to be looking at, and, and I think we have coming up on our next agenda, uh, consideration of dis further discussions about library alternatives um, on page 150 and 154 of the CIP. We have um, uh, two items, the downtown mixed use project, early phase design and development of the downtown mixed use project to include library parking, housing and commercial uses on the city owned parking lot four. I don't, have any issues with the funding being there. However, the description of what it is to be used for seems a little premature to me. Okay, so th yeah, this was based on, this is actually last year's budget based on, and the description's based on council direction from the fall. Um, okay. I will say we budgeted it so that we could allocate it across the funding sources that were approved for the project, um, but we haven't, this project has been on hold pending further council direction, so. I just wanna be make that clear. And then on page 154, farmer's market structure, construction of farmer's market structure on city parking lot at Cathcart and Soquel. I know that's also based on previous council direction. However, there is no Cathcart and Soquel. It's <laughs> I understand. I mean, I'm just trying to, to make it clear that we... Um, we could also say parking lot just, seven. It's just, a, it's we were thought it'd be more descriptive to have the street names, um, but we can modify that. Well, it's just inaccurate, but it's, I know it's nitpicking. It's front but, street, isn't it? Front, front, it's front, it's and front and Cathcart. Cathcart. Front there is no... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the clarification.
Okay, thank you, uh, Bonnie. Okay, did you have another question? Yeah, it was just in general, because um, I know that Marcus was hoping to move more macroly through all of this, so we're not asking about specific reductions, but it would be great to get a list for all the departments of the proposed reductions if it hasn't already been sent out, because I don't believe I've seen that. You've, you're seeing this for the first time, we recognize that? Right. The finance director's message that we're gonna be finalizing, we'll have the detail, more detail with that list. Beautiful. And I see we have uh, Lee Butler here in team for uh, planning and community development. Thank you and good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, the Planning Director, and with me, I've got Sarah DeLeon, our Principal Management Analyst. And uh, we took an approach um, when we were looking at these cuts of first looking at protecting uh, our staff members, at making sure that uh, the positions that we have wouldn't be affected. We then looked to see how can we have the smallest impact on our customer base, both internal and external, and then how can we um, cut where it has the least impact to our staff workloads. And so um, in looking at that, uh, contract staffing was one of the things that we decided um, we, would, we would have to um, be uh, experiencing significant cuts in. Um, I'll, I'll focus on two areas primarily of the contract staffing cuts. Um, the first is in our advanced planning division and the second is in our building division. Our advanced planning division has um, a, a very uh, a large workload, a lot of backlogged items. Um, as we mentioned in our department presentation, 10 um, new area plans, 10 updated plans, 25 zoning ordinance amendments. And some of those updates require us to go out and um, get consultants to um, help us prepare those either for, through the expertise that they bring or um, as a result of the, the time that those plans would require. Um, the Seabright area plan, for example, has been on the books for some time and, and based on other priorities um, that has continued to get pushed back and that's an update to that existing plan. That in and of itself could be um, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars um, depending on the scope. Um, so we would be looking at a significant reduction in the advanced planning um, contractual services. Um, that would be um, roughly uh, 150 plus thousand dollars that we would be looking at, um, which is about uh, a 46 percent reduction um, with about $180,000 remaining. Um, and that fund was cut, uh, that's, because that's a, a very discretionary area, uh, it depends on you know, the, the council priorities. We actually used that fund last year in our reductions as well, so it has seen a year over year reduction. Um, but that would certainly affect our ability to implement some of the priorities that the council may have. So if the council said, we wanna go and do uh, the monarch butterfly study, or um, we want uh, uh, certain <coughs> tenant protections uh, to be in place, we, we may need to ask the council where that funding would come from. Um, the work that CPP, the uh, the collaboration and consensus partnership, uh, you know, that, that work is coming out of this advanced planning budget. And so um, there would be potential implications on the workload uh, and what we're able to do in advanced planning. The other big uh, consultant cut that we would be looking at is in our building division. Um, we would be looking at about $105,000 in cuts there um, under this scenario, and that's about a 32% reduction with about $220,000 remaining. Um, these folks provide <coughs> really um, uh, both day-to-day -day and technical support, um, whether it's um, compliance uh, with uh, accessibility provisions or whether it's uh, the, the plan checks or the inspections. We have teams of people who come in on a daily basis oftentimes and supplement our, uh, our staff efforts. 
and um, we send plans out when they come in so that um, uh, you know, our, our two plus, our, we have got two plan checkers, for example, plus a green building plan checker. And so you know, if we get a lot of projects in at one time, we are committing to timelines that we uh, uh, provide comments on those plans. And so we send a lot of those out or we bring outside consultants in. We've had some substantial challenges with uh, recruiting qualified individuals. And so some of that workload um, has gone to our outside consultants as well. If we're cutting that, then right now we do have some, uh, some really valuable services where we have inspectors who are on the counter, for example, during uh, certain portions of our, um, our counter hours. And our ability to provide those services um, would be limited if more of that workload of the plan checks and inspections are falling onto our, um, our regular staff. Um, so, you know, if a business is looking to come in and say, hey, I'm looking to open my business or a homeowner comes in and wants some technical information up front, um, the technical experts may have a, a smaller amount of availability there as a result. Um, there's some smaller um, reductions in um, some of our uh, legal support. We'd be looking about uh, $10,000 in reduction. That's about a 10% reduction. Um, and that's for some of the things like um, looking at specialized CEQA assistance or looking at um, the state density bonus and getting legal support on those items. Um, so uh, that, uh, the, the majority of it would um, come out of um, consultant contracts. Those would be the, the, the primary impacts that our customer base would see. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for providing the context. We'll start to my right this, this time, Councilman Marcon. Thank you very much. Um, Appreciate it. Uh, I'm interested in the um, rental inspection uh, ordinance. I, I have, um, well, first I wanted to ask you about reducing public counter email and phone support. When you just um, kind of showed me this, <laughs> the new counters in the, yesterday, I, that's kind of a sure. disappointment. I'm, I'm, I mean, is that? It's, it's absolutely a disappointment. I think the, the reality is that, um, you know, if we've got less consultant support, then some of our technical team isn't going to be able to. So right now we've got varying levels of, um, of service that we provide. Sometimes it's just someone submitting an application. We're taking that in. We're making sure that, yes, you've got all the plan sheets and we'll take it in and provide it to those technical experts to review. We also have services where um, someone comes in and we actually have the technical experts out there. So they're saying, oh, you know what? You need to think about um, your mechanical ventilation in this uh, particular project. And I've done these before and this is the challenge that you'll wanna look at when you hire a designer uh, when you hire an engineer, um, talk to them about that so that you're addressing this issue up front. So it's a really great service that we provide. Um, and there, with, with fewer consultants to assist with the plan check and inspections, you know, there can be um, some implications for um, the ability of that, those technical staff to always be available. But certainly, you know, we wanna minimize the impact on our customers. That's one of the primary um, objectives that we have. We just want to also be realistic and um, know that uh, we may not be able to provide the level of uh, service that we hope to and strive to provide in, in all instances. Thanks. Um, what I really wanted to do also was look at, I, I think that there's a lot of hardships going on with the um, rental inspection program and code enforcement, um, and we might disagree on that, but I've seen it uh, close up with many students that I work with and other folks in town. And I just would like to see a revamping of that program where it actually um, can, uh, can assist tenants. Um, and I know you and I talked about this a bit and I don't know if um, council is, could, would consent on this, but I would love to see the staff come back to us um, when, if we could shift the program to uh, complaint based only um, and we could codify uh, 12, uh, SB 1222, which is grandfathering in um, units from like the codes of that year that the units were built, um, as long as um, health and safety aren't at issue, maintaining the landlord fees that fund the program, and um, 
with structures uh, being brought up to code at the point of sale, which would, which I think would be have a huge impact on on the sales market. It would be you know uh, people would be flipping homes so quickly and or or, or possibly. Well, we're gonna, I'm going to go down the line here. Okay, cool. Councilmember Clever. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Lee. Hey, so. Um, I would love to just see more of the physical data on the reduction of contracted supporting staff and the reduction of programs that trigger specialized legal support just so that I can make an informed decision. Thank you for the brief breakdown in the beginning of the explanation, but just so I can see it and have a chance to look at it. I was resistant to the reduction to public counter email and phone support because every time I call the planning department on the main desk, it goes to a voicemail and I can only imagine as a community member wanting to get in touch with someone, having to wait through that process every time it could be frustrating. Um, also, one of the things that I've spoken briefly with Marcus about and wanted to get, and, um, and this is kind of more long-term thinking, but additional ways that we can generate revenue through things like vacant house fees and other kinds of stuff like that, uh, what's the feasibility from your perspective on exploring those options of generating more revenue that way? So that is certainly an opportunity for us to explore. That was something that came out of the housing voices report. So that community generated process, uh, that community process generated a wide variety of recommendations and uh, a vacancy tax as well as a uh, sort of out of area purchase um, uh, uh, surcharge. Uh, you know, both of those were identified. There is a potential for those um, and it's certainly something that we could look at. Um, I know that uh, we're looking at a variety of things through the um, action labs. I, I don't believe at this point that was one of the things that was identified, but it's certainly on the, the longer list. And it wasn't, um, if I recall correctly, and Councilmember Brown or Mayor Watkins may be able to jar my memory here, but I don't think that uh, that vacancy tax made the first cut of top priorities in the housing blueprint subcommittee recommendations, but it was certainly discussed and um, was um, a consideration as part of the voices report. I don't remember exactly, but I, I do recall discussing it and I think part of the kind of uh, discussing it as maybe not first priority for um, moving forward was related to the timeline because we were talking about likely 2020, but we're getting there now, so I'd move it up the list. We could revisit that, yeah. yeah thank okay. you. And um, I don't know if you have it, because I, I know that's on the list of recommendations, but any analysis from your team as far as additional revenue that could be generated through levied fees? Now, not taxes, because taxes, of course, have to go through the voter process, but other potential revenue um, opportunities through planning that could be uh, policy driven from the council. It would be great to see. Absolutely. and. Uh, one of the action lab items is looking at a um, impact fee for um, for public services, uh, emergency services, fire and police, for example. And also we do at some point want to revisit our, our building fees and update a fee study, have an updated fee study there. We did that um, several years ago, I think about three years ago now for the planning side of things. Um, we also, I, I wanna remind the council because I think this was a great thing. Last year, um, the council approved uh, cost recovery provisions for our code enforcement division and so so if folks work with us and correct violations, they um, do not get charged time and materials. But if we get to the point where we're um, requiring a notice of violation, those individuals start getting charged time and materials. And um, in June, you'll be seeing the first round of those um, where council's asked to put that on the tax assessment to collect those bills for those who haven't paid. So I think that was a great step in the right direction so that the people who are uh, doing the violation are um, actually paying for that service rather than the general public paying for it. Wonderful, thank you. Councilman Mayor. Just in the interest of time to try to get us over the finish line here, um, I think I'll just reach out, Lee, with my specific questions. I, I understand um, certainly where you've tried to um, make the cuts. Um, probably my biggest concern is the public counter service. Um, 
you know, I think uh, it's important for people when they're taking a loan out to do a remodel or, uh, you know, or somehow financing. Um, it's really important for people to be able to um, access our planning department and, and get decisions in a timely manner because that really impacts people's uh, ability to, uh, to, uh, do, uh, to handle that risk financially. So um, that would be my main comment. Thanks. Thank you. I would, I would just share. <laughs> I would share. I, I share the the same concerns around the uh, public counter, you know, impacts that could have for our community, and then um, I think I heard you mention the CPP. Could you explain more? I, uh, That's um, Dave Sepos and oh, the work okay. that he's doing um, uh, to evaluate um, and provide a recommendation on the rental housing task force. Um, so as council looks at sort of long range uh, plans and long range planning activities, um, that uh, consultant budget is what we draw on for some of the priorities that the council provides. And that was just an example of a recent one where we used that same fund that we're now proposing to cut. And, and so um, in certain instances, if the council says, we'd like to go and do this, we've been able to say, all right, you know, we didn't get to the Seabright area plan this year. And so we can fund that. But it, as we continue year after year to draw down on that fund, we'll have less of an ability to respond. And particularly if there's a big project, um, at any one big project at the, the proposed funding rate, any one big project could, um, could use that entire amount of funding and more. So it's just something for the council to be aware if there is um, a, a desire for a, a, the beach south of Laurel plan, for example, um, is supposed to be updated. If, if you wanted to provide that direction, we would then be asking you, um, where is that funding coming from if we've, we've drawn down on those consultant funds? And just if I if I can remember correctly, did you did we um, do we have a specific amount set aside for that one project at this time in this budget, or is that just sort of overall for, for CPP yeah. um, for CPP that's under the current fiscal year, and we're able to, that'll be completed under this current fiscal year. It's about uh, forty thousand dollars. We're um, we're evaluating, yeah, depending on what comes out of that, um, and that is expected to come back to you on June 11th, um, but depending on what comes out of that and the recommendation from the council, that could be you know, anywhere from, I would say, um, you, know, you could say, let's not do anything, and that wouldn't have a budget impact, or you could say, let's go do a, a task force and have a consultant lead that, and that could be you know, in the range of $250,000. Um, that would be more than what we have um, allocated in this fund, and so then we would be looking to see where does that uh, funding come from. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, Vice Mayor Green. I just wanted to know if you could provide, when, when you have this, the item that's reduced programs that trigger specialized legal, legal support, can you just provide a little bit of clarity around that? Sure, so um, in looking at the past five years or so, we've spent between roughly about 30,000 and about 90,000, about 35,000 I think was the low end and about 90,000 on um, things like, uh, a big part of that is our CEQA review. So we have a contract with Remy Moose Manley out of Sacramento and um, they supplement the work that uh, we have with our city attorney's office and um, provide some of that technical expertise in review of um, uh, the um, technical reports or the environmental impact reports or uh, mitigating negative declarations and so forth. So they provide consulting services um, in that regard. We also um, work with our economic development department to um, review proposals. For example, um, we've got a number of projects coming in right now that are proposing state density bonus and um, use of the state density bonus in ways that um, uh, we haven't, um, uh, necessarily had here before. For example, in the downtown, there's a floor area ratio cap instead of a dwelling units per acre cap. And the state density bonus is um, used primarily, typically, to increase the number of dwelling units per acre. And so that, that account would allow us flexibility to consult with some of those experts um, that um, we work with through our economic development department to say, 
all right, um, how do we apply this? And what are the different ways that, uh, that this is applied um, in different jurisdictions throughout the state so that we can have the best set of information that's one, legally defensible, and that two, provides the council with uh, a fair amount of information on the options for how they can approach those situations. So those are just a couple of examples of the kind of work that we do. The vast majority of it is that CEQA review. Um, so when projects come in and we've got um, questions, um, we can ship that out and say, hey, can you help us out with this technical analysis? Thanks. Yeah, and I'd just also like to um, kind of reiterate or, or also agree with what Council Member Crone said around the rental inspection program and trying to think about ways that we can cut costs around that if it can go to complaint-based whether that will help shift some of the costs with that program, because I know I noticed there's a number of different line items um, for different levels of funding, and the one that's under expenditures by activity, the, the inspection services is around two million, and so just wondering, and, and then code enforcement um, also comes in almost at a million across two different fund types, so mm -hmm. it would be interesting to see whether or not that might be an area where we can see some cost savings. So, um just a couple comments on that. Um, one, um, we are happy to look at um, how that program could evolve. I think you know there are some pros and cons of going different ways, um, and um, it, we can discuss those further at a later time. I just want to um, to articulate that the rental inspection program, uh, the rental inspection service, it does uh, it's cost recovery. So all of the participants in uh, all of the rental owners pay an annual fee and that goes to fund the cost of the services that we provide. So we've got two uh, inspectors and one technician. And so those, um, those costs are all um, offset by revenues that are brought in by that rental inspection service um, annual fee. So. If we, so I just want to be clear, there there wouldn't necessarily be a savings, even if, if we cut, like, you know, if, if we approach that program differently and there were uh, fewer costs, that would just mean fewer costs going to the um, the rental owners. And, and right now a single family home, I believe is around $68 a year, something along those lines. Um, and then if you've got multiple units, it actually scales down from there. So the first one is larger and then each one is, is substantially smaller following that. Um, and we've got, Sarah, I'd like to clarify one thing. Sorry, I just wanna clarify for uh, Council Member Cummings' last comment. The inspection services is building and safety at two million and then rentals to 2304, which is for next fiscal year, about 401,000. The name's a little confusing, so just wanna clarify that. Thank you. And you gotta do building inspection for buildings under construction. You gotta go do those. So your reduction there is really in, well, I guess you asked questions about the rental inspection. That's self-funding anyway. The rental inspection is self-funding, yes. Um, by and large, I share others' concerns with um, protecting to the greatest extent possible customer service for projects in the works. And uh, my one question is, um, I understand we're moving incrementally to uh, online plan check and so forth. Do you see that contributing some efficiencies that free up staff for more personal interactions you're smiling. <laughs> I'm smiling. I know that was the it's, a, it's a great question because we're, we're actually going through a lot of that analysis right now. And what I'm hearing from our team is that um, they may need a dedicated person to sort of manage that intake. And so it may shift some resources from the counter to reviewing those plans as they come in electronically to to having some of the services that we currently provide at the counter where you know we're flipping through and making sure an application is complete and able to be submitted, that that would have to actually be back of house where you know we're getting those in and they're reviewing those electronically. It's certainly something that we wanna do both from an environmental perspective and from a, a customer convenience perspective and so we're working on that. But um, 
there are there are some efficiencies like routing plans will be substantially easier but um, we are going to have the same amount of work in terms of um, reviewing and, and sort of the gatekeeper exercise <laughs> of reviewing plans up front and making sure that yes you've got everything um, in order to go ahead and accept that plan nonetheless it does seem like long run there's a improvement in customer service they don't have to drive down absolutely wait around for an hour or whatever and it is. and huge printing costs i mean some of these plan sets are hundreds of pages when you're when you're looking at big buildings in the downtown you know you could easily have 100 plus pages of a plan set and so that adds up really quickly mm -hmm. at four or five six dollars a sheet so this sounds like a work in progress yes the, yes the move to online it is, so. and we're, we're starting small, mm -hmm. um, looking at um, some of the, the small applications and planning, which have you know, fewer reviews, and then moving to uh, the smaller applications and building. And something I remember from a previous era was um, when the economy slowed, less building was going on, and there was, that was an opportunity to, to reduce some staff. It seems to me the building scene is pretty busy right now. Um, how? How is your staffing? My question there is, um, when the building rate picked up in the past and we didn't have the staff in, currently hired, we had to bring in outside plan checkers. And so um, just in order to move things in a timely fashion, so do you have the staffing now? Um, are, you, are you fully staffed? Do you see part of this uh, contracted staffing support was to fill gaps or do special projects. I guess my question is, um, what are your predicted needs or your special project needs? How, how do those things weigh in? Sure, so we are extremely busy right now in both the planning um, project review and the building plan check and inspection uh, worlds. Um, we have a significant number of vacancies in our building division. We've been unsuccessful at um, getting candidates for a wide variety of reasons. Um, you know, the um, competitiveness with the public sector and private sector um, and um, just the industry itself is experiencing challenges. All of those are, are contributing to us. You know, I think we had, we had three applicants to, for one of our recent uh, recruitments and none of them met the minimum qualifications. Um, so that gives you an idea of why we're actually bringing in even more um, consultants than we would otherwise um, be bringing in. Um, it, what it amounts to is you know, an inspector out there who um, probably you know, would need an hour to be doing a, a really incredible job. They're out there and they're, they're moving fast. They're out there for 45 minutes. Um, and rather than being able to, to say, you know what, this is, this is what you need to do to get this to meet the, to conform. Uh, this is how you need to construct it. They say, you know, follow the plans, call me when it's ready. Um, not, not bad service, just not the level of service that we would hope to have if we were able to get fully staffed. Um, so um, we do have some of those vacancies right now. There are ups and downs, and, um, it, and that's one of the reasons why it's good to keep some contractual support in our budget is because uh, if, if there is a downturn in the economy, then we're not having to uh, cut our actual positions. We can um, cut uh, the uh, consultant budget and still um, keep our people on board. And also, to the extent you have three vacancies, you absolutely need the contracted staff in order to get the work done, but you've got salary savings. That's, so. that's exactly what we're doing now is we're using that salary savings and we've come back with a budget adjustment to, to switch those from one account to another. Okay, and then um, just in general, I do uh, in general support the rental inspection program. It's, it's self-funding and my own experience with it has been um, helpful and reasonable. So, okay, great. Yeah. great. Okay, Councilmember Brown, do you have any? Yeah, I just uh, concur with my colleagues about uh, my opposition to reducing public counter support and phone and email support. 
public, I think, you know, having had enough uh, messaging from constituents who, and it generally the, the ones that we hear, there's concern about non-responsiveness, it comes from planning, and I know there's probably a lot of reasons for that, so I'm, no judgment there. It's just to say, I think that's an important uh, service, and we don't want to um, reduce it any further. Um, so agreed, and then I also agree about a longer term conversation about the rental inspection program, uh, given that it's not necessarily going to trigger any budgetary changes right now. I just I just want to say I, I support that conversation um, and want to flag that for the future. Do we have one last comment? Yes. Uh, I think we're not talking about eliminating staff support. You've talked about some Super cuts, tech. and that's what I want to get a better idea. Sure. How much pain can we stand? So I, 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 I think that's where it's, we're going. It's a, it's a very valid question. I think what we would be doing is, you know, the amount of time that we have dedicated to inspectors, what we, the, the primary implication here for our customers would be the amount of time that we have inspectors dedicated to the counter may need to be reduced. And so if people are looking for that technical expertise, that's where um, the, uh, the folks who are on the counter um, may have a limited amount of time. They could still come in and get um, some of their questions answered, but if they had highly technical questions, um, if we were cutting back substantially on consultants, those folks may need to be working on some of the paying customers' requests as opposed to the free services that we provide at the counter. But we can certainly do a, a closer evaluation of that and give you some more specifics on, in terms of how many hours we currently have that service available and the types of reductions that um, may be um, resulting from cuts to the consultant's budget. And just the final follow-up. Um, in looking at ways to to make it more efficient, um, something like just booking a half hour appointment, come in for consultation. I mean, ways yeah, I, to use the I appreciate the, yeah. that suggestion, and I think um, you know it's it's a concern of ours as well. And as we take a closer look, we can see you know are there opportunities to cut elsewhere um, such that you know there are even fewer impacts to the customers. Oh, Councilman, how did you? Thanks. Um, Lee, I was just wondering about the uh, reduction of programs that trigger specialized legal support. How does that play itself out if we're not going to go out and get the extra CEQA and um, environmental review that we need? Are we going to get it in-house? In um, some of that could be in-house. The other thing that could happen with that is you know, we may need to come back to the council if, uh, and, and as I mentioned, there's been a big range. Okay. It depends on the project. So, so we spent 35,000 three years ago and got it, got it. spent 90. Thanks. So it, we may need to come back if we say, hey, we've got these things and we need that legal support. And with okay. respect to the rental inspection ordinance, um, I'm, I'm looking for a shift of focus. I'm looking for it to be pro-tenant, and I think we can still collect fees and still support the program, but a different orientation that, that, that isn't the, the way it's been going for, for tenants, because it's not been going well for tenants. Um, so I'm just, that the, I, again, I, I would, um, how do we want to do this? I, I put out four points that I would like to pursue, that I would like to, the staff to come back to us on and say, you know, to, to revamp, to relook at the rental inspection ordinance. Do, is that consensus or do I need to make a motion or how does that go? I think that, you know, um, in regards to uh, the purpose of today, I think it could come back at a future time for a policy discussion. Um, but for today, we're looking at specific things. I don't know, Marcus or uh, Tony. And, and from my lens, I'm trying to differentiate between is there a budget difference or is that a policy change? Yeah, well, I don't see the 40,000 that CDBG, um, uh, it's it's missing here on the budget. Did, did, didn't we leave 40,000 for code compliance from CDBG? Yes, it's not in the planning that would be in the CDBG funding. Economic development. So, when, so I mean, that, that would be a, a savings if we move some of the code enforcement from the above column where it says code enforcement 71,000 and we put the 40,000 would be a savings. Yeah. Okay. I think, okay. So in, for today's purposes, it sounds like, you know, if we could maybe reserve some of the policy discussion or direction, I guess you could do a motion if you wanted to get direction at this time, but 
I, I think, or you could work uh, with staff and with other council members at a future time to bring an item forward. But to get us through an additional four departments, uh, proposed cuts, as well as some ideas for our staff for today's purposes of the budget hearing, I think I'd like to keep us oriented on that, personally. I, I, then I'll just make a quick motion and, and have, and it's for yeah. staff to come back to us for information. Yeah. Um, and if there's a potential savings at all in, in any of the um, rental inspection stuff, and it would be to shift the program to complaint-based only to codify SB 1226 that was adopted last uh, year, allowing the enforcement of codes in effect at time of construction, maintain landlord fees to fund the program, and structures should be uh, brought up to code at the point of sale. Okay. Okay, so there's a motion by Council Member Crone. Did, no, I'm good. Okay. Is there a second at this time? A second. Okay, second by Council Member Glover. <coughs> All right. Any further? And this is asking staff for direction. Okay, Council Meyer, Council Member Myers. So staff would come back with, with the report on all of and those items. And if there's items, any savings there's um, any to savings. be had. Okay. So it's not a. It's the motion is not directing the changes in the program. Itself. No, they would come come back to us, and then if that time, if the council so wished, we could change it. Okay. Does it feel something that you could research for us? And yes, absolutely. I appreciate that it's it's request for an analysis because uh, we've got lots of thoughts to share on this. And we've talked about I know. some. Yeah. We'll okay. So yeah, Thanks. if there's any savings, you can report back. Okay, so we have a motion that council members. Just clarity, it's not a uh, specific direction, it's just direction for information. Right. So, of savings, particularly as it relates to savings. Okay, any uh, further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, oh, sorry, I meant to say aye at the time. <laughs> okay, so that passes unanimously. Okay, thank you, Lee. Thank I you. think we'll take a five minute uh, transition break before we get into parks and recreation. Um, so we have parks and rec, finance, HR and IT, community support and then council. So we have a lot of discussion still ahead of us. So hopefully we can continue to power through maybe about a five minute break. And
got our park superintendent and recreation superintendent back uh, in the back as well to answer any questions. So um, wanted to uh, kick this off really quickly in terms of our process and putting these together. This was a, obviously, I think, to echo a sentiment from uh, other departments, a very challenging exercise to go to. I think we all feel uh, very lean and, and efficient in what we do. So going through this exercise certainly was a challenge to do, but I wanted to recognize um, our staff that went through this process. Um, this was not simply our administrative staff bringing these recommendations. This was our full uh, Parks and Recreation team, operations team that really kind of weighed in on these items to bring them to you. So this is kind of a full team effort uh, in terms of uh, what is in front of you all uh, today. So um, I will really uh, just start to, to kind of go through the list. Um, the finance department did a really great job um, sort of condensing and summarizing a lot of these points that you see on the slide. Um, in front of you. Um, in terms of our reduction submittal, um, we actually have a number of uh, additional items um, beyond just these here, and I'll reference those um, after I go through these as, as well, and I'll try to reference some of the numbers um, as, as I go through here. So I'll try to move relatively quickly, but happy to open it up to any questions uh, that you all might have. Um, so on the first one here, the delay wharf and museum uh, maintenance, this is really a couple items that are kind of combined um, on the full detailed submittal that you all see. Um, the total there between the two is approximately $70,000 between wharf maintenance, and that includes the surfing museum maintenance as well. Uh, on the reduction of parks fencing support and maintenance, that really comes from our central zone, so we're broken up into geographic zones, uh, and this really pertains uh, most appropriately to um, ball field fencing, uh, Harvey West, for example, so that the portion of fencing that's represented on the slide here, that's about $15,000, but that comes from a, a broader item that's from professional and technical services, um, which is 52,300 is what we've shown in our, our reduction submittal. So that includes fencing, but also irrigation, tree work, park improvements, a whole slew of, uh, of things um, in the professional and technical services um, uh, components within our budget. Uh, reduce water and until brownout uh, areas. So this really pertains to our golf course in particular. Um, we, uh, in our submittal, included golf course water reductions of $40,000, uh, and that literally just means not watering, not irrigating certain areas, uh, letting those areas brown out uh, in terms of the turf. So it's a $40,000 proposed reduction. Uh, elimination of uh, youth museum programs. Uh, this is, um, really uh, toward, um, let's see, uh, funds appropriated toward the Natural History Museum. This is essentially a grant that we provide the Natural History Museum to provide uh, education, environmental education um, and youth programs in Pogonip. Uh, so this amount is $20,000, so we uh, included that. Again, uh, very tough one for us to, to sort of reconcile with cutting, but I think in all things considered, uh, one where we uh, would need to rely on the museum to raise that money to, to offer those programs um, up in Pogonip. Uh, the next one, reduce staff and temps uh, for trail, sports officials, summer camp. This again is kind of a combined item um, from a couple areas. So this inc includes our trails crew, our youth trails crew um, and interns. So that item uh, is about 40, a little over $40,000 that would be a cut. Um, which represents about 50% of that program. So we would reduce our uh, youth trails uh, and interns program by about 50%, uh, which is $40,000. This also includes um, our sports officials and summer camp uh, temporary staff. That amount is about $27,000. And what that means is that that would be a, a really a staff reduction um, uh, so that we potentially would reduce one week of our summer camp. Uh, we would also reduce the number of officials that we have assigned to, to like adult softball leagues, for example. So down from two officials to one official per game. That would also uh, reduce some of the staff that we have at those um, adult and youth athletic events. Um, so from kind of, a, again, a customer service standpoint, from a safety standpoint, and just kind of the user experience, again, fewer staff, fewer officials in terms of uh, uh, adult sports um, uh, and temp staff. Let's see, go down, uh, reduce trail and related cleanup. So this um, encompasses a couple different items. This is vegetation management. Um, so $30,000 reduced resource management uh, for our green belts, trails, stormwater, watersheds, erosion control, and invasive plant removal. 
Uh, this would also reduce our camp cleanup budget um, uh, by $7,500. That's a reduction uh, in resources available for uh, uh, camp cleanups in parks and open spaces. And I believe that's the, the total, total representative uh, amount from the trail and related cleanup uh, items. Um, go, uh, the last one here, eliminate summer ads, uh, that's advertising and bus trips. Um, this falls under our uh, events and youth category. This is about $13,000. And this eliminates commercial advertising uh, for a lot of our summer events. Uh, July is Parks and Rec Month, um, and it eliminates one of our summer bus trips uh, as well. So um, as I mentioned, we have a number of items beyond what is uh, shown here as well. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of those and the dollar amounts tied to those. Um, consultants and technical services, so this amount is approximately $55,000. Um, this is a reduction in consultant services, uh, so it reduces our opportunities for uh, hiring uh, grant uh, application writers, uh, biologists for environmental review in our parks and things like that. Uh, so that's consultants and technical services. Um, class reductions, um, we have a budgeted amount uh, to essentially uh, to pay our class instructors and educators. That amount is about $14,000. Um, and so our class reductions, we propose that as well. We would reduce the number of total classes uh, that we offer, many of which are at the Loudon Nelson Community Center. Uh, going down the list, repair services and materials, 24,000. Uh, this is a reduction of repair services. Um, operational equipment, maintenance, construction, facility materials, uh, park signage, and, and things like that. And then finally, landscape materials. And you could really probably group this into the reduced trail and related cleanup item. This is an additional 22,000. Um, and this is just a reduction in budget uh, for our ability to maintain and upgrade uh, park landscapes. Um, uh, kind of natural areas uh, within parks. So very quick summary there. Um, uh, thank you for kind of listening to that, that quick summary, but happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and um, maybe go down the line again, but maybe we'll start here in that way and then there in that way to mix it up a bit. So Vice Mayor Cummings, if, if you have any at this time, if you don't, that's okay. We can <laughs> come back to you. Please come back. I, I, no I guess I, I can just say for now that it's, I think this is one of the areas that I care a lot about. And so seeing reductions in programs for youth and programs that help maintain our environment are reductions that I don't really want to see happen. So I'm hoping that we can look in other areas to find places where we can make further reductions to try to maintain as many of these as possible. But thank you for bringing forward all these proposals. I just mentioned really quickly, these are, again, this was a, a challenging process to go through. I think these are sort of the, the lowest hanging fruit, if you will, in terms of opportunities for us without just completely shutting down operations, uh, closing facilities, closing parks, or just shutting down programs. So the, we, this was our, our best effort in sort of, um, forgive the phrase, sort of nickel and diming um, where we could to, to reach the target. I will, I will ask a couple questions real quick, actually. With regards to the, the wharf maintenance and the museum, what are those, um, what would those maintenance items be? Yeah, I may uh, rely on our uh, park superintendent here. The wharf maintenance uh, is just deferred facility maintenance. So a lot of the buildings that we own, the restaurants and so forth, uh, but also the public restrooms and things like that, it would probably just be deferred maintenance on, on those type of facilities. That's the bulk of this number. That's 67,000 of the approximately 70,000 that I referenced. Uh, the surfing museum is much smaller. I think that overall budget is probably in the ballpark of seven or eight thousand dollars. Or I'm sorry, I, I actually shouldn't say that because I don't want to. I don't want to make a mistake there. But the amount that we propose cutting is 1,700. So a very small amount. Um, Fifty thousand total. Yeah. So just a small reduction. About 1,700 dollars is what we proposed. I think with one of the things that I would um, want to see is potentially at, at a minimum keeping the, the funding in for the Surf Museum because it seems like it's such a small amount. Um, and then, you know, going through and kind of looking at some of these other items as well. With regards to the, um, the golf course and the brownout, um, given that we've gotten, we've had, you know, an incredible amount of rain this year, do you have any sense in terms of like time to brown out? Um, of the golf course and what the timing might be. Ask uh, Park Superintendent Travis Beck to come up. 
Tony. Um, so within the uh, overall golf budget, we have close to three quarters of a million dollars budgeted for water. And that um, is due to the really the increased water rates that we've experienced in recent years. That's a high end estimate, which would allow us to fully irrigate the course in normal or you know, somewhat droughty conditions, not a drought emergency. So the reductions we're proposing of 40,000 to that amount really come with somewhat of a gamble. If we have a wet year, as we did this year, then uh, we wouldn't be spending that full amount anyway, and the reductions would be actually not noticeable. If, however, we got into that you know, dryish sort of year, then we would be um, sort of expanding the areas that we already brown out, which are sort of in uh, the fairways and non-playable areas, um, or allowing the course to go dormant potentially at a, at a point in the, the dry season. I also have another question with regards to the golf course. When do you, when do you all actually water the, the greens or the, the course itself? Like, do you do it during the day? Do you do it during the night? Uh, we do it in off hours when, when people aren't playing there. Councilman Matthews? Um, I just want to um, reference the, um, the question about the uh, surfing museum. So if I understand you, what you're proposing is it has in the budget, I, I'm, I'm not open to the budget page, um, and I'll find it, but a budget of 50000 you're suggesting a cut of 1700 That's correct. So again, you said you wanted to preserve the surfing museum. It's there. Mm -hmm. And this is just for the maintenance mm -hmm. of it. So, and that's, I believe, staffed largely by volunteers, isn't it? Uh, city staff and volunteers, yeah. Combination. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, there, that's why it's, I keep raising <laughs> the question. It's how much money out of how much total, mm -hmm. and I will find the page and reference it. Um, page, t I'll, I'll find it. Um, and I appreciate the statement that this is, these are the nibbles around the edges that you think you can achieve. I don't think any of us want to do any of those things. Um, so I'll learn more, but it's, it seems to me these are, none of these are a huge item in and of themselves, but they will add a share of it. There'll be some tweaking. One of the questions I have when you talk about um, reducing course officials and summer camp staff and, and other things too. I know this is of in interest to you, but the um, potential for really increasing our use of volunteers well of interest and support for Parks and Rec. So any comments on, on how that might offset a bit of this? It, it couldn't offset all of it. Yeah, it's a good question. I think that's a, a big priority for us as well. I th I'm not familiar historically with how we've engaged volunteers for officials and supported these type of things. I know Rachel, if, if our recreation superintendent wants to chime in, but I think that's a big priority for us uh, on the recreation side, but potentially on the park side as well. And what I mean by that is uh, like our adopt a park program. So can we help support with maintenance and some of these things with those sort of programmatic elements, but I'll have Rachel chime in on the, on the athletic side. I don't want to set unrealistic expectations for anyone. Yeah. So Rachel Kaufman, Recreation Superintendent. So as far as the summer camp programs you're probably familiar with, we do have a junior leader volunteer right. program yeah. um, that does utilize volunteers. That's a kind of lower level of um, support. Where uh, So for our temporary staff or paid staff, we want people that do have experience working with children, as that's really important to keep those numbers. I think with sports officials, that's something we could explore. But again, you just want to make sure you have qualified people yeah, that um, have uh, that background. So, But we do, for that junior leader program, have volunteers. And then again, uh, for the, uh, I'm just thinking of ways to offset. Um, for the adult leagues, um, have you recently looked at fees? Adjusting fees in order to be able to cover those costs. Yeah. Hi, Angela Gray. We're getting the whole team up here. Yeah. The analyst. Um, we did look at fees in 2017 across the board, and the um, sports supervisor who's in tune with all the neighboring league fees and all those sorts of things, we made sure that we were in line with all the other uh, neighboring agencies. So we have looked at that recently. <laughs> Look again. <laughs> Thanks. Councilman Brown? 
Thank you. And uh, the museum, just for reference, is in the Parks and Rec. It's um, PK page 10 in the Parks and Rec. I just have to get there. There. Yeah. It's just for, yeah. for it's there under museum. It doesn't say surfing museum, so if you want to find it, it's just below aquatics pool programs. And I did have that question because the city owns the Museum of Natural History as well. So I assumed that that was in reference to the surfing museum. It says, yeah. yeah. The 50, 49, 182. So I think that's it anyway. Um, yeah. Sorry, but do you want me to just clarify the museum budget? It might help if everyone's going to have questions on it. I can just go over it really quickly. Um, yes, the museum budget is the surfing museum. Um, the, Na the natural history museum is, um, they have their own thing going on. But just to kind of touch on what's in the surfing museum budget, um, it's primarily, uh, there's some temporary staff hours in there. Those are the people that actually open and close the surfing museum. Um, that's the temporary staff budget makes up uh, just over half of the museum budget. And then the rest is really um, water, sewer, and refuse, um, electricity uh, for the building, uh, some alarm monitoring. We have an alarm out there. And that's pretty much the entire budget. Um, there's just a very small amount uh, for miscellaneous supplies um, and services, things that might come up that are unexpected. We have about $4,000. So it's one of those ones, um, like I think we're doing across the department, is sort of hoping that uh, something doesn't go terribly wrong when we're chipping away at these uh, budgets. But that's what's in there. Is that helpful? Or? Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. I, um, I don't really have questions about that. I just wanted to clarify where it is. Um, so. I'll just say as a general comment, I I don't, it's really hard for me to support any cuts in the Parks and Rec budget. As we know, Parks and Rec in tough times is the first to get cut. Um, and, you know, and often we we don't make up those um, those cuts in the when times are better. So I have a really hard time cutting anything from Parks and Rec, and particularly when we're talking about youth employment and you know small amounts that actually um, put uh, youth to work. I mean, they spend that money in the community. There's sales tax, etc. There's other benefits um, that can't be quantified for for their having um, access to those programs. So I just really have a hard time supporting any cuts, with the exception of. The golf course. Um, so um, I did owe the comments that have been made by my colleagues um, with respect to looking at the fee structure for um, for leagues and all of that. I, I I mean I just think given that we subsidize the De La Viega golf course, I'm, I'm real okay with uh, the water, the proposal for brownouts. Um, but I also think it's time to reevaluate the fee structure for the golf course. We subsidize at the tune to the tune of $300,000. That'd go a long way to plugging the, the hole in our budget right now in the general fund. Um, so I'm, you know, I'd like to see if others would, would consent or, and or if a majority of my colleagues would like to see that come back to us relatively soon because I think that um, will help um, buffer the Parks and Rec budget for this year. It just needs to happen, <laughs> I think. Um, so um, I, th I think that's all I have for now. <clears throat> yep, I, I think on the golf course really quickly, and again, happy to dive into that, answer more questions uh, either now or later this evening, however that uh, works out best. One thing I think that's really important to us that we've talked about internally is, is really creating essentially a, like a five-year business plan on the golf course. A lot of different, a uh, lot of different pieces to that puzzle, um, and so I think um, that that subsidy is is a big chunk. Certainly, um, water is uh, the park superintendent mentioned is a huge component to that. But I think kind of the most comprehensive uh, sort of view of the golf course and kind of where we're headed and what that could look like, we think could be in the form of like a business plan that we could bring back to the the city council. Um, in terms of sort of cost recovery targets and really what the numbers uh, look like and, and what that means. I appreciate that and that's yeah. great. I just, at the same time that we're talking about cutting youth employment positions right here and now, thinking about, you know, five years down the road, um, it's for the golf course to get um, subsidy free. It's, it's just hard to, for me to think about in terms of the values that, that I hold and the mm. public I represent. So. 
Councilor Ryan. Can you speak, I guess, a little more to that subsidy? So I'm just, I'm just trying to understand a little more. I know I know there is, you know, the Parks Commission, so I'm just trying, you know, but I know we were renegotiating leases and some other agreements as well as Shakespeare and just trying to understand a little bit more broadly what, when we, we talk about that subsidy. Yeah, and I'll ask the team here to jump in if I, I, if I make it, any errors I know here. some of it's water, so. Yeah, so a big a big chunk is water. Three quarters of a million dollars um, uh, annually is water uh, out of that budget. But um, so in the budget, you'll see um, really our annual our annual budget for the golf course is approximately two million. It's a little over two million dollars. The the revenue that comes in from the golf course, which really is one of our larger revenue generators of any of our operations within Parks and Recreation, um, there are a lot of opportunities with that. And so you'll see the trends over time, over the past five or six years, that that subsidy has been anywhere from 300,000 to um, what we put in the budget, the proposed budget for 2020, is up to a million dollar subsidy. And so I, I wanna just kind of pull that out and, and hit that head on. And the reason I say that, or want to recognize that is because that that is the um, the sort of the fail safe number. That's the that's the very conservative number that we put in there that we could subsidize it to that degree. Now, if you look at last year, the actuals, the uh, so not the budget, but the actual expenditure and the actual revenue, that spread is about three hundred thousand dollars. And if you look at the years previous to that, uh, it's in that same ballpark, three hundred and forty two thousand, three hundred and fifty nine thousand. Um, so that's that's the approximate subsidy um, uh, uh, in those years uh, between the actual expenditure and actual revenue. Now, when we're looking at revenues, we're lo that's the golf course, but that's also um, kind of the sum of the of the revenues that we bring in from the golf course. So that's disc golf um, and other sources of revenue from uh, the golf course and kind of the multi-use nature uh, of the golf course. Um, what I would say, I think, in terms of the golf course, um, again, being a revenue generator, is if we didn't operate it as a golf course, we wouldn't necessarily have that source of revenue. So when we're bringing in a you know, million and a half dollars in revenue per year now, um, I think we have a lot of opportunities to increase that. Um, if we didn't operate it as a golf course, I think we would still have very high budget dollars to maintain that property, to preserve that property um, without the revenue side of it. So my concern, in talking kind of long-term uh, sustainability, financial sustainability, uh, my uh, my fear, my red flag, if you will, is not having that revenue, but still a big expenditure. And my concern is that we would subsidize it by far beyond three to five hundred or more thousand dollars per year, just by maintain having to maintain uh, that property. Um, so that's a couple details there. H happy to yeah uh, defer to the city manager on this as well. Uh, just to add a little bit too, I mean the. The other approach that we've used, we've had a plan to, uh, and a goal to make the golf course uh, self-sufficient for some time. And it's been, you know, that subsidy has been reduced, you know, somewhat over the years. Uh, there are a number of factors that, that play into that. Um, and we've done some work uh, in terms of the fee structure, in terms of the, we've actually cut the maintenance staff in the golf course in the past. Um, and so, uh, and we expect to have some debt service that'll be paid off. And uh, said the Parks Department has this plan to uh, try to eliminate it uh, here. And I think the challenge is that uh, it can't be done, you know, in one year overnight without some dramatic risks and or cuts. So for example, if you wanted to do it on the uh, expenditure side, you'd have to cut and lay off maintenance workers. Um, uh, would be, because that's the really where the costs are on the city side. Um, and then, uh, alternatively, you could uh, raise uh, the fees, but that doesn't mean that uh, people would pay them and necessarily that would increase revenue. You, uh, the concern is, I think, if the fees are raised uh, in a way that's not uh, competitive, it actually wouldn't result in increased revenue. So that's that's the challenge uh, with respect to, to, to the golf course. Again, I think everybody agrees that to the extent that it could be self-supporting, we should do it. It's one of those that we have the opportunity to do that, but. It's not something that could be done you know, in one year necessarily. I think quickly to build on that too, I think on the expenditure side, so water is a big, is almost half of the, the budget up for the golf course. So we're taking steps currently. So our, I'll say that our water consumption has not increased, uh, but the water rates have increased, which is the result uh, in that high budget number. 
but what we're doing is actually working very closely with the water department to find ways to save water. So we have the, a well project uh, going in very soon. Um, and that's a project that pays for itself in, in about 14 months. So I think uh, there are a lot of opportunities for us to reduce water consumption and therefore reduce cost on this, getting, uh, getting us much closer uh, to that break even. I, yeah, I just, um, I guess I would just state that um, uh, having uh, recovered another museum in the community that was literally, um, the, the lights were turned off and we were left on our own and we now have built the organization back to a million dollars. It is not easy to, to recover from just shutting a facility down. There's a lot of services lost. I understand golf may not be for everyone, but there is a golf um, constituency, I think, in Santa Cruz. Uh, that is one of the few public golf courses left on the Central Coast. Um, and so I understand it's expensive and there's, and there's certainly subsidy and I'd like to just see a creative approach before we sort of say, and, and I'm, I frankly am also worried about losing jobs there. Um, so, um, and then just in terms of my other, um, so I just, just slow as we go. Um, it's a big target, but I think I think it's important to really understand the business uh, plan side of it. Um, overall, um, coming from a parks commissioner perspective, I know how much the department has worked on its budget, cutting costs, um, trying to get things um, as lean and mean as possible. I share your frustration. This is not the department that I want to see having to do cuts, um, and according to the chart we got, you are cutting the most because you're the most um, supported by our general fund. So again, when people are paying their taxes and being here as residents, um, this, is one of the, this is one of the places, this is the department nearest and dearest to everyone's hearts. And, um, you know, I'd love to, you know, personally I'd love the idea of trying to get our pool back. I mean, we're losing these public facilities that are really important to our youth, they're important to wellness, they're important to uh, our community. And um, so I'll let it go at that today, but um, uh, I, I would like to relook at some of, some of what you've come up with because I'm not completely sure that's where I want all the cuts to come from. Thank you. Councilor McClicker. Hello, Tony. Uh, so a lot of interesting things to look into here. Um, some notes that I put on my page is that, uh, so for the wharf maintenance, can you talk about that? Ask Travis to come back up. Thank you. As, uh, as Dr. Elliott alluded to, the budget that would be cut is the materials that we use for ongoing maintenance projects. So that includes everything from the actual structure of the wharf with the, uh, the pilings, the, uh, the decking that goes on top of it, money that we use for paving projects, for repair projects, to the, uh, the buildings, roofing, uh, the restrooms that are mentioned, the, the fencing that surrounds the wharf, really the whole physical structure of the, the wharf itself and then the adjacent beach areas. Okay, thank you. Uh, and with the reduced parks fencing support and maintenance. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Because fencing in parks is an issue that I have in general. Um, and so fencing support, what does that look like? And Yes, yeah, so the $15,000 figure is not entirely for fencing. That's uh, one of the items that would be affected and those are fencing contractors that we hire in the central zone uh, primarily to maintain our ball field fencing at Harvey West Park. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, and I was just doing some research a little earlier uh, with regards to brownout of the golf courses in just different areas of California. Uh, do you see any drawback as the Parks Department to having a brown golf course? I think it's largely an aesthetic item. Uh, I think to some degree, you know, as Travis mentioned, we'll look to do that in areas that are, you know, non-greens, non-fairways, kind of off uh, toward the, the woods edge, if you will. I think, I mean, the, the only thing I could think of is potential f fire risk, but I don't even, I want to be careful about overstating that. I, I just think um, uh, that could be a small piece of it, but I think primarily it's just aesthetics. Okay, yeah, thanks, because uh, in the research that I did, it doesn't show any negative 
aspects per se as both sides what you mentioned, the aesthetics that go along with it and that balls actually get a little bit longer roll on the fairway if it's brown, so that might uh, help some people's games. Uh, so I definitely support um, reducing water and looking at how we can do that, especially knowing that there's $750,000 approximately every year that's spent on water and our desire to conserve water and uh, my concerns about the golf course not being the most equitable way to distribute those funds. Um, definitely not down for eliminating youth museum programs. We need to get people involved. I did want to know the cost and impact associated with that. I'm sure that'll be in the report we get for the second uh, meeting. Um, the reduced trails and related cleanups, what kind of volunteerism do you all implement with that work? Speaking more about the trails or the cleanup? Both. Uh, for the cleanup work, we have engaged a number of community partners in volunteering. For example, at Sycamore Grove, we held a, a large cleanup this fall that was largely volunteer-based. Uh, so it is an element, uh, but we don't do the majority of the work that way. We, we do it in-house or with contracted services. Um, and just really quick, um, and I, you mentioned it before, I believe, that this is specifically for camp cleanups, or is it cleanups for the community? Like, you know, like walking around and picking up trash or cleaning up trails so that they're more accessible and there's no debris or fallen wood or all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the, the, the volunteer project that I, I referenced was a camp cleanup uh -huh. in Sycamore Grove, so where we have a concentrated area of debris, then we can schedule a you know one day team project to take care of that. Uh -huh. Do you have volunteerism for, uh, and it, do, does any of this money, I guess is a better way to phrase it, is does any of this money go to maintaining trails and cleaning up parks as opposed to just camp destruction. Yeah, the, uh, the other piece is the, uh, the trail work, which we do, again, through a variety of means, contracted services, in-house work, and then volunteer work that's conducted. For example, we work with the mountain bikers of Santa Cruz who have regular dig days in our uh, open spaces where they'll bring in you know, anywhere from 10 to, to 50 volunteers uh, to do uh, trail improvements on the hiking as well as mountain biking trails in the open spaces. Great, I, I, I'm always, and I say this to every department where I think it's relevant, is the imp incorporation of community members in that volunteers uh, to bring down those costs associated with stuff. Um, that's it for now, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Pruitt. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the reducing, uh, the, the, the for trails, what is that, that? That's not maintaining the trails, or or what does that mean? Uh, are you, let's see, I'm trying to see how these are combined up here. Reduced trail and related cleanup, I believe. So that is the trails crew. That's our youth trails crew, um, and that is. So they're summer jobs, basically, or just. Uh, correct. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, it's our our teen intern program, trail maintenance program. Um, uh, that are really staffed by by youth and and um, yeah teen interns in the summer. Yeah, um, the uh, we, supposedly Parks and Rec had a Heritage Tree Fund letter from uh, Commissioner Brown. Did that get to us? I, I believe so. Yeah. We get it. Well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, how is that? How does that deal with the budget? Is that in there or? Yeah, so this is a good question. So the Parks and Recreation Commission, uh, we did a budget uh, review in the month of April at our April meeting. Uh, the commission decided to make a recommendation to city council to double our uh, current heritage tree uh, grant program budget from 25,000 to 50,000. Um, that was just sort of a, a, a broad recommendation from the commission. Um, that did not, we didn't factor that into, do we need to cut somewhere else or where would that additional cut come from? But I think just a broad statement uh, from the commission in terms of a recommendation to council to consider doubling that budget. So that's not in this budget right now? 20, that is not, 25. no. And um, as far as street trees go, I heard there was some idea about planting a bunch of trees up Bay Street. Um, we, we've got a program ongoing, yeah, we've planted, I don't know the number on Bay Street specifically, probably 70 or Somebody 80 or more trees. 500 redwood trees up Bay Street, is that true? 500 total for the, for the city this year. And is yeah. that included in the 15,000 in the budget? Yeah, those are already, yeah, in progress. I believe that's from, I think that's grant funded, yeah. 
set of Caltrans, I'll fire. And we were gonna do a like sort of like GIS uh, tree count. How is that going and where is it at? I've never seen the results of it or is it over or is it still happening? <laughs> it's, it's just getting started, which is why you haven't seen the results oh. yet. Um, so that was also funded through this CAL FIRE grant we received to uh, conduct a whole inventory. So we have finalized the RFP and that'll be going out shortly and uh, the timeline would be end of this year. Great, thanks. And I um, want to underline what Councilmember Myers said about the pool. I think that we really, I really want to see that something move forward and, and get the pool, you know, a much, you know, extended hours. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's there, it's maintained, but, um, you know, people aren't using it uh, or can't use it. Um, now I want to really dig into, could you put that um, uh, thing up? I want to dig into the golf course a little bit. Um, because I just, I just don't, uh, it just defies, you know, maybe we'll have to vote on this or something, but, you know, why the golf course can't pay for itself. And here's our fee structure right here. Um, and w why can't we, you know, rearrange some of these fees and cover the, the you said 300,000, although you said revenue 1.5 and I see 2.3 in expenditures, that's 800,000, not 300,000. Yes, so a couple questions there. So I think in 2018, the actuals, let me pull this up really quickly. Um, let's see, 2018 actuals, actual expenditure uh, at the golf course was 1,810,000. Uh, actual revenues in 2018, 1.468, 1,468,000. Uh, um, so a difference of 342,000 was that, that net. So we, we, so this, the new fees haven't taken effect yet, is that it? The, this that, that's correct. So what, what, on this screen here, the utility fees have taken effect. So the $4 utility fee uh, and the $2 utility fee for disc golf and for junior golfers. Uh, otherwise, the, the new rates have not taken effect. And what is that, uh, what's a, how's that been? Have we taken in more bunch of revenue or what, what, what does it look like? Can we you project from, out? Mm -hmm, yeah, from the utility fee this year, we've brought in approximately $96,000 from the rounds played. Um, and it has not impacted uh, our numbers negatively. And um, uh, the city manager mentioned about uh, competitive, you know, who are we competing with with this golf course? Where are people gonna go? Yeah, it's a good question. I think Pasa Tiempo is obviously our closest uh, neighbor, um, not a public course. What, what's a round cost at Pasa Tiempo? I think approximately 275. Two, 275, yeah, 75, I was gonna say 250. And what's a round cost here for us, 35? Is that what, am I reading that right? Or it ranges, 45? yeah. 45 for a non-member. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't see not getting that up higher. Uh, I, I, I'm all for maintaining the, the, the junior card. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think we should raise that at all, actually. Um, because I don't think two dollars is, you know, I, I'm all for young people playing golf, uh, but I think people who can pay for it should pay for it, and I would love to see this these fees up some more to cover the three hundred and forty-two thousand that we we're in the hole last year. Um, respectfully disagree with uh, my friend Br Martin Bernal about uh, you know five years. No, we we cannot wait five years. We we need to do it in one to two years. <laughs> we need to like make this money up because. Um, I don't support any of the cuts to the programs that you have come up with, and I, you know, and I, I appreciate the work that you've done, and I'm sure you've, you know, wrestled with this quite a bit. But some of those affecting the young people, I would prefer the, the golf course um, paying its its way, and it hasn't for a long time. And I think something dramatic. I mean, if there's a risk involved, let us know what the risk is. But I mean, it'd be up to the council to say, yes, let's get those fees up some more and cover that 342,000 or whatever we're projecting. It seems like we might be projecting more because of the, the water rates. It seems like this is the first year we're really carrying the water, right? Carrying the water, yeah, okay. Uh, under the new water rate? The full, the full cost, yeah. Uh, I don't believe so. I think it's been it's a third year. Third year, third year. Yeah. okay. So we do have a good idea of what, mm -hmm. and, and, and so if we project out the $4 uh, utility thing, does it seem like we're gonna cover that 750? No, not from the utility fee, not just from the utility fee. Uh -huh. uh, from an increased rate, potentially assuming that, that uh, uh, our number of rounds, which were 50,000 uh, last year, uh, stay consistent. Well, I would definitely ask to go back and, and bring this come back to us and take another look at the golf course fees and if we can um, deal with those numbers and, and get them up a little more and see how much we're talking about uh, we might lose a few rounds, but also we might gain some, some money to pay for itself, so. City Attorney Kandati, did you have something? 
I was just going to say that I think that uh, perfectly appropriate discussion and and for the council's consideration, but that feels to me like a separate agenda item specifically relating to golf course fees as opposed to adjustments of the budget. I suppose you could also make adjustments to the budget as to the level of uh, subsidizing the golf course, but what you're proposing sounds to me like a separate agenda item. Okay. Because so I, I would propose that we don't, um, unless unless the, the golf course is, is balanced, I wouldn't uh, want to even to, to fund this. I'd, I'd put it on hold and, and let's, let, let's, let's get it balanced. Okay. So, so if I'm hearing you correctly, Tony, um, Proceed with caution in regards to how to move forward with this specific component of this agenda conversation in regards to the financial kind of. Well, I, I just see um, setting of the amounts of fees or rates or charges as, as sort of a separate uh, discussion from you know, an overall budget funding discussion. Um, I think it's, it's fine in the context of the budget discussion. I don't, I don't have any problem with that at all. Um, but I think if that's the, the direction that the council is interested in going, it, it ought to agendize that as a separate discussion. Okay, yeah, that's well, great. I, I, would, I would prefer that too. Okay. I mean, if we, uh, my last question has to do with vehicles. I don't see uh, anything in the, uh, in the capital outlay. Is there no public, are you not buying any vehicles this year? That's a good question. It'd be through the Public Works Department, uh, through their fleet program in terms of those recommendations uh, that Mike Hopper and Mark Dettel referenced earlier. I don't know offhand. Travis, do you know? I think there are three or four uh, yeah. pickup trucks that were scheduled for yeah. replacement. Can you get us uh, just a list of those pickups? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Or, or any vehicles, actually. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So I just had a few uh, comments myself. Um, one, I just want to echo Councilmember Myers and Councilmember Crohn's um, interest in supporting the pool. And I think every budget hearing since I've been on council, I've been wanting to see how we can go about trying to get creative about that. So I think there's work to be done there. Um, it's hard to also say that at the same time of having to cut in you know, services and programs. Um, I will just also share um, sort of the sentiment by Councilmember Myers that sometimes when you do eliminate a program completely, it's really hard to get that back up and going. Um, and then in regards to just all programming, um, I, you know, I appreciate the trimming here and there, just to be mindful about trying, I mean, my interest just to kind of keep it broad would be to do as little as we can to um, not have an impact on programs um, and then kind of work around the edges in terms of the other stuff. And I know it's really difficult and um, your, you know, Parks and Rec is, does incredible things for our community. Um, so, I'll, I mean, I guess I'll just leave it at that for now in the interest of time. I know that we have a couple other council members with interest. So Council Member Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Council Member Myers. So. I know this is tedious um, to continue to be talking about the golf course. I'm so looking forward to the day when um, I don't feel like talking about it every time we have these kinds of budget discussions. Uh, I'm just gonna express my frustration that any time we raise the concept of the golf course becoming self-sustaining or um, not wanting to subsidize it, that the immediate reaction, the, res the replies we get uh, tend to tend towards, oh, well, if you want to close the golf course. And that is, uh, with all due respect to Council Member Crone, it sounded like you said, oh, well, so be it. But that is not my intention I, I didn't at say all. So be it. Okay. I, I said I, <laughs> on hold until we okay. get a balanced budget. So I, I have no interest in closing our public golf course. It is one. It is a beautiful golf course. A, you know, golfing for the people. I absolutely support it. I just think that it's given that we subsidize it. We don't subsidize a whole lot of other parks and rec functions in the same way to the same tune. And so I, I just, I want to say, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd be willing to make the motion if no one else is going to make it that we direct staff to come back with um, an analysis of, of increased green fees uh, or you know increasing uh, the share of cost uh, for maintaining De La Viega golf course um, from the, the um, consumer. So I'm not sure if I'm gonna get any support for that, but I wanna just make it as a motion. I'd like to see that come back as an agenda item to have a full discussion um, because I think there's uh, some real opportunity there and I don't wanna wait five years um, either. I'll second it. Okay, so a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. I know um, Councilmember Myers had additional comment on it. I did too. Okay, yeah. I just wondered, um, 
Councilmember Brown, in the kind of in the interest of sort of more of the global approach, would you um, accept a friendly amendment that fee structure and business plan um, sure. comes back so that we sort of get that global sort of evaluation? Okay. Sure. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I'll just add uh, because I, you know, again, I just want to get this out there. Um, you know, uh, um, our city manager, um, Martine, you suggested that this is something that can't be addressed in, in some, that's something, not something that can be done within one year. Um, the subsidy has been reduced. We're hearing it actually has increased for this fiscal year. Um, and it's not something that can be done in one year. This is something that has been talked about every year. I've been on the council and nothing has been done. That's why I'm trying to get a little bit more aggressive in um, demonstrating how interested I am in seeing this happen and hope that we can get support um, on the council to, to come back for that discussion. Thank you. Um, just really quickly, uh, just to be clear, you know, from the staff perspective, we, we want this to be self-supporting too. And if it could be done tomorrow, that would be incredible. That would be awesome. No one is opposed to making this be self-supporting as quickly as possible. Um, I'm just trying to uh, relay the staff work that's been done with the fee analysis and we did a fee study uh, and what I'm hearing is what uh, can reasonably be done. But we can look at that, uh, certainly. Again, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, no one is opposed to doing that. Um, and so our goal is to make this as self-supporting as quickly as possible. We'll go back and do the analysis and the numbers. And I'm just hearing that it, you know, it's just something that's not gonna happen. So I'm just relaying that, so just to be clear. Yeah. It sounds like you've been working on it and you're thinking maybe it would just be accelerating that process. Yeah, that's right. And just to be clear, I think on the, and uh, Angela's digging into this to be very specific, but in terms of, uh, I just wanna be clear, in terms of the, the budgeted numbers and then the actual numbers. So 2018, which is what we're looking up right now, the 2018 budgeted numbers showed probably an 800,000 to a million dollar subsidy. That's what we planned for in the budget to be safe. But the actuals, it was a $300,000 spread. So we saved a half million dollars. So even though for 19, fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 20, we're showing in the budget uh, a million dollar spread, a million dollar subsidy, that very well may come in, again, like $300,000 or something like that. So we're finding uh, these savings any way we can with, um, it, really any way we can, water savings to, to uh, personnel savings, uh, so on and so forth. So the other thing I wanna mention too is with, with the golf course discussion, obviously this is one operation within Parks and Recreation and I think a little bit, I don't wanna throw the pool under the bus here, <laughs> but I think as we're looking at the broader Parks and Rec budget, I would almost um, uh, recommend if I may respectfully yeah. that, that we look at sort of a, a business plan, if you will, at a variety of our different enterprises um, uh, within Parks and Recreation because really uh, we subsidize everything within Parks and Recreation. Um, and the subsidy that we provide at the golf course is actually one of the lower subsidies uh, that we provide. Uh, the pool, uh, if we ran the pool year round, it would be um, nearly a double, uh, double the amount of, of our actual subsidy of what we've provided um, uh, at the golf course. Now, again, we've got some work to do and we can come up with some creative ideas, but I wanna bring that broad context to the council so that we're not just looking at the golf course in a vacuum, but looking at everything, uh, different areas that we subsidize and where we can uh, diversify revenue within the department as a whole. Wonderful, I look forward to learning more about that. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings and then uh, Councilmember Matthews. Just one more comment with regards to the golf course. I think it'd be really good um, to also, because one of the things I heard earlier was that you all water when the golf course is not in use, but specifically is that during time, is that generally during the night or twilight or dusk hours? Yeah, I would think early, early morning and then twilight probably. Overnight. Overnight, yeah. okay, great. I was just curious because I know that a lot of water can be lost if we're watering during the day to evaporation. And so just making sure that that's also, you know, incorporated into how we're cutting costs and saving water. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Additionally, I wanted to, one more question I had was uh, the urgency with replacing the ball field lights and whether or not that could be something that could wait potentially a little bit longer. Yeah, that's a good question. So this pertains to our capital improvement uh, budget. I believe the, the Harvey West ball field lights uh, that are 30 years old or so, um, they, they, we worry about the safety of those lights um, and then talking about uh, an environmental impact. 
um, and energy use impact. Those lights are kind of, uh, they're old school uh, light bulbs, essentially burning coal. Um, <laughs> And so what we hope to do with those lights is uh, get, uh, replace those lights with new LED lights that are much more energy efficient, uh, but also uh, get them into a condition that's much safer. Um, they're old wooden poles that, that we would just worry about the general safety of those. So that's a big chunk within the, the capital improvement program. I think it's approximately, I think between seven and $800,000 uh, to replace those lights, um, but we would get some return on that with uh, energy savings and so forth. So. Can we wait? Um, possibly, but it's a really critical item for us. It'd be also really good to understand what those cost savings would be with regards to energy sure. savings by converting those now versus waiting. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Council Member Myers and then Council Member Brown and then Council Member Crone. <laughs> Sorry. Do you also? Very brief. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, uh, Director Elliott, I believe that you mentioned that. Um, uh, you mentioned something about grant writing, so I just wanted to double back on that. Did you mention that these cuts that are outlined would include removing the grant writing contract that I know you've been trying to get for three years? <laughs> that, that's correct, correct. Okay, um, so just a statement in that there is um, billions of dollars that were approved by the voters of California that are for parks and open space and environmental uh, without a grant writer, it's very unlikely that we're going to receive those funds. I know we get some per capita funds, but um, I just, again, again, when we're looking at your department in particular, um, those resources actually can be uh, a cost savings for some of the things like trails and other mm -hmm. things that we're talking about today. So I'd hate to see that, hate to see that get cut. Okay. Thanks. Council Member Crone, and then Council, I think, I believe Council Member Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Um. I want to follow up on uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. Uh, really would like to see those stats on what the new lights would show us versus the current bill that we get for electricity. And also, what would it take to do that project over a couple of years? Could you do half, could you spend half that money um, this time and do and the other half uh, next year? Um, the other thing is, where's the, the Quimby funds? Where are they located in this budget? It's uh, a good question. I may rely on uh, Angela for the Quimby funds um, in terms of the actual page and detail. They're um, a funding source for capital projects. I believe there's two CIP projects for Parks and Rec, about $95,000 in total using Quimby funds. They've already got uh, uh, some existing projects that are uh, have also got Quimby allocations. So is all that money, uh, the Quimby 95000 already spent, or can we backfill some of this uh, instead of doing there's these a, a new 95000 allocation recommended. So that can certainly be re reallocated. But is it spoken for already or where? where yes, it's those, already in for yeah. 2020 capital projects. Correct. It's for proposed new projects. What, what's that new project gonna be? One is the Cliff Street walkway. Uh, so there's kind of the, the wall that's collapsing on uh, Cliff Street where that tree sits. So it's uh, replacing that item. And then uh, skate park coping at Mike Fox. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, um, so with my my zeal to discuss the golf course, I um, I forgot to mention, I also am very much interested, I agree with uh, Council Member Meyer's point about grant writers and the possible funding available out there. Um, really important, so I just want to um, support that. And then also my interest in uh, trying to reopen the pool, I think we now, I've heard from four council members here who have said as much. Um, so. I maybe it, perhaps I was a little premature in the motion I made. I'd like to, um, I don't know if the best way to do that would be to withdraw and re- sure. Why don't you withdraw your motion? withdraw and, and I'll make a new motion. Okay, so um, we have the withdraw by Council Murray. I would suggest that you make a motion for reconsideration and uh, adoption of new, uh, a new motion language in okay. one motion. Does and we it, didn't vote on the motion. Does it matter that there yeah, was we haven't no voted. Yeah. There was not a vote on the oh, motion. No, we haven't yeah. voted. Yeah. My apologies. Yeah, so feel free to withdraw the motion I, and restate it. I just want to, I'll just, yeah. <laughs> so, with that. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to direct staff to return, uh, to, Tony, what would be a reasonable amount of time for this kind of, um, I'm adding the pool, so um, what, what would be a reasonable amount of time to return by? <laughs> yeah. A couple of months? Probably, yeah, 60 days or so. So, um, before, and probably not before our uh, break. 
in August? Um, Return in August? By August, like that first meeting in August, maybe. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. So motion to direct staff to return by the uh, August 13th. 13th with one, an analysis of the fee structure and business plan for the De La Viega golf course with an eye toward self-sufficiency. And two, um, uh, explore options for returning the Harvey West pool as a year-round facility for our community. Um, this exploration may include new operational models, new programming, infrastructure modernization, and community investment. And I'm, I'm actually stealing that from Council Member Myers who sent it to me, but I thought maybe we could just add them together and, and get this moving. Okay, so, oh, okay. so we have a motion by Council Member Brown, seconded by Vice Mayor Kelly. Thank you. Yes, okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, we look forward to hearing more in August. So we'll go ahead and move right along to um, our next bucket of uh, reductions, which is finance, HR, and IT. There were no reductions. <laughs> yeah, we uh, clearly are having a hard time yeah. here with them. Okay. Revenue enhancements, right? Yeah. All right, who wants to kick us off for uh, some of the context and or uh, is there another way you'd like to present the information? I'm looking to you, Marcus. He Rochambeaued, and <laughs> I'm bigger, so I won. <laughs> All right, so my list of reductions. So uh, I am not entirely general fund, so my, my target goal was uh, about $81,000. Um, and so all of that, though, <laughs> comes from the administration side, so not workers' comp, not benefits, or anybody who's affiliated with working in that division. So the things that come from my budget are all of our training programs, all of our professional development, most of my, the majority of my staff, uh, all of my recruitment team and all of our efforts to do recruitment, all of our labor relations, so anything related to negotiations, uh, investigations, compensation studies, uh, any legal advice that we seek outside. Um, when we have grievances or arbitrations that requires outside attorneys as well. So the, the, in a nutshell, that's uh, in professional development for my, my employees. So uh, what I propose to put up is approximately, well actually I have to just say, when I first came here, we did a, a really thorough job of reducing our consultant agreements almost to the tune of about $250,000 over my first year here. And we went bare, bare bones. So I'm really at the extreme bare bones when I talk about any of the consultant fees um, that I'm trying to cut. So approximately 71,000 is gonna be for anything that relates to if I have an investigation that will come up that I can't, um, that I need to farm out, we're gonna have to figure out how we're going to pay for that, whether it's charging the department that that generates from, because usually uh, my, de my department absorbs <laughs> that. There are some things that we can do internally I've, that I'm able to conduct those investigations, uh, but some things we need to farm out larger uh, we also will get reduce our budget in terms of any type of high level recruitments. We, like I said, we had 122 recruitments uh, last year. So sometimes mm -hmm. we need to farm some out so we can get caught up, particularly when it's a, a mid management level, level recruitment. Sometimes we need outside resources where a consultant may already know who to tap into and have a wider network. So we'll reduce that or ask the department if they really want that route to um, pay for it themselves. And sometimes uh, we also have special studies that are requested by the departments for classification analysis that might be a far reaching, that's much larger than what my staff can um, do with our bandwidth, so we'll, we'll utilize outside help. So those are gonna have to be reduced and those requests will have to be um, minimized. And they happen quite often, you know, whether a, a, a particular position should be in a unit or whether we need a new classification. Um, we, we get those requests quite frequently. And then also within terms of individual staff training within my staff department, uh, what I'm proposing is to eliminate $10,000 and what I'd like to do is eliminate the uh, tra conference trainings, attendance and so forth from my, my leadership team and but still have my technical staff attend because that's important for them. So that's my uh, total of my reductions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I think we'll have, since you're all bucketed together, do you want to do your presentation, then we'll ask questions individually? Do you want to hold but your, or do you want to just uh, do the two questions of HR? It would be helpful for me, but just to, if I'm on a roll, let's go. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so um, anybody have questions? Uh, instead of going down the line, maybe we'll just see if there's any questions specifically. Councilmember Matthew. Similarly to others, so you're suggesting a $71,000 reduction in your department. 81, I'm sorry. 81, excuse yeah. me. Um, that would encompass activities including some recruitment, some consulting, some classification studies, and some whatever the other thing was. Uh, some individual for my my staff. Yeah. That I, what I would look at is the my uh, leadership team, and rather than us attending or going to training, either utilize um, local resources. Sometimes I can get others to help <coughs> to pay for attendance, uh, but it's more important I think for the other staff members to attend. Uh, and then leadership, actually leadership Santa Cruz, which is interesting, is I pay for that at my budget for others to attend. I won't, I won't do that anymore. Um, I love re leadership Santa Cruz for our city staff, and I know staff from many different departments have a pay, have. Paid. And I'm on the board, I, so I it pains I, me to say that. I didn't <laughs> realize it always came out of your budget, um, but I, I think to the extent we can continue to invest annually in, and usually it's a couple of city staff a year, I think, mm -hmm. participate. That's, that's really good. Um, but it can come out of your budget. So what I'm looking for, so that's 71 th or 81,000 out of, out of a total of what? Uh, uh, my, um, so my, oh gosh, actually what part is general fund funded? I don't have that breakout, Marcus. Do you have that off the top of your head? But My total budget is seven million. Pretty, two million. It's a pretty two million. Two million that's a pretty pro. tiny amount out of your total general fund. It still it still hurts because I'm two well, million. Yeah, I understand yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, but I would say anything from here going forward, mm -hmm. if we have to go deeper, I'm looking at bodies. That that was the question I had. Yeah. And I'll just echo that maybe not the elimination of leadership Santa Cruz, but if maybe the reduction so that I don't know if that's possible to have, you know, if there was a whole bunch of folks, but a couple can apply or something like so that. I, what I was going to propose is that each department rather than, than my department pay for it, that if you want to send a, somebody, you, your department actually yeah. has to. Okay, so, so proposing the structure. I, mm -hmm. Okay, I support so, that. Yeah. And because every department has a training and sure. that would, I would suggest you allocate it for sure. that program. And, very, very reasonable yeah, and appropriate. Yeah. Okay, is that what you were suggesting also? Yeah, Council? and in, okay. I think in the past, a couple of year is a good rate, and many institutions do that. Congratulations yeah. for being on the board. Thank you, okay. and soon you'll hear our announcement for our new executive director. I ran into that person. <laughs> okay, is there any other questions for Lisa at this time? Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. We got so IT or? Our, our, oh, Laura's already there, go Laura. <laughs> Hi, Laura Schmidt with Information Technology. So our $134,000 um, that you see on our line item for IT is 4% of our budget. So that was the requested scenario for us to come up with. Uh, Marcus had to summarize three departments in one. So we only have uh, one line item up there, but um, the first reduction that we would take should we have to is uh, reducing the number of PCs and laptops that we replace next fiscal year. So that's around a dollars $84,000 um, reduction citywide. So it would come out proportionately out of various departments. The risk there is this year was the last year to remove Windows 7 from our environment because Microsoft is end of life that operating system. And when they end of life, they don't give security patches for it anymore. So this set of PCs and laptops for this fiscal year were to put Windows 10 throughout the city. Uh, we can mitigate the risk by choosing which laptops and which desktops that we leave on Windows 7 and target ones that are of lower use and um, what we believe is a lower risk to leave at Windows 7. The other um, elimination that we would do is there are uninterruptible power supplies of a smaller form factor throughout the city. So these are key workstations, our servers, where if the electricity goes down, the UPS sits there as like a battery backup. So we would eliminate preventative maintenance on the smaller form factor UPSs scattered throughout the city. We would still maintain the maintenance 
on the large UPSs. So the big one downstairs for the data center here, the data center at the police department, at the water plant, that type of things, that would maintain. So it would be the smaller form factor ones that we would eliminate preventative maintenance on. And then the third possible cut would be a, um, a reduction in our contract for professional services for the people that man the phones for our help desk. So that would be the phone responsibility of our technical support services side. We would still have the internal staff on the technical and the field service side, but somebody being there from the hours of 7.30 to 4.30, 8 to 4 to answer the phone, we would stop that probably around mid-year to meet the rest of the reduction to get to the 134. That's the summary. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. <laughs> so just want to ask the question. So there would be no phone technical support? You would still be able to, so we would still have our field. So we have a first tier of call to the 555 number now. And that is a, a person that just does phone work. And they are there on a pretty constant basis, sitting somewhere answering the phone. And then at the second, then if they can't immediately answer the question and resolve it on the phone, it goes to our next level tier of support. And those are our IT tech specialists, one, twos, and threes. And they have a deeper level of knowledge and troubleshooting skills. And we have those people assigned by departments. So Robert Ranauer is um, the one that covers the city council. He also covers finance administration. HRIT, city clerk, city managers. So he's your field tech in that sense, and then he has a backup to him as well. Those people would still be available, and you could still call a phone number. You were not going to get a live body. The ticket would go into the queue on the phone number, or the ticket could come into the queue through email, or um, what employees are likely to do, because we very organically are able to find people to help us is um, you would probably call your field tech that's been assigned to your department. So there's still gonna be help, but the wonderful compliments that you guys gave us of our you know, immediate response, there's gonna be a service level impact to this level of cut for our department. And you won't get as immediate of an online actual person to respond to you, but we will still have our field technical, professional, deep knowledge uh, support to be able to give you. So it will be impactful to the employees though. And we recognize that, but um, we, we don't have a lot of other fat in the budget to be able to trim because we have a lot of operational overhead in our licenses, our hardware contracts and our software contracts, so. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Okay. I apologize, Council, but I have another meeting I have to attend this evening, so I'm going to have to leave now. Okay. We'll behave. <laughs> I'm sure you're all in good hands. Okay. Marcus, thank you. So our, our biggest proposal is to ex further expand credit card recovery fees. We feel this is, uh, again, I've probably been more the roadblock because we, we see the internal control process of allowing more people to pay by credit cards and not discouraging it creates a lot of efficiencies in our operation. Uh, we're at that point now where we've just got to gamble and see if it impacts consumer choices. We don't want to go back to cash and checks, but we realize covering a 3% cost on all these transactions is not the best thing to do anymore. And most government agencies already pass this cost on. We're more on the smaller end of the few agencies that don't fully do that across the board. So places where this would touches business license, emissions tax payments, parking lots tax payments, uh, some counter payments such as planning, parks and recreation, um, where, where where people are touching our fees in those places over at counters, there'll be a convenience fee added to. That would be our biggest expansion. It would could yield about $140,000, $150,000 annually in cost recovery that we're paying now. Two other proposals that we have is reducing Courier pickup, and I, I won't say which sites because there's custodial and risk things about the thing where our armored cars show up, but we have armored cars that comes at a couple different spots, uh, different times during the day, every day. 
And so we might look at reducing one or two of those sites and consolidating where somebody would walk across the street and we'd have a, a consolidated pickup. We still have, I still need to do some further analysis on that. It's not a place that I feel great about doing. This was an expanded service we did years ago from a employee safety and customer safety perspective. But there, is, there might be some opportunity either reducing a site or doing an every other day pickup type schedule. The last one is relocating finance. So we're, we moved offsite uh, a few years back to make way for a consolidated payment counter center. Uh, our eventual come home is is library admin space. The library is always looking for a new place to go, and there's other big projects that we've talked about in reference today, earlier today. But we're we're waiting for that space to open up. That's our return home. In the meantime, we're in downtown at high high rent space. So there's an opportunity for us to relocate and move somewhere else around the city, a couple blocks away or a couple miles away. And a couple miles away is where you get the real savings. A couple blocks away. You're paying a lot of times around the same rates, but there are still a few sites. So it's it would be us prioritizing, really looking to find a new location. And candidly, we, we, we need to do that anyways. We are out of space. We moved in with the idea of having a split department for a couple of years, and it, it's taken a little bit longer to, to get back to our, our home with the library. So we've brought everybody together, and now we've got everybody squeezed in, and so we don't really fit and we've got about eight vacancies we need to fill and we don't have, we have place for two, not eight. So we've got some spacing challenges anyways. So our priority would be find a location that's a lower cost to provide some savings. So that's, that's the impact. So you, moving for low cost, that sounds good. Moving for space sounds good. But to get a lower cost means further away from City Hall. And there's the, that's the impact we're, we're assessing. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. I mean, I'll just briefly say, I think for the credit card cost recovery, I think that is the trend and it's the convenience and you kind of make that choice in terms as a consumer of how you want to move forward with that. So I'm, I'm supportive of that. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the work. Any other council members, Vice Mayor Cummings? I had a quick question about the credit card cost recovery or the recovery fee. Is that a flat rate or is that a percentage? Yeah. Of, of it's purchase? generally a percent every now and then, depending on the transaction, it, 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 there's some nuance to it, but it's generally a percent and almost always around 3%. Utilities have a lower rate, so utilities are about 1%. Yeah. Okay, Council Member Cohen and then Council Member Matthews. Uh, just a quick question on the uh, business license tax. Um, you and I have talked, it may be ripe to um, raise that. I don't know if it's a subject for the Revenue Committee, but um, is that something that the, the voters don't have to go through that? We can we can raise that ourselves. Oh, it's and a tax. It, it requires voter approval. It would okay, it would. thanks. I support the ones that you laid out here. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, we'll keep moving. Um, so community support, I'm not sure who will be presenting on that. Is that you, city manager? Well, I mean, I can, oh, I can speak yeah, to I it. Tina. Okay. Okay. Tina's on her way, I'm passing out my... Oh, she's, she's watching me. Okay. I know. So. Okay. Wanting to request, but I've already discussed. With Here we go. Okay. Marcus and Martine. Okay. Well, she settles oh. down. I'm going to raise the rest. Of the Hi. Good afternoon, council members. I'm sorry. So you just called on me to address this. Okay. I was en route. Um, so I guess I'm here to speak to the community support column as well as this, the council clerk and city manager column. All right, so we have a number of things in here and I do wanna say that as you've been going through all day, these are all varying degrees of pain and difficult choices and they don't feel good to anyone. So I just wanna state that out and I know particularly these topics which really resonate with you in the community are especially hard to tackle. So I just wanna acknowledge that um, as you work through this process. So there are a number of reductions we have identified for your consideration to meet this first tier of cuts. And um, they range from some contracts we support externally as well as um, other things we fund internally and some internal support. So first we have reducing community programs funding. 
This is something that was also brought up last year. Uh, the community programs budget is about $1.18 million. This is, the city has a long history of providing these grants to a variety of programs. Um, the proposed reduction I think would be commensurate with what is being proposed for reductions across the organization, about 4%, which is about $45,000, $46,000 across the board. And that is not uncommon to how we as the city have dealt with reductions in the past when we've had to make contractions to our budget. Typically there's been a corresponding reduction in the community programs budget. So that was put forward for your consideration. Um, the next one is reducing the CPVAW budget. You have about $30,000 annually and um, it's, it's a minor reduction being proposed, maybe $5,000. And I know Councilmember Brown, this is an issue of particular importance to you. What that wouldn't do is that would not compromise the city schools training that we partner with to provide the training in middle schools. What it would do though is absolutely limit the ability to do special events. They like to do some end of year grants when they have some extra resources. And so it would certainly impair some of their activities, but it would, not, um, it would not compromise the ability to have that program in the middle schools. Uh, the next one is reducing the Homelessness Coordinating Committee funding. So that is about a $50,000 reduction. And what that is, is, is you recall in 2017 when the council adopted the Homelessness Coordinating Committee recommendations, at that budget hearing, um, council said, let's actually invest in this. If we want to do, if we want to implement these recommendations, we need to have funding. So council allocated a few pots of money to advance these recommendations. You set aside $100,000 to help do shelter. And you also set aside $50,000 for just the general recommendations implementation. So the recommendation here would be to eliminate the $50,000 that we would use, not for a designated purpose, but for whatever um, is, is needed in 2020 to help advance those recommendations. Now, reducing any homelessness funding is of course fraught with some peril because need could dictate what has to happen. So it could be a real cut or not a real cut, but it is something that we put forward as an option for you to consider. Um, it, we still do retain about $170,000 for winter shelter. And that's our jurisdictional share of the HAP funding as well as another $100,000. So the budget isn't free of homelessness funding, but it just, that's a reduction of $50,000. Uh, the, the next line is for the HOPES program. And um, many of you may not have the, a lot of history with this, but this is a program that's evolved from the downtown accountability program, which was a, a meshing of the city, the county, the courts, and the DA's office to try to get to low level recidivist offenders in our downtown in particular. Move those people into a place where they have an alternative to, um, to jail, get them into shelter and treatment programs. And that program evolved from DAP, the Downtown Accountability Program, into PACT. And then the most recent evolution is the HOPES program. And that is uh, mostly a county program. We help fund it and a lot of our contribution helps fund substance abuse treatment. And right now the current budget is about $300,000. The proposal here would reduce that by $100,000. And the good news on that is that you might recall the county was very aggressive a few years ago in being one of the first in the state to apply for expanded drug Medi-Cal. And we were successful. So what it means now is that if you are an indigent person in our community, you're receiving Medi-Cal, the county can get reimbursed for drug treatment programs. Whereas before that was not an eligible reimbursement expense, it now is. And so this is wonderful because we're seeing that the necessary investment in substance use disorder can go down because the state is paying for that. So this $100,000, and I did confer with the county on this, so I'm not surprising them right now, um, we think is, re is doable and they could still affect their mission and it won't impair the program too much. Um, the, the next one I know will be difficult and this is a suggestion, the open streets donation. Uh, currently that's in your budget. So council member Crone, you asked earlier about the council budget. This is one component of it. Um, it'd be an $8,000 reduction from the $15,000 budget. Um, and then moving over to the, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Councilmember Matthews? Yep. Could you just go over the uh, amount reductions in this column again? Because I wasn't writing fast enough. Absolutely. And I, I talk fast. Uh, so the first one, the community programs, that was about a 4% reduction, which is about $47,000 off of the base uh, budget of $1.18 million. CPVAW was about 5000 and their base budget is $30,000. Can, can you get these written out for us or something? Uh, I mean, you're saying all these things and I don't, I'm not following. I'm okay. I'm, I'm trying to find them in 
Sure. Are you, um, Councilmember Crone, difficulty with the program description or the numbers? You said you're reducing homelessness funding, reducing CPVAW, HOPE's program, 300 to 100, open streets, 8K comes from the council, but I, I missed some things in between. Okay, so I'll maybe start all over? Yeah. yeah, I don't see that. I don't see that those numbers that you're saying up there, just saying reduce. You know. Right, we, and I'm providing more context. I've been hearing your questions this afternoon about wanting more context, so I'm trying to provide a little bit more of that so you can assess the impact of it. Do you want to just go through them one by one and state the amount? I'm That's happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. The okay. So then, starting at the top, the community programs funding. That proposed reduction, the percentage of that was about 4%, again, being commensurate with what we're proposing right now with this, this current round of cuts. That's about $47,000. The CPVAW, that was about $5,000. The Homelessness Coordinating Committee funding was $50,000. What page is that on? Yeah, so the, that, the Homelessness Coordinating Committee budget is found within the city manager's budget. Um, so what you will see is you will see a master roll up and it will be within, you're not seeing a line item budget, but what yeah. you would find that in. Community programs and services. Whoa. I stand corrected, it's, it's in our non-departmental budget. So I don't know exactly where that is in the larger budget document. So I will have to follow up with that. I'm very happy to do that. Compared to what? Absolutely. And actually something I can provide to you that <coughs> might be helpful is I have um, a summary of all of your social services investment I printed out for you. So this might help as you're talking about all of these. So as that goes around, I'll kind of describe what you'll see the information. First, you'll see a table that looks like this. And, and this is um, the social services investment in total. So you can see everything that ranges from the community programs grants at the very bottom to external contracts to our investment in the Homeless Action Partnership and other things. So this is a nice summary sheet of your total social services investment. So that's the first sheet. The second sheet is a line item budget for the community programs. So you can see what every program received from the city. And that has like the blue, um, blue top on that, as well as on the back, the set aside funding that was approved for fiscal year 19. And then the final sheet is just a greater description of the set aside funding in case you want to look at that. So maybe that helps. Um, a little bit because I know there. Um, what's difficult about these is some items are in the city manager's budget, some are in the non-departmental budget, so that can be difficult to track. So I thought like this master summary would be useful to you. Okay, so I think where I was is um, on hopes again. So Councilmember Crone, going back through the numbers that you were requesting, um, the, the hopes was one hundred thousand dollars. Is the cut? Is the reduction yes? The open streets, 8,000. All right, good, okay. So then I'll move on and thank you for, and just please do interrupt me if it's going fast, it's a lot of detail. And so moving on to the final column of your afternoon, looking at the council clerk and city manager reductions. The first one is reducing the state legislative strategist. And um, I, it, was, it was mentioned earlier by the finance director, we have a citywide contract to have legislative advocacy in Sacramento. So this is a firm that we can call upon to track bills, to attend committee meetings, to share information, to set up meetings for us in legislators' offices, or help to advance whatever legislative agenda would benefit the city. And what we're suggesting here is that we, we do an RFP, we renegotiate that contract and get those costs down. We think this is very doable. This would be a savings of about $15,000. Uh, then the next one, what are we losing that? Like, what? Yeah. What kind of information have we been getting? Maybe it's worth more than fifteen thousand. Absolutely, and so this is where the RFP I think will be very helpful. We, it's good general best practice to bid rebid these every five years, and I think we're on the eight or nine year mark. 
So it's just a good practice just to say, just to reassess what do we need? What level of service do we need? Do we need an on-demand retainer? Is there another financial arrangement? So we would wanna try to retain as much as we can, but get a better price. Mr. Mayor, coming. I would also like to know um, whether or not we get reports from this individual, how often, because I don't, I don't think I've received any information um, regarding this person and the work that they're doing. And so, you know, uh, I think that the idea that we're gonna go back and look at this contract is good because um, it's, having not received any information at this point, it makes me wonder, you know, is this, mm -hmm. what's this person's role and is it worth keeping? Absolutely, that's a wonderful question. And, and staff use it kind of on demand and sometimes we have very intensive periods, like when we were working on, especially flooding and river levy issues, a lot of intense work, sometimes very little work. And also, what is the information flow from the strategist into my office and across the city? That gets harder to manage too, so <coughs> I completely agree. Can I ask real quick, what is, what's that overall budget currently right now? For that contract, uh, it's uh, citywide, I think it's about 80 something thousand dollars. Yeah. Councilor Matthews? And is some of that a portion to across other it is, yes. So um, the, general, the majority of it is uh, enterprise funds, so I think there's about $30,000 in the general fund of this. Yeah, so I, I'm suggesting a, a cut in the general fund portion of about $15,000, but there would be a corresponding reduction across the other funds too. Through, so through if I'm hearing through it, an RFP, RFP yeah. process. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, continue on. Okay, the next line is reducing our communications and outreach budget. So we do have a budget that exists for us to do work such as producing events, producing collateral materials, creating information. Um, it's also helpful for consulting work. Like right now, I'm very delighted we're embarking upon a social media consultant to have us do an assessment of our social media presence. Um, and the, the over 40 different uh, social media channel, channels that we work within. And a priority of this council has been to speak in a more unified voice across the city. And so this is work toward that. So that consultant will be paid out of that. It helps produce like the city hall to you events, the state of city events, which we did not do this year and other things. So what I'm recommending here is, or suggesting here is we could reduce that by about $20,000. That would leave us with 30. So there's still funds there because there, there is important communications work that we need to do in our community. Our issues are enormous. Our community wants to know more. We need to do a better job here. And so I, I would like to preserve funding here so that we can do, um, do better work on that. Um, the next one is reducing travel and training. And this is a, a small amount. Um, I think this is mostly in the council budget. Um, again, to Council Member Crone's question from earlier, what's in the council reductions? That was 24,000. So eight from open streets, I think eight from this, the travel and training, which leaves about a balance of $7,000 there. And then the next line item is another $8,000 out of the council account, and that leaves you about 5,500. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we can go ahead and hear where sort of council members are on everything. And I know Councilmember Brown, you have a proposal. Um, I don't know if you wanna kick us off, but before, maybe be, if you can before you do, just I wanna sort of briefly speak to the communication strategy and I appreciate the um, insights into the importance of it. I think that's uh, something we've talked about as long as I've been on council in regards to the high need here in our community um, and how we are interfacing with not only immediate kind of crisis type uh, situations, but also really thinking about our strategy citywide in terms of how we're communicating our um, efforts and hopefully preventing any kind of uh, miscommunication or misinformation. So I would like to see that as a priority personally in terms of what that could look like in terms of an investment at the city level in terms of um, communications. So I'll just sort of, I'll say, sort of just say, say that. Um, I don't know, Mark, uh, City Manager Bernal, did you wanna say anything here? Uh, yeah, only that, uh you know, it is, it is correct that uh, based on kind of the scope and size of our community that our communications function is, is very under-resourced, uh, comparatively speaking, uh, and it has been an ongoing challenge uh, for us. Uh, you know, um, a year or so ago, we did do an analysis sort of comparing how other communities like us, like Berkeley, for example, Santa Barbara and others, how they staff up. Uh, and they certainly have uh, a communications uh, group uh, within the, the city manager's office, typically is what they do. 
Uh, so we are underfunded there, and uh, it's definitely an area that we can do a lot more work in. Um, and if the council is interested in us looking at uh, sort of creative ways to try to boost that up and uh, within the overall resources of the city, we can we can do more of the, more of that work if there's an interest in doing that. I'm interested in that, and I hear what other council members have to say. Okay, Councilmember Brown, did you want to share your proposal? Well, or sure. You it, yeah, thank you, um, Tina. If you're still here for um, for walking us through those uh, proposed cuts and so to understand where they're at and also providing the additional information on community programs. This is not really a proposal. This is just, as I was kind of walking through the budget and thinking about my priorities that I really want to make sure get funded, I put together this list and I fired it off this morning so you can see foster grandparent there twice in my, because <laughs> it was pretty quick. So you can cut one of those off. But in addition, now I see based upon um, the additional documentation that we've been given that foster grandparent actually is in the budget and I didn't know that. So um, you can just both cross off? them both off because sorry, foster, foster, foster grandparents, grandparents funded. So let's just, huh? we can cross both of those off. Women's self-defense, it wasn't clear to me that that was still in the budget. You can cross that one off. Um, and open streets, it wasn't clear to me that that was still in the budget. I um, personally don't support the reduction, so I'd like to maintain that at the full funding. Um, we'll see where we get. So that, and then Meals on Wheels feel, uh, is in for 4,600 also. And, and again, we didn't see these before now. Um, my proposal was um, $12,000, which um, based on my conversations with their director would um, uh, help that would cover their rent, their cost to rent Loudon Nelson for the congregate meal program. This is something they struggle with. And um, the county is now uh, the, the big funder of Meals on Wheels. Our share at 4,600, it, it was zero, but at 4,600 is really limited. And given that we receive rent from them and for the service they provide, I mean, it's just so critical. I think it would be really important to support them um, through that uh, either elimination of their rent costs. I mean, I think it, in my, you know, in theory, two transaction costs, you know, if we just eliminated their rent, it would be no transaction. You know, we, uh, there's a way to do that that might even be some additional savings. That was my thinking. Um, Nueva Vista Center, I'm not sure because it, it's not clear to me if the CDBG um, changes that we made because those weren't, have not been finally approved are in this budget, but I do want to make sure that that is there um, when the final budget comes back to us. And so now, uh, so I'll, and then I'll just make, if I, if I could make a couple of comments about the other, the additional um, items. So um, tenants legal services, I passed out along with this drafty draft of my priorities. Uh, the scope of services, that the long awaited scope of services, we do have it uh, to release the funding that we've already allocated. And uh, it's regrettable that um, this has taken so long and they are um, have already started work as a member of the public suggested this morning and they're paying out of their pockets to have the phone line to answer the phone line to print materials community printers provided in kind for them to print materials you know they're really struggling to get up and going without any money um, the, the person who will hopefully get paid to be a staff for this uh, program is currently I believe working at one of her many other jobs uh, so couldn't be here I with this scope of services hope we can really get that money released um, ASAP um, and I would like to put a placeholder to fund that project um, in the new fiscal year as well for 60,000 um, and so I'm putting it out there um, I think it's a very critical service uh, we've heard so much about the struggles that that tenants face renters face in this community um, we have uh, discussed and discussed and studied um, and uh, you know brought it to the the ballot ways to provide some relief to tenants this is just a really concrete immediate way that that tenants who are actually um, needing assistant legal assistance can get help in the immediate um, to provide them with some relief I find I feel very strongly about this this is a way to fund as um, CRLA or um, uh, California rural legal assistance 
community partners have suggested to also be able to provide assistance to tenants who may not be served um, because of their program guidelines. Um, Project Homeless Connect is like this amazing program that I'm, you know, I've learned about because we have a volunteer, you know, a day, an event in the city. It used to be at the um, Civic Center. It was at the Warrior Stadium. They've now moved to the Portuguese Hall because we don't provide them a rent-free space to do that. It's an amazing um, event where um, all kinds of programs come together. I mean, we talk about a navigation center and wanting to have that as a year-round service. Um, this is like navigation day. And if you go and you see it happen, it's amazing what you know. individuals get walked through and, and uh, uh, connected to all of these services, dental, I mean, it, every I could go on, but it, it's just this really amazing thing. And I think we should be supporting them They've been creative in how to continue to make this happen with reduced support from the city. Um, and so I'd like to fund them as well. I'm suggesting 5K, but they have said that they'd be willing to accept anything we might contribute for this coming year. And I think it should be an ongoing priority for us. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on homeless services, some of which um, questionable uh, results. This is a proven, demonstrated results, and it's a small ask. Um, Janice of Santa Cruz, I'm raising this now because <coughs> it is, um, you know, it, it's an issue that, or this is a program in our community that kind of speaks to this broader, I mean, we, we continue to get constituents saying, you know, when, with respect to the Ross camp, for example. The, you know, all these people need, what they need is to, you know, they all need to go and get, um, you know, the, the percentage of whatever the percentage is of people in the Ross camp who need drug and alcohol, um, substance use disorder services. Well, when I talk to Janus workers, um, they say they are, they turn people away every single day from the Ross camp, um, people who are indigent. It is one of the only programs in our community that provides substance abuse services, counseling services to indigent, our indigent community. They are in a major struggle, which you'll uh, be hearing about. I am hoping to bring an agenda item um, later this month to discuss the, uh, how to support the workers there. Um, they have requested um, actually a $5,400 increase, which is a 15% increase over the current portion of funding that's allocated. Um, in the the hopes for for the hopes funding, um, so I think that's a reasonable ask. It kind of raises uh, just a, it's a small commitment that the city can make to a program that is vital to achieving the the kinds of outcomes that we talk about and talk about at the city and um, and really don't support financially. I know this is not the city's traditional role. The county provides a significant amount of funding for Janus, um, but I think it's time that we make some kind of commitment uh, to th that program. They also are, um, just for the record, ex very low paid, pretty close to minimum wage for critical counseling services. Um, so in terms of the you know bang for the buck, I mean, I hate to, I, mean, I, I think these workers are exploited. I'd like to see them get paid more. That's an issue, a broader issue of community conversation, but at least we could support them and, and let them know that, that the services they provide are, um, you know, respected and acknowledged in our community. Um, and the last one that I'm gonna highlight here is, um, and I, I've been working with, um, Council Member Matthews on this um, UCSC Long Range Development Plan um, County City Committee um, with uh, with the uh, County Supervisor Ryan Coonerty and his staff. This is something that um, came out of the Measure U vote. Um, close to 80% of the voters in the city um, supported an advisory measure uh, regarding UCSC growth and. We think it's very important to, um, to, to try to invest in uh, some, an advocate position to, and it would be a one-time um, <laughs> funding allocation to um, be more directly involved in uh, the long range development plan um, discussion moving forward. So I'll just, I'll leave it there. Um, thank you for letting me take the time to hold forth um, and we'll see 
if there's support for <coughs> any or all of these moving forward. Thank you. And I, I, I'll just to conclude, I understand that we're talking about cuts today. And so I want you all to know that I take that very seriously. Um, I'm not, I've not ignored the, the financial reality. Um, I, I believe there are other places that we can cut in our budget. Um, and there are significant mm -hmm. revenue enhancements that we can consider that won't solve our problem for this um, fiscal year. But um, we, I'm not gonna do any more coulda, shoulda, woulda, um, but I think that that's, it's very important that we consider those revenue enhancements um, and put that on the agenda. And I have a motion to make, or actually I think my colleague, the vice mayor has a motion to make regarding that in a little bit. Thanks. Do you, do you wanna go ahead and do that now? Yeah. Okay, vice mayor, coming. I think one of the things that we've um, been discussing today around cuts is the need. <laughs> And just throughout this whole um, budget hearing process and learning more about the current sta uh, status of the city's finances is that um, there is a need to increase sources of revenue um, within the city. And so I'm gonna make the following motion to establish an ad hoc revenue council subcommittee for the purpose of exploring and recommending revenue enhancing options for city council action with the subcommittee members to be recommended by the current budget subcommittee with the subcommittee members to be appointed by the mayor. I'll second that. Okay, thank you. We can go ahead and vote on that now and discuss that if, if you'd like for, for the purposes of moving forward in terms of other actions. Do we have any further discussion on forming a revenue committee? Councilmember Crum. Can we add to the charge of the revenue committee and what you're gonna look at as part of the motion? Sure. Um, because I was, uh, would like to, um, the revenue committee to consider uh, raising the hotel tax, taxing vacant units, a real estate transfer tax, looking at the business license tax, looking at an Uber Lyft tax, uh, and also taking up the golf course and making it, you know, being part of that discussion and making it revenue, uh, uh, really returning it to an enterprise fund that it should be. I, if I could just, um, for sort of um, the interest in how this has gone before, is that there will be an opportunity to explore all types of revenue measures. And I'm, I believe uh, City Manager Bernal, we've done polling and all of those types of things come, in, come into play. So I don't think this will have to be the opportunity for council members to express what their interest is in terms of a revenue measure. But I think we're gonna, that will be all encompassing as the, as the committee moves forward. Does that feel accurate? Yeah, yeah correct. Typically the, the committee explores all the various options uh, by doing some research and analysis. We'll do some, uh, typically we do some polling. So yeah, so it's not limited to anything. It's really looking at all the various options and doing some analysis and coming back with recommendations. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm not limiting it. I'm just making sure that, I'd like to make sure that these are all considered by the committee. And I, I see he's accepting my, um, um, uh, I just, I'm not sure if it's appropriate at this time in terms of what, and I know that our city attorney isn't here in terms of the specificity in regards to how we're kind of um, convened in terms of our budget process. So I think the, it's, a, it's appropriate if, if I may for a revenue committee to be formed and I think it won't be, that will be the beginning of the conversation of what they could pursue. That would be sort of just my instinct personally. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews. Just a, a quick comment on that. I, I agree with the mayor. Um, however, I, I do want to stress that um, some of these actually were not pursued. Some of these suggestions being made by Councilmember Crone were discussed at the Revenue Enhancement Committee and they were not pursued. They were not polled for. Um, they, they were not pursued. And um, I think I've been very clear um, over the, during these discussions that progressive um, revenue enhancements measures um, are, are a priority for me. I'm, I'm sensing that they're a priority for other council members and staff. And I, so I just, however we make sure that those get considered this year, I, I wanna make sure that happens. If, and if it doesn't happen in a motion and then it just gets ignored, I'm gonna come back again and um, you're gonna hear about it again. And then I, I really would love to stop talking about it. I think this, this, there will be opportunity for council members to weigh in on what they'd like the revenue committee to explore. I think that's totally appropriate. I don't think that that has to happen right now. What the proposal is, is to explore forming a revenue committee. So when that comes back, I think it'd be very appropriate for council members to express what their interests are at that time. So council member Matthews and then council member Glover. A question about the intention. Is the revenue committee intended to focus on a revenue measure for voters or fee increases and other ways of? If I could, I would. And this is just a question. 
Yeah, I think, you know, in the past, if I recall correctly, the Revenue Committee was primarily focused on what it could be for voters, but if the um, interest of the council is to also look at other fees and increases, I think that's certainly appropriate as well. Um, City Manager Bernal. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, whatever is the pleasure of the council, but typically it's focused on um, revenue measures or ballot measure, but it, okay. but we could do both if that's what the council wishes. Okay. So, okay. To my mind, it'd be clearer to keep it restricted to that because my understanding is there's work in progress right now in different departments about examining different fees. So I have no idea specifically what's in the pipeline on that score. I look to Marcus. Is that correct that there's still some fee adjustment? Yes. Going on? I mean, you, so. you heard Fire's concept yeah. today. There's three other fees being looked at. There's a uh, concepts around the action lab. There's several revenue ideas oh. there. Um, it, it, it could be totally appropriate for the revenue committee to, you know, get a report out of all those ideas. So, it comes into that place. I, that, that'd that, be fine. that makes sense then, if that feels. But in terms of the purpose and focus, you're to so look I'm, at both revenue measures and uh, potential fee increases. Well, if I'm hearing if I'm hearing you correctly, you're in, if I'm hearing you correctly, Councilmember Matthews, you're really saying um, the Revenue Committee could be um, really purposeful in trying to look at what type of revenue measures they'd like to bring forward. They have their hands full on that, and the, I think these others may be on different timelines. And so maybe just working in concert with knowing more about what's happening for fee revenue as well. I'm, I'm not necessarily making that the priority, but staying in line with that as a, as a revenue option. And in any event, I think the language could just say including but not limited to, and then. Sure. You got the open book there. Okay. Okay. I think that's okay. Councilmember Glover. Um, so it's been mentioned a couple times in response to Councilmember Crone's request, uh, but when is this time that council members will have an opportunity to weigh in on the committee? Because is the motion right now to explore the creation of a committee or is it to form a committee? Because it was to form a committee. Because if it's to form a committee, then there needs to, in my opinion, to be some very specific outlines as to what the committee is going to go on. Otherwise, I can't support voting for a committee that's doing unknown work. So, uh, one solution, if there's some conflict, because it seems like we're talking about it in great depth, even though we were supposedly not able to do that because it's not on the agenda and the city attorney's not here. So uh, to avoid there being any continued conversation about a revenue committee and the structure, I would advocate that we make a motion to explore the creation of the committee and then prioritize it for a short agenda item on the next city council agenda so that we can uh, have an open, transparent conversation So and all be able to provide our input as to what we'd like to see the committee function on uh, because I think that that has continuously been overlooked or pushed to the side, uh, even though there's been requested. Uh, if I understand correctly, the motion before us is to have the budget committee look at this process. Is that correct? So perhaps one of the solutions could be that any council member who is interested in expressing what they hope the budget committee uh, set forth in their recommendation for the revenue committee, um, take that into consideration at their next budget committee meeting. I, I, I think that would appropriately get to what I believe is the broader interest from uh, outlined by Councilmember Crone, expressed by Councilmember Glover, but I'm sure shared amongst the entire council. Um, Councilmember Matthews? So the budget committee, who's on it? <laughs> budget committee is currently <laughs> Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself. Okay. And so you would then um, discuss this and bring forward to the council an agenda item for action. Is that correct? Possibly. I think that seems appropriate or some sort of for ratification. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay. In some form. And, and then any any interests for consideration could come to the budget and committee. That's when we, yeah. and I'll and we can solicit that through email. Does that seem appropriate? Okay. And the, I just want to ask the maker of the motion if you accept it to uh, come back to us as an agenda item on the city council, so we can then give some a charge and a mission for the budget committee to explore and make sure f folks feel okay about it. I actually would prefer that um, the but the ad hoc um, budget committee take into account the information that you all want to see the um, revenue subcommittee work on, and then we can bring that all forward at one point in time with recommendations of people to be on that. So I would say that what would be good is if council members could then provide their input as to what they want mm -hmm. to see the committee actually accomplish, and then we can take that information to the ad hoc committee and come up with the scope of work along with the membership mm -hmm. of that committee. Okay. All right. 
Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, so we'll go back to the proposals for the additional funding or recommended funding. And um, in the context of the final kind of few areas under council clerk and community support and city manager. I believe uh, we had Councilmember Brown share. I think we can just go ahead and um, maybe go to Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then does that feel appropriate and everybody can have their turn? Okay. Councilmember Matthews, do you have Except anything? I'm trying to find pieces of paper. Okay. <laughs> and what's on what. Um, do you want to take a moment? And uh, yeah, I do. Okay. There's one where you no, had the. Does, do we want to start on this end then and yeah, see? Okay. okay, Councilmember Cohen, do you want to share anything? And so we're, we're just discussing what Councilmember Brown has brought forward? Or any direction for our city staff here in terms of how we're going to try to move uh, forward. I had a question for Tina about the CPVAW. Do we know, has that group taken a position right now on the women's self-defense classes? Because I hadn't heard that, but I. I, um, I think. To my knowledge, and I will certainly follow up and get you something as soon as I can within a day or two, but the commission was relooking at the most efficient way to provide these services. Yeah. And so I think that they're in that place of, of looking toward it, but the money is preserved in the budget, however they wish to go forward. So I don't know the exact uh, point in their process. I know that um, I'll, I'll check in with Ms. O'Hara at my office when I see her tomorrow about the details and I can get that to you. And what is the budget of the CPV? About $30,000. Um, yeah, so I, you know, pending that, I would like to keep it in here if, you know, depending on, because it's a commission and they have points of view and maybe they won't vote for it. Um, I also, I wanted to know about the Forster grandparents. We have 5K here, but we have 3,400 in the, uh, uh, in the, the city, I guess it's community programs. Is that, is that what you intended, 3,400? 3,400 for... Oh, yeah, if that's what it's, it's been allocated, me. I imagine there's been some discussion with them. So, uh, yeah, it, la it was five thousand two years ago, but thirty four hundred. If I'm assuming that was. And if I could clarify, it's all right, mm -hmm. um, Madam Mayor. So what I provided here was to show you the FY 2019 set aside funding. So what you did in your last budget cycle is that you allocated the base core funding, <coughs> community program funding. And then you also said, we want this $45,000 set aside fund to serve as an innovation fund for emerging needs, for new programs, for other things that didn't fall into the multi-year core RFP process. So that gave the council that fluidity and flexibility to respond to community needs as they might change year over year. So the list you see before you is what ultimately the community <coughs> programs committee recommended for the current fiscal year that we're in right now and there was a very simple letter of interest process this list came up with so however the community programs committee moves forward they I believe they may wish to do another letter of interest process so I, I would just say with caution the programs on here represent last year's funding decisions so if I'm hearing you correctly are we do we have um, 50,000 or 45,000 allocated for a set aside then correct okay so it's it's the the money's there but the process it hasn't been, oh. hasn't ensued yet. So that could likely ensue, but we have a placeholder for the dollars there. We do. Okay. Okay. Thank and you. It, it is inclusive though of that 4% reduction that was proposed. So that's something just to bear in mind. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I um, totally support the uh, project Homeless Connect. And I think Janice, if we're putting our money where our mouth is, you know, it's providing services that really are needed. Um, and I think we should be providing more than this, but I'm, I'm going to go along with the recommendation. Um, also, uh, I see that considering Harvey West Pool 400 and council assistance, I think that um, council is, it's part of the whole thing, folks talking about social media and getting the word out and having some sort of messaging. Um, I would see this as a, a fund that council members can draw on uh, that would take the place of a uh, principal analyst, for example, we would co back cover the benefits uh, and this would be, you know, if council members want to draw on this fund or not. Uh, I would put it maybe at 150, 25,000, where each council member could be limited to 25,000 in getting assistance. And we're just buried with, you know, right now email and, and communication is very difficult. And uh, often I encounter people who never heard back from any council members. And I always think that's kind of um, sad. But um, so I, I'm definitely supportive of, of that. Um, and the UCSC LRDP advocate, 
uh, is something that's been discussed in the Measure U Committee, but also um, in the LRDP, the community um, advisory group that uh, Councilmember Matthews and I are on. We've discussed that some with, with folks who are on there as well. At least I've talked to you know three others who are on that, and they uh, think this is a very good idea. And if we, we want to be serious about you know approaching the university, that we needed somebody to be working in Sacramento, and that it, it's, it's a good reason. We should definitely be hiring someone and working with the county. It's another opportunity too for us to work with the county on this really significant issue. Um, okay. And just if I could maybe for clarification, Councilmember Brown, um, would you be open to the set aside funding ma maintaining with the with a more of a competitive process mm -hmm. for current needs as opposed to the specific programming that you, which wouldn't necessarily preclude them from receiving that funding? I mean, I, I, I think there was, that's where I, I found that there was a disconnect potentially. Yeah, thank you. There was a disconnect there. Um, well, given that I've, um, you know, uh, I'm no longer on the community programs committee and won't be having opportunity to weigh in at that level. Uh, you know, I'm okay with leaving it there for now, but when it comes back, yeah, I'm was. certain uh, if it's not in there, then I'm going to bring it back again. That's, that's reasonable. I mean, that it, just to remind everybody, there's a nine to one match that foster grandparent gets. So every dollar for every dollar we provide, they get an additional nine dollars. Um, so it's kind of let's talk about bang for your buck. Um, that's really critical to me. If so you, if you I, want to pull that one out right away, I mean, I think that's totally reasonable. I just think that the process, I think that ensued really allowed for current needs or other people to apply. So it it's fine. Uh, just uh, it's fine to pull it for now. I mean, I want to get us there, and um, you know, I, I certainly don't want to see us go further into the red. But I will bring it back if it's not on the community programs committee list when okay. it comes back. To I just us. want to add, could, could we also have direct staff to look into the whole notion of uh, rent for meals on wheels and see? If, there's a, if that's a better deal, if we could just relieve them of their rent rather than just give them 12,000. That's reasonable. Okay, Council Member Glover. Yes, uh, so as many of you know, I am um, completely opposed to cutting community support and community programs. Those are the things that help us to make the people within our community uh, be able to succeed, especially those that are less fortunate, underserved, and or vulnerable. So uh, not in support of reducing community programs funding, uh, not in support of reducing CPBOB budgets, uh, not in support of reducing homelessness coordinating committee funds. Uh, I'd need to look at the efficacy of the HOPES program and how that's working, um, and if it is in fact deterring people from the criminal justice system, actually getting them into services. Uh, if the data is not strong on that, then I would support a reduction to the HOPES support. Um, open streets, I'm mixed on uh, because I understand the importance of having a day for people to be open on Westcliff and enjoy it. Some people say we should make Westcliff open every day of the year so that it's an open street, so that may be a conversation to have at some point. Um, with regards to the proposed city manager and city clerk budgets, um, the legislative strategist, I'd need to see the data on that and the contract agreements. The communications and outreach, I think, would be further detrimental to the organization since, in my opinion, we severely lack at communication and outreach in the community already as it is, so an additional cut to that would be difficult. Uh, I feel that there's a lacking of training in general, so I don't think we should be reducing training. Um, special projects and services, I have to look at what that is specifically uh, to be able to support it. And then with regards to Councilmember Brown's suggestions, definitely support tenant legal services, um, outspokenly support the Nueva Vista Community Resource Center to make sure they get uh, the maximum amount of funding that is possible. Uh, Homeless Connect is an incredibly important program that has an impact on many lives, and I know the people involved with it. I think it's, uh, I think it's something that should be supported. Janice, especially, uh, I support the sentiments that have been shared so far about walking the walk and not just talking the talk. It's unfortunate that it's coming to the city to have to be providing additional funding for Janice when uh, I truly believe that, and I think jurisdictionally it should be coming from the county that needs to be doing more to support Janice, so hopefully, this body will be uh, encouraging diplomatically the 
county to step up their game when it comes to mental health and substance use disorder support. Meals on Wheels, definitely into looking at uh, the rent opportunity to support that program because it's super important. And opening up the Harvey West pool, we already gave instruction to that. Council assistance, I think, um, would be a game changer for a lot of the way that the community interacts and engages with the city council, especially since uh, we are only allotted half time to be able to uh, serve the city. So would encourage and support funding going towards that. Thank you. Councilmember Myers. Um, well, I'm feeling like we're we're not we're not cutting. <laughs> we're kinda, um, I guess my comment for this evening is um, I, I uh, I'm not quite sure how we can keep all of this. Um, I appreciate. Um, Councilmember Brown's list, and I do want to look at this and also just um, understand a little bit more about all of the organizations. And I really appreciate you um, putting these down all on paper. Um, I do. I am very um, intrigued and want to support, if if possible, the idea of having someone in Sacramento working with us on the LRDP. Um, I do think that you see, you know, across different communities that have University of California's in a uh, California campuses. Uh, maybe there's a maybe there's a way to look at that collectively, and maybe there's a way to get a uh, person that might have be very well versed, but maybe there's multiple jurisdictions that might be interested <laughs> in that. I don't know. We should be creative about that. Uh, I'm not sure who is lead on staff with that. Uh, I can okay. speak to that so, a bit. Okay. Um, I think again, we took care of the pool. Um, I'm really of a mixed mind, I guess, on the assistance. Um, this is a really busy job um, on top of having another full-time job. Um, and I, if I had a council assistant, I truthfully, I didn't think I could tell them what to do. <laughs> I'm that busy. So I um, personally, it's not something that I'm gonna use because I can't, I can't manage another person on top of, um, you know, two full-time jobs right now. So it's not something that I would really benefit from. The thing that I think I benefit the, from the most is having some of the training that we've been able to do um, through like the league, um, uh, you know, maybe attending some national conferences on key, key um, kinds of subjects that we're looking at, but, um, I guess I, I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent about that, uh, and uh, so I'll just leave it at that, but I certainly will continue to cook on it till we get together again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just briefly say, I think, um, you know, in general with, well, I guess just in general, in general, general, um, we are at a time where we have to, if we're not um, cutting something and adding something, we won't have a balanced budget. So just sort of keeping it in context of that. And I think the more we add, the more we add. So how are we going to make that up? And I'm interested in being fiscally responsible and being able to have um, the city in a good position, knowing that that hurts a little, um, sometimes a little bit more than others um, can hurt a lot. But I think if we don't, the risk of it hurting even more so with extreme cuts and, um, and less services to our community that is a, it's a heavy price to pay potentially in the future. So it's sort of the nice to have versus the must haves. Um, and I, and so, so I think just in general, I, I appreciate the 4% kind of overall, like I think how do we all sort of weather that storm a bit? Um, so I recognize that hurts, you know, and um, in terms of the proposals for the various programs that are available to the community, if we already allocated that set aside funding in our budget, I think that's appropriate as a, as a placeholder um, for emerging and uh, continually needed uh, services such as uh, Meals on Wheels or, or um, foster grandparents if applicable. So I, I support that process in ensuing. Um, I think in terms of the tenant legal services, how I recall us leaving it is the um, option for that to come back when we had the CPP sort of proposal and looking at their contract or what that, what that, how that fits and mirrors that. So I think that that was already kind of discussed is going to be kind of revisited at that time. Is my was my is my recollection or understanding of that. Um, 
And then in terms of the council assistance, I think it, it, that just goes back to, um, you know, nice to have, how are we gonna pay for it um, type of thing. So that would be uh, sort of just my general comments at this point. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then we'll go down and revisit any of these. Well, I share some um, similar concerns as was brought up by Council Member Glover around reducing um, the community programs, especially those that go towards supporting um, a lot of our homeless population and people who are um, less well off in our community. So um, it would be great if we can see if there's other areas where we can uh, make reductions at this point in time. Um, one of the things I was gonna ask is whether or not um, um, the finance director and with the um, park or the um, public works director and some of the other departments can consider uh, or reaching out to find out whether or not some of the vehicles that we need to purchase can be maybe purchased next year um, just as a way of saving some of the costs. So determining, you know, and I know we mentioned this earlier, but like what is their current state in terms of, you know, could, could we potentially put off purchasing all of them or some of them to a later point in time? Um, in addition to that, uh, as I mentioned previously, the state legislative strategist, I think it's gonna be good to try to renegotiate that contract to see if there's potential for cost savings there. Um, and then I share some of the similar sentiments around um, reducing communication because I think that um, being an institution that has a strong connection with the public is something that's very important for us, especially when we wanna make sure that we're being transparent with what we're doing. And so I think that, you know, trying to maintain that as best we can or seeing what, you know, more specifically what reductions would happen around that I think would be helpful um, as we adopt the final budget. Um, special service, I actually had, had a question around the special, uh, special projects and services. Can you provide us with some context? Uh, in, in the council budget? Yes. Absolutely. So there's a line item, there's a couple of line items in the council's budget which are undesignated monies that the council could choose to appropriate for whatever use comes up throughout the year. So there's currently a line item for $8,000 and another one for $5,500. And in many years that is hardly touched by the city council. Um, instances where the council's used it in the past is say for Thanksgiving dinner, there's a, there's a Thanksgiving dinner put on for homeless individuals in our community. There's been a request to the city, can you please cover the costs of the refuse, the dumpster containers? And that's an enterprise fund, so we can't just waive those fees. And so the council for year over year has paid for that. And so that's, you know, in the order of $1,000. But, but that's it. So it's really just this account, so you have some flexibility for any needs that come in throughout the year. But it's never had a designated or specific purpose. Um, I'd have to go back, but I don't recall it ever being drawn down um, at all. Um, so, and it's been about $5,000 for many, many years. We bumped it up one year and then it wasn't used. And so it was put down to $8,000. So does that help? Yep. And I can um, grab more data if you need it. Great, that's great. Because I think that given the information you just provided, that, that would be an area where I could definitely see us reducing the funds and that. Um, with regards to what Council Member Brown brought forward, I'm very much in support of um, all the programs that she brought forward and having had discussions um, with other people in the community as well. I think that these are some of the, the items and programs that are in very much need of funding. And so um, seeing how this fits into our budget as we um, try to see where we can make some cost savings, I think would be good because these are very important programs that I think um, are gonna provide a lot of help to a lot of people in our community. Um, as mentioned before, the Harvey West Pool, that's a conversation that's already moving forward. Um, considering funding for council assistance, I'm interested in looking into that as well. I think that um, being someone who works full-time and does this position, it would be good to have someone who could um, help on some of the various items even with um, drafting reports and working with staff on certain items. So um, that is something I'd be interested in also finding more, um, in f finding out more information on and then just looking at our budget as a whole with these um, items incorporated into it to just see given the areas where we've been able to make some costs, um, what would the deficit look like or how close we would be to balancing a budget. 
we'll go ahead and have Councilmember Matthews maybe share um, her, because I know we, we kind of stopped there and went back there. And then I think Marcus, maybe you can respond to after, after we hear from Councilmember Matthews. Is that appropriate? Yep. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, going, I guess I'll go down the columns first. Um, under the council, um, I think we all agree that uh, renegotiating a contract for a legislative strategist will result through an RFP and savings. So that's keep it, but uh, um, observe a savings there. Um, I do support um, uh, the communication funding tentatively if we can uh, preserve that because I think we really do need it. Um, I support actually reducing the travel and training and reducing the special projects. I think we've got to walk the walk, you know. Um, in terms of the list that uh, Sandy presented, um, women's self-defense class, I think we agree that's already included in the budget. Um, tennis legal services, is there a carryover from what was allocated this year? Um, I mean, it's not, it hasn't been spent. Well, it hasn't been out appropriated. So we currently have no funds appropriated in this fiscal year. Um, the contract or the, the funding was approved in the prior fiscal year. The contract did not get to execution. It got resurrected again this fiscal year. And there's some back and forth around the scope of work. We're working with the tenant sanctuary is there, right, and I think Casey's working on it. And, and so what we're trying to do is just square that with what they originally posed and council acted upon, which didn't exactly square up. So we're trying to bring those pieces together. But to answer your question, in this year's budget, there are currently no funds appropriated. So that would have to, um, there would have to be a budget adjustment to do that. And I, my recollection is there was a, an initial recommendation, I think from the Homeless Committee for 15,000, and then that was in, Increased by council action to 30. 30. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I think much remains to be done. I, I would personally prefer to keep this on hold till there's more discussion and um, with the proposed scope of work that's just been presented. This is all new news. Um, and allocate something, but not at the 60,000 level. It seems like it doubles uh, every time we see it. Um, I know you have comments on that. <laughs> um, in terms of the Nueva Vista uh, increase, uh, that's part of the um, CDBG, which we don't have here. And that was accommodated in the, um, it was a community programs committee, I think, um, that recommended a cut in CDB allocation for code enforcement and that that money was to go to um, Nueva Vista and some other programs I'll distributed just, to other programs. That was actually a full council discussion. Oh, was that a full council? Well, right. excuse me. <laughs> no problem. We had a okay. Um, so that direction then has, has been made. Been made. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, uh, I'll have to figure out how that squares what's uh, uh, allocated for uh, inspections and code of enforcement in the planning department budget. I just forgot that was a full council thing. So, um, that's, that's been done then. I, that would be my understanding. That, that CDBG uh, action has been taken. Yeah, so you don't need to include that one here. Excuse me, yeah, so that we'll come back for a final hearing. You okay. had the first initial public hearing on it, so the decision is not final. So I think that's slated for your May 28th meeting. Oh, okay. So that, that's not final, but it, it is outside of the general fund community programs budget and presented here. probably headed in that direction. So I think what I'm yeah. thinking is that needs to be uh, Correct. It, it, okay. Th this, just to clarify, if I could, this was, these were my requests, and so they don't all necessarily have to go in here. I just wanted to make it clear that that funding is a priority for me, um, but assuming that it does get ratified um, through CDBG, it doesn't need to be in this um, right. you know, here. So, so you can take the Nueva Vista, it's actually Vista, not Vista. <laughs> you could just take that one off, um, make that, um, Deficit shrink just a little bit more. We've, it's growing and growing, but you know, it's, every little bit helps. Then um, the set aside, the the sheet we have here is the fiscal year 2019 set aside. Um, we are in the third year of the core program, which are designated allocations in their third grant year. And the set aside was a one year and all these organizations understood that was a one-time uh, allocation. 
and um, how is the Community Programs Committee anticipating handling this set aside? My understanding is that we um, in the budget have that 45,000 still there and since the community core commu the core process has been extended an additional year it seems to make sense to me to still have that kind of um, buffer so that when the RFP comes back out for those that didn't necessarily um, catch it the first time to based on sort of this newer process, could still be able to get some support knowing that the RFP for core will likely come out over the next year. Is, is that seem accurate? And so, the, and that could be some of the community programs committee, which, you know, is, you, is myself, you, and uh, Council Member Glover can think about then. So is the thought that we would allocate a certain amount for set aside and it would be a new process, de novo? Yeah, which, which would then eventually come back to the full council at a certain point to have any kind of input on the specifics of that. And that's where I'm thinking something like um, Project Homeless Connect and Janice. Any of and them. Meals on Wheels could come back on that. Um, Meals on Wheels is already on here. Some of these understood clearly it was one time and that was fine. So um, I, I think um, we could do that set aside. I would suggest a, a somewhat smaller amount for this, you know, just going by the playbook, but it would still be, uh, it could accommodate the um, suggestions here <clears throat> as well as, as others. others that may continue and others may arise. So that'd be my suggestion on how to handle the um, Project Homeless Connect, Janice and Meals on Wheels suggestion here. Um, for the uh, UCSC LRDP advocate, um, this is actually, uh, uh, we have a description of the uh, proposed uh, program and um, I'll distribute that. I mean, we both have it, we can distribute it. It's not, it's not an, uh, a lobbyist up in Sacramento working with other communities. It's, it's um, splitting the cost 50-50 uh, with the county um, since we have both been parties in UCSC growth issues. Um, to fund uh, an organizer that would work specifically with students. It could be other community organizations to um, have uh, our voice heard in Sacramento. Um, and it's, it's somewhat flexible in terms of the um, exact program, but really organizing around the concept of do not expand the campus until there is infrastructure housing et cetera, in place to handle that. That's the, the theme. And, you know, we, we pass ballot measures and have committees and so forth, but the idea is to get um, short-term some paid organizing to um, have that more consistent message. So uh, we'll distribute that uh, concept to you, 50-50 share with the county. So Mark, to add to that? No, that was great. Okay. Thanks. Uh, in terms of our U.S. pool, yeah, I think we've sent that off for more information. Um, I personally don't favor uh, adding the council assistance. Uh, <laughs> we're not succeeding <laughs> today. <Yeah. laughs> so um, we'll have to come back, but. Okay, so Marcus, I'll kind of just kick it over to you at this yeah. point in terms of where we're at in the process and what you need moving forward. So do you wanna help help us in that regard? Yeah. What what you see that may just mystically appeared in front of your eyes is a tracking tool we've used in the past. It's been helpful just to track down, make sure we're capturing your primary topics. Uh, ultimately, like May 28th, we'd probably get down and start taking motions on these things. I think today we're collecting information. I think it's too pr premature to start voting on yes and no on anything. So just by way of example, I've listed the things that you've talked about your interest in, in, in more investments. It's got a tracking number at the top, that yellow band that shows the current projected deficit based on ups and down changes. Going down a little bit further, we see the 1 million nine line of 1 million That's the net of the 2.4 million where we started today with staff recommendations. Not that you haven't told us no on everything, down below, I've listed the items that some things were clear, like across the board, not interested in, other things where we need more information to come back on. So I'm just tracking on the things that we need to get back to you with more information. And so for the time being, they're off the list, and then we'll present back, and May 28th is when we will kind of finalize, are these, are any of these coming back to the list of proposed solutions? So if that makes sense. 
Um, look, we're tracking the ads. We're starting with the 2.4 million proposed. We're tracking the items that need a little bit more time on the reductions or solutions. In addition, we're gonna be working in parallel, bringing you more um, solutions. And, and we've also got a tab that uh, we'll be watching some video and coordinating with our fellow colleagues around here of, of the types of items where you said you want more information on this, that, or, or the other thing, and trying to keep track of those items as well. So one additional, I'm sure that you captured it somewhere, but one additional s sort of solution I heard uh, Vice Mayor Cummings express was the vehicle postponement purchasing. I don't yes. know if that was in there. I, I haven't added it here because I didn't want to start moving. It's on my no paper. Problem. But no I'll, problem. Just, I, I took note. Okay, so maybe we'll go ahead and come back and then I had Vice Mayor Cummings, Councilmember Myers, and Matthews Brown, and I'm sure we'll ha have others want to weigh in here at this point. Okay. Oh no, I'm sorry. I started with you and then you. Okay. I had a question, um, Marcus. Is there any way that council members can get copies of um, the budget in an Excel spreadsheet format um, in case we were, you know, we wanted to highlight different areas where we wanted to see why things were going up? We can leave comments, um, and we can, you know, save it and label it with our own names, just because as someone who works with um, budgets often, I find that sure. sometimes going through each of these and kind of highlighting and scribbling, it can get really messy and yeah. it might be um, helpful and easier in terms of like, if we're gonna have meetings between now and the next time we look at the budget, I'm wondering if um, some of us could have a spreadsheet that we're working with, rather than having to input all these numbers into a spreadsheet, which would take. A yes, long. no. Uh I'm pausing not to say no, I'm pausing for how many, four different ways, now six, I can do yes. Um, so I think we can get you the yes, we'll look for the most efficient way to get you the data. So you're looking essentially not the, all the narratives, you're looking for the, the numbers, schedules, in an Excel format, by department, general fund, all funds, capital improvement program. Um. It'd be good to know, like if, if it seems like, for example, capital improvement, it's not something that's gonna be very feasible. I mean, looking at the general fund and, and where we're making most of the, the budget adjustments, I think is probably the best um, spreadsheet to have access to. So if I could, if I could maybe, uh, essentially it seems that you've created that spreadsheet here, perhaps you would just wanna share it with us. So if offline we wanna tinker with any of it, that could be a useful tool. Does that feel, does that feel appropriate? Yes. Yeah. Why, well, unfortunately, because of the, because we don't have access, I can't see all the tabs that are actually included there. But yeah. I think ultimately um, what I'm interested in is that there are different areas where we've seen very high increases. There's some areas in the budget where it seems like um, it's unclear whether or not it's a typo or if it's an actual increase. And so just as an example, um, in, for example, economic development, there's a affordable housing trust the fiscal year 2019 estimated actual was 1,779,000 and the fiscal year request is 117,000. And so I think going through and being able to have a spreadsheet that has, for example, these estimate estimates of the current year, what we're proposing for the following year, being able to you know make notes of those and then um, be able to bring those spreadsheets to you with comments, I think it could be a little bit more efficient. Additionally, if we're, adjusting numbers to see where we can do cost savings. Um, I would actually like to, you know, be able to move those numbers around mm -hmm. personally to see, and then to be able to bring that to you. Um. So I would, so there's a lot of things I wanna say, but I think I'm still in the yes. I'm trying to figure out the best way to get you to the yes and the most efficient way to get you to the yes. So I'm hearing what you're saying, you, you, since you, the budget by departments, so you can see 18 actuals, the 19 where the current year is, and the 20, Propose and you can do some analysis of where 18 was actually, where 19 might be going, where 20 is, and you can see some of those deltas that are happening. Um, Correct. Yeah. Um, so yesterday, I, one of our quiz questions was, how old is our financial system? <laughs> um, 20 but, 1999. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, let me. I, I mean, I guess I would with our team like, on. I think again, yes is there. I guess my where my pause is, how fast can I get to yes? Is it tonight? Probably not. Is it? Friday, that might be a challenge. Monday might be more realistic. But uh, I hear I hear what you're saying, and I recognize that it would be helpful. 
and we can and we can talk more. I mean, and my colleague right here is just saying, Marcus, if you just let me roll out our OpenGov platform, you'd already have that. So. And I'd be interested in knowing at what level of detail you want that to come. I mean, we also recognize you're very busy this time of year as well. So if if, if you want to work offline, maybe on what could be possible, I think that makes a lot of sense. Say, in the and meantime, it, we can definitely go through any of Because a lot of times, too, even if you had a spreadsheet, it's difficult to assess because, you know, sometimes you'll see a huge difference in number and it's a, like a one-time allocation that you wouldn't know just from looking at the numbers. So you, Right, you and know. I think that that um, brings up the point of being able to highlight those and and then have a conversation about what's going on with the right these. exactly. We'll be able yep. to leave comments in the different fields so that we can go through and actually mm -hmm. ask, you know, why is why are these numbers so far off? Is that a typo? Is it a one-time mm -hmm. payment? Yeah, usually it's something like that. One. I, I can explain probably that one with 98% certainty, and that's the nuance of this is like inside baseball details. The those those particular funds have projects built into them and some rollover funds. So what you're seeing is accumulation of prior year budgets that aren't fully spent and it rolls into our estimated main actuals, that column should actually be leftover budget for, for projects because it, it just by default says what has been spent on those projects and anything that's left falls into that column as a formula again, 20 year old system. So in the case of projects, that column is better labeled what's left in the budget, not what we plan to spend this year. So there's some nuance in there that I, I recognize it would be helpful for you to see those trends and then be able to highlight well, what's going on with this one and what's going on with that one. And I think if any individual council member wants to sit with you to discuss some of those nuances, I think it's yeah. totally appropriate. Boba and budget, I got it. Okay, <laughs> council member Myers, then council member Brown, Matthews. I just wanna make sure I'm understanding what you have in front of us. So this morning we started with a, <coughs> with a budget solutions goal of trying to get keep this 2.4, but we have an additional $800,000 to get to our Full deficit, is that correct? So our yeah, full so deficit is 3.2. Currently it's 3.2. And so that number right now would say. So we've gone up 448. We've gone back the other way, 448,000. So now we're at 1.2 million that we still need to make up. Is that correct? To get well, to the 3.4? The, the 1.9 is now, now our new delta. So I started with 3.2. Mm -hmm. Be, before we started the meeting today, we had a 3.2 deficit. Staff proposed $2.4 million. Right. So then we dropped down to $800,000 deficit. Mm -hmm. Well, since then, some things have come either off the 2.4 or questions. Okay. So, so that, move, so that this number's is now, moving. This is now our moving target, very hypothetically, because we haven't taken motions, we haven't said yes or no on things. So this is just, it's just showing you how this tool could work later, especially May 28th with, when we say yes to Okay. All these ads, you can quickly see what the new gap is. So it's live and it's just constantly. Yes. Um, uh, I had a question about, um, so I, I'm, and I don't, if this is difficult, it's not, a, but I'd like to understand a, a little bit of the ramifications for next year's budget, honestly, mm -hmm. um, because I think what we need to be, it's one thing to maybe look at offsetting or delaying something, but again, this is a compounding problem. This this is not going to stop with this 3.2. It's going to keep going next year and the year after. So I just is that it would the is this paper the most which is which is a way to get at maybe the numbers over the next two fiscal years? Is that readily? Uh, I mean, I know it depends on, but let's assume we get down. Yeah, I think, I think what's, what, so what's helpful to the finance director and our finance team is we're starting to get some surety of the types of directions we're going. Right. So we'll be able to finish our forecast models because we haven't been able to say, okay. you know, credibly what kind of trajectories are we doing. Okay. So I think we're getting a strong sense of that today and that's helpful. What we're going to be doing, um, squeezing in, not necessarily full time, eight hours a day, mm -hmm. Thursday and Friday because we've got a, stuff to go in. We've got to update the finance director's overview which has those out year forecasts. So you'll be able to see, okay, based on what we're seeing now, if we replicate that for years 21, 22, 23, you can start seeing how those years are, are moving. So it'll be the finance director's overview that'll give you that multi-year perspective. Of get, we'll get a sense of that. Yeah. Okay, and then f the final question I had was- but It won't be good. Uh, <laughs> I know. Um, the other, the, just the other question I had around, there's a lot of, I heard, um, and I think vehicles are something to look at. 
my understanding is we don't purchase these vehicles. We're just, we're in a lease, we're no, in a we, leasing, mm -hmm. or do we actually that, that's purchase? That's a nuance internally. So uh, we purchase them outright. We do. Yeah, okay. we, we don't try to debt finance anything. Okay, um, so we just purchase them out. Okay, but we're, we don't operate, so we're not, yeah, we're not leasing them and. Well, yeah, there, I there's, I heard there's, about, we were looking at leasing. There is, I think public works is exploring, there's different models of, of maintaining and supporting your vehicle fleet mm -hmm. that can provide you the most current fuel efficiency, the most current safety standards. So there are programs now that are more attractive to leasing that are mm -hmm. hybrids of traditional leasing programs. So Enterprise is an example of a company that has, buys a lot of vehicles because of their rental car. And so they, they can offer you the, I'm talking too much. Get excited about this That's stuff. Okay. Yeah, but it's I interesting mean, to think about a different way of, of maintaining, supporting your fleet, and lowering overall costs of maintaining your fleet and getting the most fuel efficient and access to better vehicles. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Matthews, and then Councilmember Cronin. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, this was in response to Councilmember Meyer's question about the overall deficit number and kind of what's happening here. So I, I just wanted to suggest, so thank you for um, putting this, um, uh, tracking this for us. Um, but you know, the 400,000 to reopen the pool is in there as if it were going to immediately be budgeted for and then lead to that deficit. But we've already suggested we want to explore it. So. I mean, I don't want to take it out, like, I, I feel torn. I don't want to take it out because I want it to, like, I want to, it to be a priority, but it's not necessarily something that we're vo going right. to be voting in this year's budget um, to fund. Right. Yeah. So. Right. And we'll go through, we'll stuff. go through and make those distinctions. Okay. You're correct. That's not one that would be immediate because we are having some discussions about that and, that, and that'll come back. There's something that'll come back to you. So, yeah, that's just an example. Yeah. Of no, the, I think it's, you're it's right. It's not just as bad as we think. I just yeah. wanted to make sure, sure just in general, what, yeah, but I think um, as we do this, yeah, we, I mean, we still have $800,000 we haven't touched. So that, that was mostly my comment. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. thank you, Councilmember Brown. Okay, and then I, maybe if I could just on that, and then we'll go to Councilmember Matthews, for clarity. So you, when we began today, we had a 3.2 million shortfall. You brought back some recommendations to help us and get to 2.4 million. No, we brought 2.4 million in reductions, and reductions that left 800,000 so of a 800. deficit. So now beyond 800,000, this is where we are. Yeah, and just again, I'm, I'm recognizing that we didn't vote on these things, but for example, um, when we were talking about the police department, that was our first early topic this morning, there was a, a request to come back and better understand the, the patrol, the changes to patrols. So I. I no, it's a con I, I realize it's a conservative yes. number. So I, I took that out, recognizing that we didn't vote on that. I'm just, right. it, it's more of demonstrating how this will work on May 28th. Okay. Then don't read too much into that number yet. But it's still potentially, you know, over It's the order a of magnitude. I mean, it's the order of magnitude that we're looking at. Over a million uh, still. Yeah. still. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we're really clear on that. Okay. Yes. Okay, Councilmember Matthews. Thanks. Um, do we anticipate um, another meeting besides May 28th, going directly to June for final adoption. Seems to me we have I a think, lot of know, slug, a lot of stuff to slug. Out. I mean, I'll just say in terms of the final slide here, I know that you have um, sort of some recommendations that one included a potential special meeting. I, I'd be open for that. Yeah, frankly. So we have a lot of work to do clearly before we can get to June 11th. So I think that would be on the table for a potential option. Yeah, um, I do agree uh, to take the Harvey West pool off this because um, it's it's not immediately headed to next year's budget. But also in talking with Tony, um, he described to me some interesting talks being held with county right. parks and, and I don't know what those are. It was kind of an offhand mm -hmm. conversation, but that may have some, some really good opportunities to get where we want to be. I agree. <laughs> not at this price in our budget. So um, there may be additional information from other department heads. I am eager to hear their comments on our comments because I think there's there's still a lot of um, work adjustments to, to be made. Okay, Councilman Merkow. It uh, occurred to me that the Heritage Tree recommendation from the Parks and Rec Commission, is that part of this? Uh, it was uh, twenty-five to $50,000? No, we don't have that yet. It would be great if you could put it in. And also, are we gonna talk about the CIP? Or is that, are we done with that? Said that, that could be a separate 
part of this. Yeah, I think this is the point to direct us what other information, what more conversation do you want to have? If there's some questions, let us know if you want to, if, if we need to do a deep dive on some projects, we can bring those particular projects back. Um, somebody brought up the farmer's market canopy. Is that already in the budget or just a placeholder or? Placeholder. If the, as, as I understand, it's a placeholder, it's more process. Yeah, it's a placeholder because the council needs to provide direction on that project, so they're placeholders essentially. Okay, any other council input at this time? Okay, so, I mean, I think, I guess I'll just end by saying, I think, you know, I appreciate the work of the, of the staff and the departments in trying to sort of take that softer hit throughout. Um, it's hard, it's no matter, I mean, no matter which way you cut it, it's hard. And so I think it's not only us looking at reductions, but also having some restraint in the additions, unfortunately, because there's so much we can do. So, um, at a certain point, we'll want to get to a place of being fiscally responsible and having a balanced budget. And so how do we get there, I think, is our work to do. Um, so I think we've given you a lot of content to explore and we'll uh, continue this discussion. Any final comments, Councilmember? Member? So should we count on an additional special session? I mean, should we build that into our... Let's, I'll, um, we'll talk and, and determine how that will, will uh, go through, go forward. I think we discussed potentially the 14th. I don't know if that's gonna be possible, but definitely the 28th and then most likely a council special I'd say next Tuesday is too quick to okay. come back. Yeah. Um, but possibly the Tuesday after or, or maybe even after May 28th, get something placeholder. Yeah. Uh, May 28th in between meeting and June 11th, something before so if we're not able to get it all done on the 28th, we'll absolutely yeah. put a placeholder in for me. Um, and I recall uh, that staff said they were working on the further recommendations for reductions, yes, they correct. just didn't have them. So those will be really important. It's been so hard for us to <laughs> swallow yep. even the ones that have been suggested. Yep. That's going to be even right. tougher. We have meetings yeah. tomorrow scheduled on that. Pardon? <laughs> so we have meetings tomorrow scheduled on Okay. Um, and those, those are already looking to be harder. So your, yeah. your instincts are absolutely right. These were, these were the thin twigs. These are starting to get some pretty thick branches. For so, which makes me think again, we're going to need time to process that and yeah. make those decisions. Uh, when will we have those suggestions? Would that be at our 28th meeting? The 28th for sure. That um, was the plan, yes. And we want to get, I mean, our goal is to get it to you a week or two in advance, as early as possible. And I think the minute we're ready to release, we release. Okay, so we'd get it in writing and then we could- Yes, oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, this, this was a nuance and this, we're sprinting right now and trying to catch up. So. But, I, but I think what I hear the intention behind your comment, uh, Councilmember Matthews is just really wanting to make sure we have the appropriate amount of time and, and timing in place. And I, we, you know, we'll work offline to make sure that happens yeah. in terms yeah. of scheduling additional yeah. meetings. We built in some wiggle room. I mean, the, the council doesn't have to adopt a budget until the end of June, um, but so there is some wiggle room there. Okay. And we're gonna get a spreadsheet on Monday, was it? I, I will do my best to get it by Monday. <laughs> Don't hold me to Monday, but it will get there as soon as it's ready. It could even be faster. Thanks. Okay. okay, thank you very much, and we'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting. All right. All right, public comment for a minute.